WWF Monday Night Raw number 367, June 5th of the year 2000. So clips from SmackDown, which sure looks like it was in the Tacoma Dome. It, it was. It was? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so on that How the show, hell could you tell? Because the Tacoma Dome has a unique roof. Huh. Very roof? distinctive. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that it might have smelled. That's possible, too. Oh. I, I cannot tell that on the network. Hmm. Undertaker and The Rock both won handicap matches on SmackDown, which made both of them number one contenders. And then to add to the stupid, Kane pinned Triple H, so he was also number one contender. Yes, and it's not that they are now one, two, and three in some order. I was no. going to say, do you know how stupid it is to have three number one contenders? It's incredibly stupid. Yeah. Well, that doesn't even make sense. There's got to be a one, two, and a three. There can't be three number ones. Right. Well, there are, Craig. Understood. So it can happen. We were, just, we were told that's what happens. And by yes. the way, remember like less than a month ago when Jericho beat Triple H and came off like a huge star and they got yes. buried by the end of the show? He's number five. Maybe. Yeah. He's nowhere to be seen. Who knows where Jericho is? Well, he's feuding with Chris Benoit over the IC title. Which the is IC he? title should be number yes. one contender. That was not so. mentioned on this at he'd all. Be the, he'd be the fourth number one contender. Sure. Actually. Well, fifth, really. If he wins, is he the champion? Or is Benoit the Benoit's champion? Benoit's the champion. All right. So he's... So, yeah, I was right. He's number five. Yes. Okay. Jericho would be the fourth number one contender. Or Benoit. <laughs> and Jericho's feuding with him, so he's number five. I see. So that was right. Don't, so, don't doubt me. Michael Cole asks Vince how... He asks Vince how Hunter feels... About there being three number one contenders and Vince doesn't well, care. Well, it's his son-in-law. All right. Vince doesn't care is the answer. How Hunter feels. Why? Oh, gosh. No, honestly, like... How long is this show going to be, Brian? No, are they feuding now? I don't know. Well, not yet. Well, that's a goddamn good question when I ask why, then. Well, if you hadn't asked 20 questions before, then maybe I would have paid attention. The show starts with Vince not giving a shit that Hunter has four number one contenders, and I was like, they were friends and family a week ago. Yes. They were the faction. Yeah. Now I turn on this show, and all of a sudden, Vince doesn't give a shit about Hunter? What's fucking happening? Well, I don't know. Okay. And over the ensuing 18 minutes, I got no smarter in that category. You mean 27 minutes? Or whatever it may It have was been. something like that. Yeah, it was I, I, time. I, I will just, uh, I'll just read my notes. Hunter and Steph come out. They ramble about competition and egos for five minutes until Vince comes out. He rambles for four minutes. Shane comes out. He rambles for two minutes. Everyone starts fighting. Rock comes out, rambles for four minutes. Kane comes out. Thank God for Kane, who made his fucking point and was done. Taker comes out, and the uh, when all is said and done, said and done, Vince books Taker versus Rock versus Kane for tonight. With the winner getting a title shot also tonight. So this show is, in fact, barely legal. Redone. And uh, this took 18 minutes to establish. I took one minute to recap it. 24 minutes since the show began. Yes. I'm counting that that stuff there. That's fine. Yeah, this, this could have been done in three minutes. Uh, the only thing really of note is there was a there was a segment where Hunter and Vince are talking to each other. And Hunter says that Vince has the biggest ego on the planet. And Vince comes out and says, It's not your time. Your biggest accomplishment, Triple H, in this business and life was marrying Stephanie McMahon. Well, he's not wrong. Right. No. Hunter then says, or he says Hunter's time may come, but he needs to remember, I made you and I can break you. And then Hunter says, You might have made the monster, but the monster can take over anytime he wants. Well, no, he can't, unfortunately. <laughs> and then he talks about how he used to beat Vince McMahon's ass. But this was an amazing speech. They're talking about the future of they, this company and who is going to take over and win. Yeah. Fucking it was 19 years ago. I'm still working on it. If, if I'm reviewing shows in 19 years and Vince is still in charge, like... Cities will burn. <laughs> I don't know. I better have made a lot of money doing it. That's all I got to say. So after 24 minutes of recaps and promos, we get a three-minute trios match. Yeah, because they probably got their time cut. I'm sure they did. <laughs> Too Cool and Rikishi versus TNA and Val Venus. So, uh, let's see. They have Test pinned with a worm, no ref. Trish takes her boot off. Grandmaster Sexy levels Test with it, still no ref. And then Val hits a belt shot and wins. And then, on top of all that, Trish also gets a stink face afterwards. They are starting the feud. Yeah. With Rikishi giving Trish the stink face instead of building to that. They also are now calling it the stink face. Ross said stinky face and then corrected himself yes. with stink face. There you go. Branding. Someone had to give Jim Ross a memo clarifying, do not call this the stinky face. It is to be referred to as the stink face. Ridiculous. They're going a thousand miles an hour here. Just getting, like, 
they got their time cut, but they still wanted to hit every spot. Yes. It wasn't like, well, let's take out the first half. No, let's get every spot in in the same amount of time. They right? did in their half the time. They did their ten minute match in three minutes. It was fucking horrible. Yeah. Rushed, fell apart. Even Ross said it fell apart. This was no good. Backstage, the man said a group hug. So now they're friends again. I guess this whole thing was supposed to be a trap to lure Taker, Rock, and Kane into fighting each other. I don't know. In the middle of this, Crash Holly tried to jump Gerald Briscoe, had the door slammed in his face. A funny idea on paper that did not work in execution. So they came up with a plot that involved Triple H defending his title against one of these men tonight. As opposed to defending against three of them. As opposed to not wrestling. They would have had to face them eventually. Eventually, but I mean, what's the hurry? I don't know. Road Dog versus Chris Benoit in a King of the Ring qualifier. Enjoyable destruction while it lasted. <laughs> X-Pac interfere, the Dudleys run out, and Benoit wins with a German. Yeah. Okay. And again, after that 18-minute promo, Chris Benoit gets two minutes. Still catching up. The Dudleys go to put Tori through a table. X-Pac makes the save. So at least they're building to that. Crash again tries to ambush Gerald Briscoe. Oh, I did cannot I... believe, by the way, that Bubba put his hands on that woman. It's amazing. You just can't you, do that. No. Would you put your hands on someone's mother? I mean, I would. But who's, would anybody else? Whose mother? <laughs> Mama Stunt. I wouldn't touch her. Well, I did. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> There's gravity in Craig's voice there. And I, I don't regret it. Huh. Anyway. So, uh, Briscoe is the hardcore champion, which is why Crash is attacking him. Yes. Tries to attack him again here, accidentally lays out Patterson, and that's that. Kevin Kelly interviews Kane. Kane says there are no allies when it comes to the world title, and tonight he has no brother. I can't believe I'm watching this fucking 24-7 thing in 2019. I mean, I it, just can't it, believe it. It's not as good, turns out. This shit wasn't that good. It's true. This is very bad. Crash running around after the fucking stooges? Yeah. Speaking of which, Crash comes out to challenge Briscoe. It turns into a two-on-one. Crash is beating up both stooges. They have a fucking match. They had a yeah. match. After all Gerald this... Gerald Briscoe had a match defending the hardcore title. Yes. Invo- That's when you know this title has jumped the shark. <laughs> well, I knew it. If you didn't know it at the beginning, at the point where, pa- where Crash Holly pulls out Pat Patterson's stained underwear... Which apparently he's been I did give up at that point. Carrying either carrying around for months or he's been raiding Patterson's dirty laundry. Regardless, the Stooges dog pile crash. They win. Everyone boos. This was a sight gag from a month ago. And it wasn't funny then. I know. Cole interviews Taker. Thank God we got that continuity editor. Taker just says Kane is right. The Rock goes for a walk backstage. We got Kane versus Taker versus Rock. Hunter's doing commentary. He attacks the Undertaker, and then just sits down and do commentary again like nothing's going to happen. Right. What a dumbass. This, by the way, is a three-way for the number one contendership. Yes. Right. The one. The, the one winner of this match mm-hmm. is the number one contender for the WWF title. They will be facing Triple H at the end of the show. Yes. They have a whopping two-minute match. Yes. Yeah. Hunter hits dudes with shit. Yes. And then Rock pins Kane. Yes. And Hunter hits Rock with a chair, too. How, like... <sighs> they won in spite of themselves. They won oh, because the other shitheads we'll get... were so fucking stupid. <laughs> we shall explain why they won briefly. How in the fuck could you possibly care about the match or the title when the number one contendership is determined in a two-minute bullshit nothing happened in match? Well, that's like interference. Fuck! Well, if you saw what was going on in the other show, this was better. Just yeah. barely. They... Well... Whatever. It was significantly better. Rick Flair on the other channel was well, better than anything on this show. That's true. And he faced two non-workers. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Godfather and Dean Malenko versus Eddie Guerrero in China. Do you guys remember earlier in the year 2000 when the Radicals jumped ship to <laughs> WWF from WCW? Yes. Briefly. That was not long ago. And it was like four big-time stars from WCW in a major news story that everybody was talking about. Yes. Yeah. Now Dean Malenko is teaming with the fucking Godfather. Yes. Yep. It hasn't even been six months yet. No. <laughs> like, I don't know. He's well, also the prestigious light heavyweight champion. They they succeeded in spite of themselves. They didn't win. WCW lost. Yes. Eddie and Guerrero, we've been losing ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie Guerrero's a comedy character. Benoit's the only thing they've done anything with. Now, 
I will say that in the middle of this fucking match, which is Godfather and Dean Malenko as a team against Eddie Guerrero in China, Eddie and Malenko are working their fucking asses off. My God. My like, God, they were awesome. I, I This is something that, I mean, neither of them was Dean Ambrose. No. They <laughs> were in the middle of shit, and they were like, fuck, we're going to tear it up here. Well, this this, this I'm shit. I'm teaming with the fucking Godfather. Who gives a shit? This shit was still much, much better than the shit they had left behind. They it got in there. Upgraded to a premium grade shit. They wrestled their asses off. The finish was fucking incredible. Malenko goes for a tilt to whirl. Eddie turns into a small package. Mm -hmm. Like it's nothing. Eddie is, as a news flash, <laughs> one of the most athletically gifted people I have ever seen in pro wrestling. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're glancing over the part where Eddie gets thrown outside and he's swarmed by the Godfather's women, which he, he enjoys. He likes the attention. Mm -hmm. But then the Godfather's pissed off. And even worse, China is pissed off. Yeah, but she's mad. But then when the match is over, he just goes, I'm sorry. And she goes, okay. He, well, well it, yes. But the point is, Eddie's apologizing to her. They grab him and throw him into the ring. They do the finish. Eddie gets the three count, pops up, immediately turns to China and apologizes more. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was the first thing in his mind. And she couldn't help because he's Latino heat. So, of course, she forgave him. It's that golden tongue, man. I get you out of everything. I guess so. Hardcore Holly versus Farouk. All I wrote here. Holly wins a nothing match with a Falcon Arrow. Well, okay. we had a Hardcore Holly versus Farouk. And Farouk was going to do a clean job. When's the last time you saw Farouk do a clean job? Been a while. Well, this fucking guy did not want to do a clean job. I mean, he did it, but he did the goofy lay on your back and kick your feet like a turtle, mm -hmm. like he can't get up, and he kicks out as quickly as humanly possible and then pops right up. Yeah. He had gone for the Dominator, Farouk, or Farouk went for the Dominator, and Bob Holly turned into the Orange Bomb. What in the fuck was this? Besides a waste of time. We've talked more about it than it deserves. I don't know. I don't know, hardcore Holly. What did Farouk do to have to do a job? Like, he uh, must have done something wrong. They, they wanted Bob to advance in the King something. of the Ring. You're glossing over the fact that hardcore Holly hit Farouk with a falcon arrow. Yeah. Now, I know yeah. Bob Holly's a freak. Yeah. He's very strong. He's a very strong man. Very athletic. Farouk is a big, big man. Farouk is a large, it, it, powerful yes. human being. It's fake, though. Thank you, Brian. He's a good jumper. Let me write yeah. this down. Yes. I've, yeah. Kurt Angle gives Edge and Christian to pep talk. Says together they can defend Stephanie's honor which does not interest Edge and Christian at all, but then he points out, if you defend her honor, she'll give you a rematch for the tag titles. Now they're all excited. And then he reminds them he beat Bradshaw last week. Just to yeah. Out. Sorry that midget hit you in the genitals, he said. <laughs> Kurt Angle, Edge and Christian versus Chris Jericho and the Dudleys. They kind of caught up on time. These guys got four minutes. And even at four minutes, it was still the best thing on the show. Yes. Very good match for what we got. Uh, Kurt eventually pins Bubba clean with an angle slam. And then, just for good measure, they 3D'd, 3D'd him through a table. So, I assume Kurt and the Dudleys are feuding, or something. Now, granted, we're going to have to get your finishes report here, Vinny, but it does appear to me, as a casual observer here, that we have a lot more clean finishes on this program. Confirmed. Yeah. There were most... I don't know what happened. Mostly clean finishes on the show, and very few... Very few even clear finishes on Nitro. But that, that, that is the main event. The finishes report this week is the main event of our show. The Hardy Boys versus Big Boss Man and Bull Buchanan. Another rushed match. I guess they lost. Maybe the six man went too long. Might have. A very interested observer backstage won Lita. Now infatuated with the Hardy Boys. Uh, Bull get... <laughs> like, I understand stuff happens in wrestling and guys get hurt and then it's just inevitable, but Bull Buchanan looked like he gave Matt Hardy a concussion doing a backbreaker. That's hard that, to do. That's very hard to do. So, in about two minutes, Jeff pinned Bull with a senton, and then, I don't know why, but the big boss man and Bull Buchanan broke up. Oh, Bull Buchanan shoves the boss man, the boss man hits him with the nightstick, and all I could think was, if only Bull Buchanan knew then, <laughs> what do we know now? Where did his career go after he separated from the big boss man? Well, he was B-squared for a while. That's all I remember. That was a failure. And that, that's three years down he the line. He was in Right to Censor. Yes. Remember that? I do yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So he fucked up his old career by turning on the boss man. They, they, they were he perfectly... He should have just had a little more patience. They were perfectly fine mean guy tag Yes, team. they were. I cannot wait till the Bull Buchanan and Big Boss Man have their match. That's going to... That's going to really suck. Mm. That can't possibly happen. <laughs> Hunter backstage makes all his pals promise to stay in the back. He wants to face the rock alone. And then 
Michael Cole, the next segment, is interviewing Hunter. He reminds Hunter that he's told his friends to stay in the back on SmackDown, and thus Keen beat him. Then he informs Hunter that Earl Hebner's a special guest ref tonight, and Hunter is pissed. Which begs the question, who made Earl the ref? I don't know. Was it Vince? I don't know. You would think. There's a lot of things on this show that I don't know. Some dots need connecting here. Maybe maybe it's Linda. Hunter promises this won't matter. And then Cole points out that Stephanie has the women's champion and has never, ever, ever defended the belt. Asks if she ever will. Fuck. He starts and he goes, Stephanie, this is how he begins the interview with Stephanie McMahon. Hunter's already walked off. He's mad. You don't care. Cole has to go. I don't even give a shit. (laughs) Stephanie, your husband, Triple H, is the fightingest champion in the history of World (laughs) Wrestling Federation. He did say that. It's like he did say are that. You fucking kidding me? <laughs> he did say that. He segues into you are also a champion, Stephanie, and you have not yet defended your title. When are you going to put the title on the line like your husband? She says, "I don't need to put my title on the line. I don't even have a number one contender." Amazingly, there just happened to be women right off screen. Ivory and Jacqueline. They leap onto the screen. It's Ivory and Jacqueline. They want a shot, and Stephanie's all flustered. And she goes, "Well." On uh, uh, SmackDown, there's going to be a women's battle royal, and I will defend the title against whoever wins. And off she goes. This was very bad. Stephanie was terrible here. It was wretched. It's not uh, just here. It was Cole was, <laughs> it was bad. She was bad. The women being there was bad. Everything was bad. The writing was bad. It was still better than Raw today. <laughs> the Rock goes for a walk backstage, and then it's time for the main event of The Rock versus Triple H. Say one thing. These dudes can run the ropes. Yeah, they're rope runners. No doubt about that. Mostly the Rock. Hunter. I, 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 Hunter's great, too. So DX and the Stooges come out. Rock is fighting them all off. Wait, you're telling me the faction came down? Whatever I said, yes. After uh, Hunter told them to stay in the back? He Wait. did. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Just checking. Uh, yes. Uh, so Rock hits the people's elbow, but X-Pac pulls the ref out of the ring. Now the Rock gets swarmed. Actually, he doesn't. Earl Hebner goes to count. X-Pac yanks his leg. But he only yanks him, like, halfway out of the ring. Hmm. So Earl Hebner stands up, and he fucking kicks X-Pac right in the face, and X-Pac takes a bump. <laughs> I love when Earl Hebner gets physically involved in matches. I, I did miss that. Yes. Well, somehow he got taken out, because the next thing you know, there's six guys in the ring beating up the Rock. Hunter whipped Rock into Hebner. He took a bump. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, the Brothers of Destruction make the save, and the good guys are all cleaning house until... The Rock swings a chair. He accidentally hits The Undertaker. The Undertaker is angry. He chokeslams Rock. Hunter gets the pin. Hunter wins at the end of the day. Oh, again. And now we went from three number one contenders to zero number one contenders. The fucking Triple H reign of terror <laughs> is in full swing. Well, yeah, is that, oh. It is unabated. It cannot be stopped. He has beaten The Rock yet again in the middle of the ring. Yep. Granted, there was interference and in that sort of thing, but it doesn't matter. It's The Rock. And the only thing I got out of this, besides the obvious is Undertaker is lurching down the ramp, looking exactly like the Undertaker today lurching. That was 19 years ago. Yeah. This fucking guy could barely move. How did he have that great run for a decade? It was impressive. He's a great man. There you go. So he laid out Hunter. All the heels celebrated. You'll never guess. A heavy heat show. And that was that. Mm. Are you ready for the finishes report, Vinny? I am prepared for finishes report A. Are you sure? The the the, the undercard finishes report. <laughs> the finishes on this show were pin after belt shot, pin after distraction, two men pinning one in a truly degrading spectacle, pin after interference with a chair, and then clean pin, clean pin, clean pin, clean pin. Excuse me, four clean pins in a row? I swear to God. Wow. Yeah. I and, can't believe it. And then, not a clean pin in the main event, which was a pin after all sorts of interference. Wow. Four clean pins in a row. Has that ever happened? Not in, very, very rare. That's like a winning poker hand. In WWF Monday Night Raw, number 368, June 12th of the year 2000. Yeah, my birthday. Oh, happy birthday 19 years ago. Yes, my birthday is coming up in one hour and six minutes. We'll do a celebration here on the air if we go that long. But yes... It was a nice Raw to watch on my birthday. I cannot believe that this Nitro aired on my birthday. On my 25th birthday, I spent that night watching that Nitro. Can you imagine? I, I am surprised you made it to 26 based on that Nitro. Yeah, very bad. 
So Raw here opens the video package of The Rock, Undertaker, and Kane repeatedly laying each other out, sometimes on purpose, sometimes on accident. We then go live to the building, uh, which I forget where it was, but it was, in fact, a hot crowd. The Rock came out to a prom- to a, an ovation that seemed to never end. They just kept cheering for him. He called out literally everyone. Kane comes out. Then The Undertaker interrupts. It appears that all three are just going to kill each other in the ring, but who should come out but Linda McMahon to the thorn in your eye, Raw theme. Now, I don't want to be here all night, but please bear with me as I recap what is peak Linda McMahon. I believe this was the least human she has ever been. Really? Yes. I thought by the end she was not too bad. She It did turn around by the end. When she started... Like, usually when they pull the the cord on the back that makes her talk, she at least has, like, a normal human cadence. The pauses and voice inflections she made in the first part of this promo were not part of any normal human speech. Wait just one minute. What are you men trying to do? What are you thinking? You're out here. Looking like you're going to tear each other. Limb? From Limb? Undertaker. Kane. Rock. Don't you think? The McMahon Helmsley faction is just sitting back there? Laughing at you guys? Are you three great competitors going to get sucked in to that old divide and conquer strategy? She went off from there, but uh, I think I made the point. Yeah, the, the first part of this, I'm not going to lie, was absolutely horrible. But by the end of this, I honest to God thought this may have been the shining moment of Linda McMahon's career. I mean, she took 25 minutes to sign like four matches, but the crowd was into it, and her cadence was such that they got more into it the more that, they, that she announced. And by the end, she came off like a big star announcing big matches, so... I didn't think it was that bad. I thought it was Uh, okay. It's a glass half full recap of ever I've heard one. Yes. So eventually Vince and his crew come out and uh, Linda, in in this segment, Linda's the matchmaker. And she books a trios match for King of the Ring with Taker, Kane, and Rock as a team against Triple H, Shane, and Vince. Vince accepts this, dares her to make any match she wants for tonight. So she books Hunter in a title match against an opponent of her choosing. Hunter is, of course, outraged. And then Linda books uh, Stephanie defending the women's title against Lita, where if anyone in the faction interferes, Lita will win the title. And I'm sure you can all see where that's going right now. Uh, And yes, in 15, after this point, it took her 15 more minutes to announce Vince and Shane versus the Dudleys in a tables match for tonight. And that was that. I was told that she was wretched and this went forever. All right, sorry for the brief time out, everybody, but I fixed Vinny's audio, so if you didn't like what you heard there a second ago, now everything is great on uh, both of our ends. So where were we, Vinny? Continue on. So after Linda's promo, which we agreed, we both agreed was wretched, uh, Hunter and Steph were sucking up to Vince in the parking lot, or sucking up to, to Linda in the parking lot, trying to learn his opponent for tonight, but she refused to name who that would be. X-Pac versus Dean Malenko in a King of the Ring qualifier. Jim Ross was actually allowed to mention that Dean was one of the people who trained X-Pac. They had a fun sprint of a match. Tori and Road Dogg both interfered, and X-Pac won with the X-Factor. Yeah, the key is they had a sprint of a match. Uh, I hate when they have a tournament, or there's a tournament upcoming, and they do like a series of matches to determine who's going to be in the tournament, and the qualifying matches are all like two minutes long. To me, it's just like, what's the point of even having a fucking tournament? If, you're, if your qualifying matches are two minutes long, it just it just doesn't make the tournament seem important. Like, I don't care about either of these guys being in the tournament. We had a two-minute-nothing match that one guy won. It just seemed and she, lame. And the usual fuck finish to win. Yeah, that's right. Lita is backstage stretching in preparation for her title match. Stephanie is tying her shoes, wondering what she's going to do against Lita, because... She's relying on the faction to save her, and this time they can't. And she asks Hunter what he's, she's going to do, and Hunter just hangs his head and says, I don't know. And this makes her mad at him. <laughs> What's he supposed to say? <laughs> like, you could have... 
I, I, I guess I, she wanted a solution. She wanted a, a, a magic answer that would help her win. But he, he could have at least said, I have faith in you or something. No, he's too busy worrying <laughs> about his own problems. That is also true. He has a lot in his own mind. Which, by but, the way, uh, is a great little thing. They never mention this on commentary, but Hunter is worried about his own problems, and someone else comes to her aid. Which leads us to Stephanie versus Lita. So Steph does a promo about how deep down all the people want her to win. She was mistaken about this. They did not want her to win. Lita attacks, tears into her, throws her out of the ring. Stephanie is down, setting her knee. This distracts the referee. When out should run Kurt Angle, who is in fact not in the faction. And he grabs Lita, hits a beautiful angle slam, mainly because of the way she took it. And he leaves, and Steph makes the cover, and she wins. And they cut backstage where Hunter is first overjoyed. His wife has found a way to win and keep her belt. And then back in the ring, Kurt and Stephanie hug. They awkwardly stop hugging and then decide, ah, hell with it. And they hug more. And they cut backstage and Hunter is significantly less happy now than he was 20 seconds ago. But before he can do anything about it, Shane runs in and comes and get him and says, we got a plan. Yes. I thought this whole thing was unbelievably great because first off, at the beginning of the show, you said, you'll never guess who runs down. And honest to God, as I was watching this live, I didn't even think about Kurt running down. I knew they said that nobody from the faction, yeah. but I just figured, well, they got to get this stupid belt off Stephanie. It's been 68 days. She hasn't even defended it yet. Like, Lita's probably going to win. So the other key is they don't do this Stephanie Kurt thing every single week and hammer it into your head. It's just something that happens every few weeks, and when it happens, you go, oh, yeah, I remember this now. So when he came out, I thought, that's right. Of course he's going to come in and help her. So he comes out, and then the whole thing with Hunter where he's so happy, and then he's so angry. I just thought this whole thing was just fabulous. I love this storyline, and I'm going to be so angry again when it doesn't go where I want it to go. So here's the cunning plan the faction has. They're going to get Kane. And they all run in and beat him up. And Hunter hits a baseball bat shot to the face. And they sit him down and they lift up his mask. And they take pictures, photographs of his burned, scarred face. That's right. You know what's funny about it is I always figured that Glenn Jacobs grew his hair out long, and then later in his career, when he didn't have hair, when he shaved his head, they used a mask with hair in it. But in fact, it was made abundantly clear when they took his mask off that he's always had a wig in there. Because when they took his mask off, I saw the back of his head and I was like, it's fucking Isaac Yankum. I did not notice that. Yes, he had the same Isaac Yankum hair. Wow. That was weird. So after the break... Vince meets with the Stooges and confirms they're going to get the pictures developed so they can blackmail Kane into being on their side. Now, obviously, there were no iPhones or Samsung Galaxies in the year 2000. There were only still photographs. But you know what there was? Polaroids. Yeah. Why do they not have a Polaroid camera for this? Well, what, was so, what kind of camera did they have? Like a digital camera? I don't even know no, what they No, no, they, they had a film camera... Where the Stooges had to go rush to the photomat I see, I see. and get the pictures developed. Well, I'm sure that they, well, if, if you go by the storyline, they just came up with this plan. If they planned in advance, they would have known to get a Polaroid camera. I guess. So Vince, knowing Kane will have to do what they say, he books Kane versus Rock, no holds barred for tonight. Yeah, it's one of those deals where he's he's certain that Kane will be on their side, because if not, they will reveal his face to the world. And he is so happy about this that he high-fives everybody. That's right. Too Cool versus TNA. They have clips of Rikishi destroying Val Venus on SmackDown. Another three-minute match. Uh, Test laid out Scotty with Trish's boot, but he kicked out. And then Scotty went for the worm, but Val hit him from behind with a DQ. And Rikishi makes the save. He lays Trish out in the corner. He's going to give her the stink face. This building is shaking. Oh, my God. They were going absolutely crazy for the match and for... And keep in mind, he's already got her with this move. Yes. It's already been done once. 
but they so badly want to see him do it again. But they pulled her to safety and she did not get the stink face tonight. No. Maybe next time. Vince and Shane McMahon versus the Dudleys. I have seen a lot of weird stuff recapping these Monday Night Wars, but few things were as jarring to my brain as watching Devon Dudley and Vince McMahon brawling. <laughs> they, they did this match when Vince first, when the match was first announced, when Linda announced the match, it really hit me. I was like, "I'm gonna see the Dudleys against Vince McMahon." What? So they proceed to go out there, and in fact. They had a match. They now, did. the match was the Dudleys beating the living hell out of Shane and Vince for like five minutes, but they went out there, and it was Vince and Shane against the Dudleys. Yes. So, Bubba is about to powerbomb Vince through Shane, who's laid out on a table when DX makes the save. And when I say make the save, I mean they nearly killed Vince McMahon because he's up on Bubba's shoulders for the powerbomb. They hit him, and he falls off Bubba's shoulders to his side to the floor. Dude. <laughs> he That's... fell He fell from the top rope all the way down to the floor. And it's one thing when, like, that's your plan. Like, I'm facing Marco Stunt, and my plan is I'm going to fall from the top rope to the floor. When you're not planning to fall from the top rope to the floor, and you fall from the top rope to the floor at 53 years old or whatever Vince was here, that was scary. Yeah. You're not wrong. So, carnage continues to ensue. They lay Bubba out on the table. They want Tori to splash him through it. So, she goes flying over, and she comes down onto him, but the table doesn't break. And so, her momentum carries over, and she splats right onto her face. Not only that, did you see what she grabbed? Uh, I'm gonna, I bet you're going to say collarbone. No, she grabbed her back. That's bad, too. Because she scorpioned over and wasn't expecting it, and her feet went behind her, and she tweaked her back. Yeah, that sucks. So Bubba ad-libbed a comeback. The ref randomly called for the bell. They eventually put him through a table. She splashed him through a table this time. And wow, that was scary. Hunter makes it clear with the stooges that the photos will be there. And then they enact the next part of their plan, which involves Bull Buchanan. They tell Bull Buchanan, the Undertaker was supposed to face you tonight, but he blew the match off, said you are not in his league. It's an insult to be facing you. What you should do is steal his bike. And so Bull goes to steal the bike. Undertaker sees this, gives chase briefly, but of course he can't outrun a motorcycle. So instead he carjacks somebody. Oh, struck a nerve with you. <laughs> I guess it did. Yanks them out of the car, takes their car, peels off into the night, nearly running over the cameraman, by the way. This cameraman is very clearly behind the car when Taker slams it into reverse. As there's this bullets being dodged left and right in this show. So, Taker leaves. Hunter laughs. At this point, Crash Holly attacks from behind, but Briscoe briefly escapes. Should add, by the way, that at the end of the show, the Undertaker returns on the bike, so I guess he got him. I guess Bull Buchanan's dead. Well, he's dead, or maybe they switched cars. He may have swapped, that's true. Yeah. Bull Buchanan saw that Cadillac and was like, motherfucker. What are I doing on this bike? That's a Cadillac, baby. Yeah. So Gerald Briscoe runs to the ring to face Crash Holly for the hardcore title. And Patterson's out there and they're all hitting each other with shit. And Patterson hits Briscoe with a trash can. Crash gets the pin, flees with his belt. And Patterson and Briscoe have words, but then Patterson apologizes. Oh my God. This was the best thing on the entire show. Briscoe is upset that he has lost the hardcore title, and it's all Pat's fault. So he's got his head down, and you keep in mind, like, they're like a comic book duo or like a, a cartoon duo. Like, Briscoe always wears the biggest, baggiest clothes, so he's just always looking so sloppy, and his hair is just a mess, and he's got the perfect face, and Patterson's always dressed up like he's going to go golfing, and he's just, everything about him is perfect. So these two guys are in the ring, and... And Briscoe is so mad to have lost the hardcore title that he wants to fight Pat Patterson. And he shoves him, and he starts to roll up his sleeves. And Pat's like, it was an accident. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. And and Briscoe's so mad and finally puts his head down, and his, his nose is so red, and he's so angry. And he goes, damn it. 
and he shakes Pat's hand and he gives him a hug and he hangs his head and he sloppily turns away to leave. And as he turns, Pat Patterson in his golf outfit looks at him and just starts crotch chopping him and then turns away. I cried watching these two guys. They are the absolute best. They were the highlights of this show. I love them. So backstage, Crass celebrates with his belt, but as he goes to drive away, he almost leaves it on top of his car, slams on his brakes, pulls the belt inside, and drives off. Hunter is walking backstage, bitching about not knowing who his opponent is, not getting to do film study on the man. So it's Triple H versus a mystery opponent, which turns out to be Chris Jericho. Holy shit. Everybody talks about the match they had where the title changed hands and then they gave it back to Triple H. This fucking match was even better. It was pretty damn awesome, wasn't this it? This match was so good. Like, nobody talks about this match. But this match was unbelievably great. Well, as quality of match goes, it was awesome. As a TV event, it's totally forgettable. Jericho hits the quebrada. Stephanie takes the ref. And then Hunter just wipes the ref out. Jericho gets the walls. He lets go to put Steph in the walls, but this lets Hunter hit him with a belt. And then, of course, Hunter hits the pedigree and wins. This crowd, it was molten lava. And this is one of those feuds where it's kind of like Sean and Brett, except better. Because Sean and Brett hated each other and had like a bunch of, I don't want to say they had mediocre matches, but when you think of like Shawn Michaels versus Bret Hart, you expect like a bunch of five-star matches, which they never had. Triple H and Jericho hated each other. But fucking every time they got in the ring together, they had such great matches. This was so good. I love this match. Kane's backstage throwing a tantrum, knowing he has to do what the man say, or they'll show his face. Chris Benoit versus Matt Hardy. Another great match. Just a hell of a TV match. But nobody cared. That was a big difference. Well, they are not, in fact, Triple H and Chris Jericho. No. There was more heat than any Raw match you'd see nowadays, but on mm -hmm. this show, it was like they were dead. There was a point when they very randomly... I actually forget who was who, but one went to suplex a guy from the apron into the ring, and the guy in the apron reversed it and just did a suplex to the floor. Yeah, Benoit suplexed him to the floor. Yeah, and that may have been the first holy shit chant in the history of Raw. But they go back and forth. They get in the ring. They go back and forth, and Matt counters a suplex with a twist of fate, but Benoit counters that with a crossface for the clean win. An outstanding wrestling match. And then Jeff Hardy runs in to check on Matt, and Benoit lays him out with a belt as well. Edge and Christian are backstage. Christian's facing Jeff Hardy next, so they're very excited to see him laid out. And Christian confirms Edge will be in his corner. You get Jeff Hardy versus Christian in the last King of the Ring qualifier. Another fabulous match <laughs> qualifier. <laughs> it God is short. Damn it. It is short. Edge and Matt brawl, and Jeff turns a superplex into a cradle for the win. Who the fuck could care about the King of the Ring? You know what I'm saying? I have been trying so hard to remember who wins this one. I have no Could, idea who wins. Is it Benoit? The, the Angle Shane match is next year. Yes. So isn't that isn't that the year Angle wins? I I don't even remember. I hmm. I have no idea. We'll find out. But the, but the point of this is like I'm I'm thinking about Stomping Grounds, which is like a horrible card, and there's no tickets being sold. And 19 years ago this week, we got a King of the Ring coming up. Like I could not possibly give a shit about this tournament. And there's no big match with any of the single stars. They're just doing that weird six-man. I believe they end up making that a title match, a six-man with a title on the line. But they did, did not do that on this show. No. By the way, has Benoit been a heel or did he just turn? He's, I think he's been a heel. I feel like he's been a baby face. I think he's been a heel since the, the first week they showed up when they all turned on Foley. Really? Because he's been doing a lot of matches where he's just wrestling and everyone cheers for him. That but is he true. was undoubtedly a heel on this show. Yes, I don't. I don't think he's. There was never like a, he he feuded with the radical some, and they kind of broke up. But he he was never like a good guy. Hmm. He was just he was just what he was. On heat, Bubba beats Boss Man thanks to Bull. He's in the King of the Ring, and Saturn beats Devon thanks to DX. So he's in the King of the Ring. We have Rock versus Kane with Vince out there to gloat. So it's all brawling and weapon shots. And Rock hits the people's elbow, but Hunter takes the ref with his no pin. 
And then Kane goes to the choke slam when the GTV logo appears oh on the screen. Oh, my God. This is still a thing? It's a thing when they want it to be. What a goddamn cop-out this was. So what GTV captures via spy cam footage, voyeur footage, is the Stooges find out the pictures didn't come out. They have no pictures of Kane's face. But they agree not to tell Vince. So Kane and the Rock see this. They stop fighting. At this point, the Undertaker returns on his bike. A big giant brawl breaks out. The Dudleys are out there joining in. It ends with Hunter in the ring with his three top challengers, Rock, Kane, and Undertaker. People are jumping up and down with joy as he is double chokeslammed through a table. Oh, man. It's weird, too, because he's, he's about to get chokeslammed, and all of a sudden he just starts screaming at the Rock. And I don't know if Rock forgot something or... I mean, he wasn't at a position because it was just a double choke slam, but he was there just screaming at the guy to do something. And Rock just looked at him. <laughs> they choke slammed him through the table. That was the end of the show. Hmm. I thought the show, the GTV thing was like just a total cop out. I, I hate stuff like that. Like, you come up with a storyline, you can't figure a way out, so you got to, you know, do something stupid like GTV to get out of it. But overall, I thought the show was excellent and the crowd made it great. Wherever they were, they need to go there like every week forever. Might not work 19 years later, but man, this crowd was molten, molten, volcanic lava throughout this show. And it just made the whole thing seem better. I concur with that. WWF Monday Night Raw number 369, June 19th of the year 2000. We open with a wrestling match. Crazy. A really good one, too. Mm -hmm. Kurt Angle versus Bubba Ray Dudley in a King of the Ring match. It's like somebody listened to my rant last week. Where I talked about these shitty short tournament matches. Yes. And how can you care about a fucking tournament when the matches are short and shitty? Right. This week, they had a bunch of great matches. And by the time the show was over, I was like, fuck, that's a good tournament. Sure. I can't wait to see who wins. I know, by the way. I think I know. Uh, Kurt, you don't know. Kurt does a promo saying he has been all around the world spreading good cheer. That made me laugh. Okay, I need someone to help me out. So, 20 years ago... Was there, I, I, I have a vague memory of this, that there was something on the internet where somebody like put together Kurt's promos and there were songs attached to it or something like that. Point of this is, I vividly remember a bunch of the promos that Kurt cut. Like I remember them word for word vividly. And it wasn't because I rewound them 50 times. Because you listened to them in song form. There was something where they were like the prelude to a song or somebody put them together in a loop or something. If anybody can help me out, I will be very appreciative. I I need to know what this is. Well, his promo here included making fun of the rednecks in the crowd. They were in Nashville. Talked about tables because he's fighting Bubba Ray and says, you fans probably use tables to stack stack your welfare checks or, quote, to inbreed on them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know inbreed was a verb. Well, what would the verb be? Fornicate. With a family member. Okay, that's not a verb. That's a full sentence. There has to be a word for it. It's in, <laughs> well, inbreed. I mean, no, nah, not, not. Okay. <laughs> I don't need to get into this. That'd be bad. So Bubba is selling his ribs after Edge and Christian and DX put the Dudleys in a dumpster on SmackDown and shuffled it off the stage. Mm-hmm. They're having this match. It's awesome they both look great when Bubba Ray is standing on the middle rope on the inside of the ropes mind you and Kurt runs up and hits him with a belly to belly that's basically impossible to do good god almighty and Bubba goes to the cutter Kurt shoves him off hits the angle slam for the win out of nowhere I was so happy with Raw yeah point. because they had a very good tournament match this was a King of the Ring qualifier and Kurt won and he goes on in the tournament it was well worked. Mm-hmm. It was all wrestling. Mm-hmm. There were, in fact, no tables. No. There was no wood. No. I liked it. The other great thing about the tournament is it almost forces you to do fresh matchups. Yeah. Now, I know, Vinny, that you argued with me about this on Sunday like a fool, but let me reiterate that you do realize if Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle were signed by WWE today... He would be in developmental for five more years. Oh, probably, yeah. Before they called him up to the main roster. He's been on the main roster for a year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the faction is celebrating this win backstage because they don't like the Dudleys. And Vince wishes X-Pac luck tonight in, in uh, his match against Chris Benoit. 
And as they're all leaving, the Stooges come running up with some bad news. A fax. We got a fax <laughs> from your wife. And it says, from my wife? Patterson says, I'm not making this up. You know, Linda? She's the CEO, Vince. Well, sometimes you forget. And Vince stares at him for like four seconds and just says, I know who my wife is. This was gold. I laughed and laughed at this. Faction comes out for a promo. Here we get the 20 minute promo uh, just Hunter, a little bit later. Hunter says nothing. Hey, hey, you know what? You know how much better it was to open with a match and then do a 20 minute promo? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not complaining. Rather than grind the whole show to a halt before it even starts. So Hunter says nothing for several minutes. Uh, pay per view is going to end. This is the go home show, by the way, for King of the Ring. And the six man tag of that match will end. There will be no top contender. I won't have to defend my title until July when I face the King of the Ring winner. You know, I was wondering last week why the main event of King of the Ring was just a random six man tag. Mm -hmm. Who could give a shit? Well, now we know. They have put the title on the line. Well, not yet. In this match. In, in this in the show they do. At this exact point, it is not on the line yet. Because you see, as Hunter and Vince are running their mouths, Vince has his back he's standing the standing in the corner with his back to them, reading this fax. Slow reader. I mean, he had to get a spectacles. Well, he's old. He had to put his spectacles yeah, on. And see. So he calls his wife Ms. Go Ms. Goody Two Shoes. She's meddling in his business. Now she stipulates that the title will be on the line this Sunday. And of course, Hunter's outraged. But Linda knows Vince's weak spot. If you challenge him, he cannot turn down a challenge. She questioned the size of his grapefruits. And so he accepts the challenge. Taker, Kane, or Rock, now they can win the championship by pitting Hunter, Vince, or Shane. Yeah. Hunter's outraged. I'm kind of outraged. That step is dumb. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see Kane pin Shane to, to win, win the title to from win Triple H. Hunter's title. In a six-man tag. Yeah. As long as he hits him. That really sounds hard. like some good booking. But, Vince says, they will have to earn this stipulation. They will each have to be victorious in their handicap matches tonight. So he books the Hardys versus Kane. And he says, the Undertaker, Undertaker will face Bull and Bradshaw. I was so confused. I was Oops. confused then. I mean, Bull Buchanan and Bradshaw, what a weird team that is. And then Shane subtly corrects him and Vince says it, Bull and Boss Man. That was actually even less logical. Right, because while Bull and Bradshaw have nothing in common, have never been on TV together, I watched Bull and Boss Man fight. That's right. They yeah. broke up. They broke up two weeks ago. Now, Vince just forced them back into being a team. Now, to be continued on that. Finally, The Rock will face TNA, and in all these matches, he promises interf no interference from anyone. And then he brags about the size of his grapefruits to his wife. I So last week, Linda was the one who had to do the 20-minute promo, and I thought that it was okay it was not good don't get me wrong mm -hmm. but i've seen much worse linda i could safely say that vince doing this was much better than when linda did it <laughs> ah i concur i love that when vince is reading it at one point she questions the size of his grapefruits she questions whether his grapefruits have shrunk to the size of raisins okay right so he's reading this but he has to make sure to add in a personal attack <laughs> she asked me if my grapefruits have shrunk to the size That's of very personal. Mm -hmm. I just love that he had added that that was a personal attack. In, in case maybe you were listening and you weren't sure. Yes. <laughs> He's great. Vince is great. Go to commercial. We come back. They're all standing backstage. Hunter head, Hunter's head is down, politely waiting for his cue. And he gets the cue and then goes off on a rant on Vince. It made me laugh. X-Pac versus Chris Benoit in a King of the Ring qualifier. They had another very good match. Absolutely. You know what was really awesome in this match? The lockup. They had a great lockup. The lockup was so good. I don't know if anyone even practices lockups anymore or worries about them. Lockups used to be a big deal. <laughs> this lockup was awesome. So they're doing this match. It's very, very good. Let me talk about what was really great about this match, Vinny. Besides the wrestling. Mm -hmm. The fucking finish was the best finish I ever saw in my life. They're going back and forth, and the Dudleys run down... X-Pac knocks him off the apron, which I don't even know why that happened because it didn't lead to the finish. X-Pac kicks Chris Benoit in the gut, and he goes to give him his move, the X-Factor. You grab the man's head, you leap in the air, you sit on your ass, and you drive the man's head 
into the mat. Yes. He grabs Benoit by the head. He leaps into the air to slam his head into the mat. But as he leaps, Chris Benoit uses leverage and throws his arms in the air. And X-Pac goes flying high into the air. And then he crashes. Mm -hmm. And Chris Benoit puts him in the crossface for the submission. I laughed so hard. What a fucking great counter. You're going to leap. I'll just keep you going. Because you're a skinny little shit. <laughs> that was the finish of this match. <laughs> now, my favorite spot was X-Pac backed Chris up into the corner, and he reared back and chopped him, and it echoed throughout the arena. And Chris pauses, grabs him by the throat, <laughs> throws him into the corner, and <laughs> chopped the piss out of him. Benoit was quite the chopper. It's true. So I'm glad you explained that finish in such great detail, Brian, because as that was going on, both Dudleys were running around. They were chasing after Tori. There was 200,000 things going on. I knew Benoit won. I honestly wasn't totally sure how. I knew he got the crossface on somehow, but... It was beautiful. Yes. And then DX attacks the Dudleys afterwards. I mean, he just killed the fucking guy's finish. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just ridiculous. He jumped and he just kept him going. He splatted and he was submitted. It's fucking great. I loved it. So Eddie, Eddie Guerrero and China in this tournament now, they must face each other tonight. How I must have cheered, by the way, in the year 2000. This was obviously long before Benoit did what he did. Mm -hmm. He was he was still like Back when he was merely the greatest wrestler in the world. He was hero. my favorite wrestler and everybody yeah. hated X-Pac. Yes. I well, probably watched that 35,000 times on a loop, crying with laughter at how great that finish was. It was great. So Eddie and China are now are, are bracketed against each other tonight. They're backstage. Eddie is trying to flirt with her. She wants him to be serious and tells him, you must think of me as your opponent, not as Mamacita. DX is backstage with Vince. They demand a match with the Dudleys. God, I was so mad. Paisley walked in during this segment before bed. And so I was going to give her her goodnight kiss or whatever after I finished writing what happened in this short segment. Vin says, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to give you the match. And in fact, in the interest of fairness, it's going to be a handicap match. In the interest of fairness, it's going to be a handicap tables match. In the interest of fairness, it is a handicap tables... I'm like, fuck you! What is the fucking match? I want to put my kid to bed. That is exactly Jesus how it went Jesus Christ, down. it just fucking went on forever. Just did not need to go a minute. He literally added three stipulations after announcing the match. Yes. And not all at the same time. No, he fucking just... The show's two hours, I guess. So, yes, the the end result of all this is that it's, it's DX and Tori versus the Dudleys in the Handicap Tables Dumpster Match. What the hell is that? Fuck if I know. Do you climb a ladder to win? Do you go, oh, there's a ladder. Do you go through a table to win? Do you go into the dumpster to win? Maybe you have to put the dumpster through the table with them in it. I guess. Hunter is still salty at Vince for this whole championship thing. Eddie Guerrero versus China. Best match of China's career. This was sure. so great. I mean, by a, by a long so shot. Oh, great. So, China is taking this very seriously. She wants to compete and win. Become the queen of the ring. Yes, the first ever queen of the ring. So... He does. He's trying to be flirty and cute, and, and 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 smiling at her and winking. And finally, she slaps him across the face, and they begin to wrestle. He grabs a headlock and they start. Well, wrestling first for a she while. slaps him. Yes. And he says, "Why did you slap me?" <laughs> and he he pulls his fist back like he's going to punch or slap her. And he pauses for a second and then grabs a headlock. Let's wrestle. This man's the best. He is amazing. So we get a press slam from China, a power bomb from China. But finally, she's back in the corner, and now she changes her mind. She knows the long wants to be serious, mm -hmm. and she wants to kiss. And Eddie is so happy, because Mama Sita wants to kiss him. But this is a trap. It and always he, is. <laughs> she, she trapped him to marriage for a couple decades. Uh, the match continues. She teases a nut shot, but then she freezes. She was going to hit him in his Latino meat. Yes. She freezes. He begs for mercy. Please don't hit me in my huevos. And she relents. She says, you know what? I do love this man. I cannot hit him in his genitals. <laughs> and she offers a handshake. And he starts. To, she, he takes her hand and begins to kiss it. But then he grabs her arm, pours her down into a cradle, and pins him. 
Pins her. It's great. Eddie wins. She's out of the Queen of the Ring tournament. Uh, now, she got the pouty face. Ed, she wanted to compete. This is her idea. She wanted this to be serious. Eddie was doing his best to do what she wanted. But when that ref counts three and Eddie gets up, he doesn't even celebrate. He just gets up. He's got a smile on his face. And he goes to pull China up. And they just move on. And she's pouting. Nope. When the look of doom goes over Eddie's face mm-hmm. as he realizes how badly he has fucked this up, yep. I died a thousand deaths watching this over and over again. <laughs> Just, I, I, I want Im- the story he told with his face is <laughs> fabulous. It dawned on him, I have done this very poorly. I have made a terrible mistake. This was absolutely awesome. Mm-hmm. Yes. The best intergender match I've ever seen in my life. It may have been. Sure. Actually, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hate to tell Joey Janela, this was the best intergender match I've ever seen. Then they go backstage after an Edge and Christian meeting, and Eddie's apologizing. He's got flowers. She doesn't want flowers. Mm-hmm. He has chocolates. She says, I'm on a diet. That was great. He says, listen, I don't get it. You wanted me to be serious. I got serious. I won, and you got mad. I don't get it. Can you accept my apology? And she puts her head down, and she says... All I wanted last year was just to be the queen of the ring. I, I didn't do it. And then this year, I had another opportunity. I just so badly... And she's she's lamenting, and she's so sad. She turns around. There's a fucking puppy. Mm-hmm. Yes. And now all is right in the world. Yes. Eddie Guerrero has been, apparently, carrying an emergency puppy around. <laughs> in case of heartbreak, present dog. And the they're show, a lovely couple again. These... Current day writers need to go back and start watching this show. The last two weeks. The first half of 2000, you could skip because there's yeah. some shittiness there, but <laughs> this fucking stuff is great. And it's great because when I watch Raw, nothing makes a lick of sense, and I have to try to make it make sense in my own fucking brain. Right. Okay? On this show, like everything that you expect to happen is exactly what happens, and then they explain it for you. Yeah. All you have to do is watch it and enjoy it. Yes. <laughs> and then this thing you weren't expecting to happen happens. It makes total sense. It made sense. I, I was not expect expecting Eddie to give her a puppy. To give her a fucking dog. But as soon as that dog was on TV, I said, oh, I got her a puppy. <laughs> now, granted, we still don't know why Bull and Boss Man are back together. Well, we do. Well, we'll get to it. Uh, There's a reason. Is there a puppy involved? Uh, not on camera. Okay. So, yeah, the Edge and Christian thing is Christian saying, I will not be in your quarter tonight. I must meet with the editor of Tiger Beat. And Ed says, cool. Does that magazine still exist? Does any magazine still exist? It's 2019. It, if, 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 if magazine still existed, I wouldn't be doing the show. Well, there's a tigerbeat.com. Oh, there you go. You can get Tiger Beat on your iPhone. So I believe the print magazine may be dead. Yeah. Edge versus Chris Jericho in a King of the Ring, Ring match and also a future WrestleMania oh. main event preview. So I went to tigerbeat.com. Of course you did. And uh, up at the top, there's a subscribe button, in case you want to subscribe to Tiger Beat. Mm -hmm. When you click it, it takes you to a page that says, the application being requested is not currently available. Oh. I think that might be the end of Tiger Beat. So, Edge does a promo, or Jericho does a promo about the Tiger Beat thing, and there's a wanking joke. But I I just love it when the baby face calls the heel a jackass, Mm -hmm. and the heel always gets so angry. Let's They're very sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> you called me a jackass. The match was good. It was not as good as the Benoit match or the Angle match. I did laugh that we're going to have weeks into this tournament. Weeks. And finally, Jerry Lawler's like, you know what? This King of the Ring tournament is what made Steve Austin Triple H stars in the first place. <laughs> Astute. Yes. Jer- well, you know, the first couple of weeks, why say it? Because the fucking tournament sucks. Now there's that too. Jericho wins clean with the walls. It was like the third week in a row, Jericho's just tore it up in the ring. He's doing very well. Third now. week? <laughs> Since the fucking day he debuted. Brian, he's Am had very, wrong? very good matches the last three yes, weeks. Yes, he has. He's okay. had very good matches since he debuted. He's a great wrestler. Thank you, Brian. I a, already knew that. An excellent grappler. So Hunter gives Bull and Boss Man a pep talk. Now, Bull and Boss Man here, they were bickering with each other. They did not get along. There was not just water under the bridge when they came to blows. But Hunter lets them know they better get this job done tonight against The Undertaker or there will be consequences. Yeah, the consequences were me having to watch this match. 
Undertaker versus Boss Man and Bull Buchanan. Fuck, this was terrible. <laughs> and let me say something else. I know we have some listeners that like motorcycles. Sure. That's cool. I know there may be a person or two that likes Biker Taker. This fucking gimmick sucked. He is a large, better working member of DOA right now. Yeah. He's just a guy in a fucking biker outfit having boring fucking matches with the boss man and Bull Buchanan, and he doesn't even have the Undertaker entrance. He well, no. rides down to the ring in a bike like DOA. Like, if you're Undertaker, how the fuck do you think I'm going to be DOA? Was he not around when DOA was fucking terrible on this very show? You know what I'm saying? I do. It's not like they were in WCW and he never watched it. They were right there on this fucking show. And he decides he wants to be the new big member of DOA. This is bad shit. It's my opinion. Wow. Well, the story of this match was Bossman and Bull still hated each other. And they're pushing each other and bickering the entire time. They didn't want to be in this match. Vince McMahon forced them to be a team together. Because Vince McMahon, the bad guy, is a buffoon. <laughs> so his plan blew up on him. This all makes sense. There was a cool spot here where Taker did a backdrop and Bull landed on his feet. Bull could move for a big man. Bossman grabs his nightstick to interfere. Undertaker stares him down. Bossman says, fuck this. He leaves. Taker pins Bull with a chokeslam. Whoop-de-doo. Sucked. Rikishi meets with Too Cool. It is Rikishi versus Scotty in King of the Ring tonight. They are cool with this fight. They, they, they salute each other. And as they turn to walk down the hall, Rikishi hip checks both members of Too Cool into the wall and sends them flying. And they disappeared. <laughs> we have a clip from Jesse Ventura from the House Show in Minnesota. He at this point was still he was still governor, right? I think he was still governor. Yeah. Says they asked him about running for president. He says he would not run for president. He does not want the job. But if he would run, he would have. They, they asked him which WWF superstar would be your running mate, and he said China, because she would bring in the female vote, which is important to win. Hmm. That's the best reason. <laughs> Well, I mean, he was, he did win. I guess he did win. He became the governor. Yes. So he may have known a thing or two about politics. Apparently. Scotty Too Hottie versus Rikishi. First, apparently, unbeknownst to us, but on SmackDown, there's been a Rikishi Val Venus blood feud. Oh. Yes. And there's just clips of them destroying each other over and over again. The clips last week... Uh Rikishi's bleeding like crazy. He splashes Val they, uh, off of the off the ramp. I remember the, the, table. the splash off the ramp they showed before, but all these weapon shots were new and all the blood was new. So this match here, Scotty versus Rikishi, you take out the bonsai drop finish and you take out the worm. This could have been Shoulders Torelli versus Chico Alvarez. Hmm. It's all chops and clotheslines and hip tosses and shoulder tackles. And Scotty at one point. His hat gets knocked off, and he throws it to the ground like like you did when your bandana get knocked off. Mm. See, now you're seeing seeing it. And uh, <laughs> no, I'm still not seeing it. That'd Who's be, who? Really, well. <laughs> you're a Kishi? I mean, I understand like the weight, but yes, okay. I anyway. was the big man. You were small. That's true. You're right. <laughs> anyway, I did not see this match and go, "Fuck, I'm Scotty Too Hotty." Well, <laughs> not for one second. Go back and watch it again. All I got all I got out of this match was there's a shot backstage of Grandmaster mm -hmm. watching on a monitor mm -hmm. and he's watching the TV. Yeah, right. And I thought at some point in the last 20 years Vince or Kevin Dunn watched the show back and somebody went, "God damn it, I can't see his face." Right. And someone else probably said, "Well, he's watching the TV." <laughs> like if you want to see his face, we can't see what's on the TV. Sure. And Vince said, God damn it, I want to see his face and what's on the TV. So they came up with this, which is face the camera when the TV's behind you. Yeah. And then pretend to look at it. Yeah. There were actually shots like that all over this show. Taker was watching TV. Rock was watching TV. Kane was watching TV. Is They're that... trying to get an Emmy Award. Yes. Well. <laughs> now. I, I know. Not I know. then. I understand. Now. I understand. Okay. But there's also a very simple solution to that problem. You show the guy watching TV, and then you move the camera. Right. So you can see his face, and his face is, oh, look, he's fucking watching TV. How about you have him watch the TV that's next to a mirror? Hmm. 
So Val Venus runs out and attacks Rikishi. Yes, Brian, it would work. Thank you. <laughs> These two shitheads were ridiculing me, but you realized it was a great idea. Ridicule? Yes. He is so weird sometimes. It's a, I'll say. It's a fabulous idea. So anyway, who won this? Noted. Val Venus. Uh, no, uh, Rikishi won with a bonsai drop, mm. which I said noted we did not do. Val Venus runs Thank out. Thank God. He attacks Rikishi. Grandmaster runs out to make the save. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who do not give it, get video, I'm doing air quotes with my fingers. Grandmaster hits the ring. Val Venus kills him with ease, and he leaves. Yes. <laughs> what a nerd. Like, this show is not kind to the tag team division. No. Honest. And then Val has new music. As he, I guess he's no longer a porn star. It's done to make him serious, Val Venus. Taker warns Kane, don't screw this up. Kane versus the Hardys. This was something. This was a this was a NWA squash match from yes. 1988. He fucking made these two guys look like the biggest geeks. Well, they didn't help their own matches. And then any. beat them. Uh, they made themselves look like geeks to a large degree, too. Kane kills them and kills them and kills them and kills them. Every time they do something, he doesn't sell it. Right. Right. Two on one. You're yeah. right. No, I know. You're right. You're right. I, the show is not kind of the tag team division. So Jeff goes up top, and the idea is he will do the whisper in the wind. Correct. But Kane will shove Matt forward, and the Hardys will go bunk into each other. Right. Jeff slips. I think both feet slipped as he's trying this jump. He comes like straight down onto his head. Matt has to try to run under him and try to catch him, try to break his fall. Kind of did. And they just collapse in a heap, and Kane just like walks a full circle around the ring, making sure everyone's still alive. And he just chokes them as Matt and pins him. A disaster, this was. Hunter and Vitz are bitching at each other before the break, and then Hunter's bitching to Steph after the break. Crash Holly versus Hardcore Holly in a King of the Ring match. We get a skit, series of skits actually, from SmackDown, where Crash meets with Shaft. Not Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. John Shaft. Yeah, Shaft is at WWE New York. Yes. For the honey. Skeptical. That this actually happened. You skeptical that Shaft was there? All right, let's cut forward to this. Let's cut to the chase here. So they have this match. It goes on forever. Yeah. And then Briscoe and Patterson come out, and Patterson lures Hardcore out of the ring. Mm -hmm. Briscoe waffles Crash. Crash wins VDQ. Yeah. Yeah. So my first initial thought is, why in the fuck are the Stooges involved in this match? Why do they care who wins this match, VDQ? So the match is over. And Hardcore's mad, because he's been beaten. Mm -hmm. So he goes to beat the shit out of Patterson, and while everyone is distracted, Briscoe pins Crash and wins the Hardcore title. Yes. I actually didn't even see that coming. Well. So then what I did see coming was they go backstage. <laughs> Patterson and Briscoe are celebrating. And, like, you would have to be blind and dumb to not see where this is going. Because the ref's there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so... They draw your attention to it because Pat says, Ref, why don't you go lock the door? Pat says, let's celebrate. I got some bubbly. And he starts to pour a drink. And he says, I'll, I'll, I'll test it first. And he takes a little sip and then he gives it to Briscoe. Briscoe goes, you drank out of this. The things they do are just so great. Mm -hmm. Like, no writer. They got 40 no. fucking writers today. None of them would think of stuff this good. Yeah. So he goes, you drank out of this. Pat goes, just fucking drink it. Yeah, hey, let me pour myself one. Mm -hmm. So he goes to pour himself one. And he goes, let me pour one for the ref as well. Just to remind you the ref's there. Yes. So he starts to pour the ref a drink as well. And and he's all excited. And he, he says, Briscoe, do you love me? Tell me you love me. Briscoe says, I love you. Pat says, I love you too. And he pours a drink over his head. And Briscoe goes, oh, my eyes, I can't see. And And Pat is just so nonchalant about it he goes oh i'm sorry i i dropped that in your eye and he reaches down and he grabs a bottle breaks a fucking bottle over briscoe's head covers him pins him wins a hardcore title yeah these guys were the best thing on the show last week <laughs> they're the best thing on the show this week there is a 24 7 title on wwe tv right now and everything they do is such dumb shit this stuff is so fucking great. Why is it so hard? It's really not. I don't even get it. The, the, the crew today needs to go back and watch this Raw. They need to watch it from start to finish. They need to watch a show that had great wrestling 
and great storylines and great writing and great action and great action Mm -hmm. and great acting this show ran the gamut superstars that are legit superstars this fucking show was like a 10 raw today is a two and these fuckers need to figure out what they're doing nitro's a minus five oh easy it was much worse than raw Hunter and Steph, they're now down to the last handicap match. So they down the law to they lay down the law to Test and Albert. And Test mouths off to Stephanie. Hunter gets in his face. It's so not hard to have this little bit of continuity. Test still resents Steph for leaving him at the altar and breaking his heart. Mm -hmm. So they're not on camera every week. But whenever they are, (laughs) make it clear he's still sore. He mouths off to her and doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It's just a reminder this continuity. And it makes the whole thing believable. Well, let me bring something up then, because I mentioned this yesterday on the Observer Radio Show. They did a deal last night with the Firefly Funhouse, and Bray's being like a crazy fucker. And you know what they went to immediately after that? Charlie is interviewing Daniel Bryan and the Vintner. And you know what she asks? I don't know what she asks. Bryan, are you ready for Seth Rollins tonight? (laughs) How about asking the fucking Vintner, what do you think of this Firefly Funhouse? Oh, there is that. You were in this fucking guy's cult for three years. You were on his compound. Brian was briefly in the cult. Yes. Like, maybe you could ask him what he thinks. Nope, they don't ask him a goddamn thing about Bray Wyatt. But on this show, they're still playing up that Tess got his heart broken by Stephanie Mm -hmm. and fucked over. Michael Cole interviews The Rock. He cuts every rock promo ever, and it's just as great as all the rest of them. Main event, TNA versus The Rock. Trish is still very, very green. So when they push Rock over the ropes, somebody says, choke him. And she grabs his head and chokes him and chokes him forever and chokes him. 14 seconds. Wow. He's dead now. She killed The Rock by choking him. So we get a bell shot. Rock kicks out of that. It's the rock bottom on test makes his comeback when he goes for the people's elbow on test and the whole building is shaking. <laughs> rock was popular, everybody. I don't mm-hmm. know if you're aware of this. I'm he, aware. He elbowed test. He pinned him. The rock wins. So the title is on the line of the pay-per-view now. Hunter begins to throw a tantrum backstage. He's throwing furniture. He's flipping tables. And Vince tells him to calm down. Just wait till SmackDown. Oh, so Vince, Too bad we're missing that Vince show. This is a plan B. This was a great show. This was awesome. This was the best Raw show I've seen in the year 2000, I think. Yeah, I'm, I thought you were seeing in 2019. But well, yes. 2019, I mean, for sure. Yeah. Not even close, but... All right, are you ready, Vinny, for your recap? I think I remember how this works. Well, let's do it. The finishes on this show were... Clean pin. Clean submission, though, it was kind of hard to tell with all that was going on. Clean pin... Clean submission. Clean pin, clean pin, clean pin. DQ due to interference. Pin in a hardcore title match. Pin in another hardcore title match. And in the main event, a clean pin. Wow. Very clean show. God damn. Anyway, let's do this Raw show. I did not find this show to be as good as last week's show. Correct. It was a show after the pay-per-view where The Rock won the WWE title by pinning Vince. He sure did. <laughs> I don't want to just jump to the end of Rob and I'm gonna. Okay. At the end of this fucking show, Rock minutes. Rock pins Hunter. Yeah. Yeah. So why the fuck could he not pin Hunter on the pay per view? It's a great question. Could I mean, when the show started, I thought, well, fuck. Obviously, Hunter didn't want to do a job, so Rock pinned Triple H or tri- Rock pinned Vince to get Triple H's title. Mm-hmm. So Hunter lost the title without doing a job. Okay. Then the fucking show ends. He does a job anyway. So I'm I'm completely baffled as to why they bothered with any of this. <laughs> well, I don't have an answer. All right. E- except they may have actually Hunter may have known the pay per view would be a bigger uh, uh, mm, platform. Maybe. Maybe more memorable. Not at this time though. Rock's we all huge. we all remember. That's true. But we all remember the finish of the pay per view. None of us remember the finish of this match. It's true. I mean, I guess maybe it was a way to just get rid of Vince. Because that's what they did at the beginning of the sure. show. Vince yep. went home sure. yep. because he had been beaten. Yes. But anyway. So, WWF Monday Night Raw, number 370, June 26th of the year 2000. 
So the opening package, without making things any more clear than this, lets us know that The Rock won the title at King of the Ring. Actually, it's just Jim Ross on commentary. There was no video package. Jim Ross on commentary says The Rock won the title at King of the Ring, and Kurt Angle won the King of the Ring tournament. Yeah, from looking over the results, I don't think there was anything more they needed to tell us. All right. And I would prefer this over what they do on Nitro. because <laughs> Well, that's true. They show you 40 things on Nitro, and I have no idea what's going on when it's over. <laughs> yes. At least there were two important things at the pay-per-view, and this was the two of them. Valid point. So then an amazing thing happened. As you discussed, Brian, The Rock took Triple H's belt by pitting Vince McMahon in a trios match. Yes. So Rock and Vince came out for a promo here. It went, I believe, 13 minutes, and they never mentioned Triple H one time. I'm not going to lie. I <laughs> Vince started talking, and I started typing. And I'll actually even tell you how many words I typed here. Did you transcribe his entire promo? Uh, well, I didn't transcribe it, but I was like just talking about what he said. I wrote 159 words... And on the 159th word, I suddenly realized, Yeah, Vinny. What in the fuck is he talking about? And why can't he get to the goddamn point? And I fast forwarded. Okay. So if you can tell me what the point of this fucking promo was. The point of this promo was, Vince asked, why has Linda been messing with him? He concluded she has been messing with him because she loves him. Oh, okay. Ho hold on. I, I hate to do this, Vinny. You asked. I, I know. I, I apologize. I pulled uh, whatever her name was on Raw last night. Oh, gosh. I got to read this. <laughs> Just tell me if I'm wrong, okay? okay? I tried really hard. Vince comes out and congratulates Rock for becoming the new WWF champion. Wishes him luck in the new Rock era. He says, last night, as he laid on his back in the middle of the ring. You did transcribe it. Looking up at the lights at the Fleet Center. The pain of the Rock Bottom finally relinquishing its pain. He had an epiphany. He knew about all of his wife Linda's questions. Why would his wife be so kind to all of his adversaries? Why did she make business decisions she knew that he wouldn't like? Why did she stand up to him knowing she'd face the wrath of his retribution? There could be only one reason. Because she loves me. There can be no other reason. I love her too. And I'm going to tell her just how much. I know she has been clamoring, almost begging for my attention. I am going to give her... At that point, I was like, fuck it! Okay, that was early. Get to the fucking point! It took him a long time after that. Now, I found out what the point was, which he says, I'm going to go home and fuck her. Right? Am I missing anything? You're going to go make a baby, yes. Why did it take 12 goddamn minutes to spit this out? Foreplay. It's not even a three-hour show. It's a two-hour show. Very good. That's, I don't know what to tell you. So, yes. This was brutal, and I like Vince. <laughs> not as much as Linda, apparently. I like the line about the wrath of my retribution. It's ridiculous. But it's Vince. I like I didn't write it down, but he had a line about how she wanted all kinds of love, gentle and tender, yes. or rough and ready, I believe. Yes, what he said. that's what he said. So, yes, he's going to go be the genetic jackhammer. Daddy's coming home. And after all of this, he offers The Rock a handshake. The Rock cautiously accepts, but then lets him know, you, will, you are the, still the owner of the company, and you may always be a stud in bed, The Rock said to Vince McMahon. You should watch this, Rob. But you will forever be an asshole. And Rock bottomed him. Mm -hmm. That's what he did. Yes, Hunter's yeah. name never came up one No, time. Well, they got maybe, bigger fish to fry. Maybe they didn't bring up Hunter because they were afraid he was going to talk for 20 minutes. Mm. Thank fucking God he came out later and did that. Shawn Michaels arrived at the building. Looked happy to be there. Oh, he looked happy. <laughs> Steph. Steph tended to Vince. She's very concerned he was leaving. She says Triple H is not there yet. And Vince says, just pass this message to Triple H for me. I'm sorry. Yeah, so the, the Triple he apologized. H... apologized. Triple or the Shane McMahon Kurt match where Shane almost died is next year. Right. Yes. Yes. Not right. this year. Yeah. Rikishi versus Chris Benoit. So Rikishi. Won I got a fact for you before this match. Joy. Last night or the night before. Mm -hmm. Obviously not last night. Last night, nineteen years ago this week. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Benoit faced Rikishi in a King of the Ring match, mm -hmm. and Dave Meltzer gave it a dud. What? No. Yep. Went three minutes with a chair shot finish. A weak chair shot, he added. That explains it. And then Benoit beat him up afterwards. 
And well, that sounds like what we got here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I was just thinking, like, well, kind of. I there, mean, this was basically the same match. Three minutes in a DQ. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I couldn't call this a dud. It was. It was no good. It was no good. But I mean, what a star! It was. Is it really a dud? Has there ever been in the history of Chris Benoit matches another dud? That may be the only one. Like I can't even conceive of it. The, the, the last one was pretty bad, but I don't remember the last one. It was a horrible tag match in ECW. Oh, so anyway, yeah, Rikishi and Benoit had a rematch here. So since the last episode of Raw, Rikishi has won the Intercontinental Title on SmackDown. And then on SmackDown and also at King of the Ring, Benoit and Val Venus destroyed his shoulder repeatedly. Benoit comes out. We've been talking now for a few weeks about whether Benoit's a face for a heel. He is a heel now. Mm-hmm. They boot him passionately. We had a two-minute match. Taz attacked for the DQ. And Benoit attacked for Kishi's shoulder more. What? Taz. Yeah, JR flat out said, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and if you watch Nitro, they constantly say, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and it just... Do they think that as a fan... I like to hear that nobody knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. Do they think that that makes for a more exciting show? Because I don't think so. I want to know what's going on. I'm investing my time in this. Yeah, absolutely. Why is Taz attacking both of these guys? Furthermore, where has Taz been? Well, Taz got hurt. Okay. Yes, that's right. I believe the announcer said it was in a match with Benoit because I was marking out for it. Yes. And, uh, Remember, so, you just caught him or something like that, and his like arm a went di- out? Or a very basic yeah. dive or something, but yeah. And uh, so, he, so he got injured against Benoit and comes back and attacks Rikishi. Hmm. Well, that did cost Benoit the match. I suppose. Yeah. Was he not available the night before? I don't know why it would matter. <laughs> I mean... Oh, was the title was a title match? I don't know. No, it was just no, it was King, King of the Ring, Ring match. Yeah, yeah this no, match. Tonight here, was just a match. Okay. As far as I know. Anyway. Maybe he missed <sighs> a plane. Maybe Mr. Plane. Mr. Plane, I see. Sure. Uh, I've done that. Hunter arrives at the building 20 minutes late. He is too angry to speak a word to Stephanie or DX. He storms off. Road Dog leaves to try and calm him down. And Stephanie and Xbox say, we'll deal with Jericho ourselves. So at the pay-per-view, Chris Jericho put his hands on Stephanie and forcibly kissed the young lady. Don't do this, everyone. It can't get away with this. Very rude. 2019. Jericho does a promo comparing kissing, kissing Steph to kissing Roadkill. So there was this match, and it's Jericho and X-Pac, and I bet it's pretty good, but I couldn't honestly tell you, because half the match was showing Stephanie's reaction shots. It was good while it lasted, I thought. Okay. From what I saw. So she trips Jericho. He starts to go after her. This is actually awesome. So the spot is, you stalk Stephanie. Road Dog will come up behind you. You swing and hit him. So he starts to stalk Stephanie. The cameraman sneaks up behind him, and Jericho turns and throws a punch at the camera guy. Then he throws a punch at Road Dog. All this interference is going on. The match continues. And finally, Steph. So, so Jericho hits the quebrada in the ring and makes a cover. Stephanie takes the referee. The Road Dog hits the ring and hits what I can only assume is the most violent double axe handle of all time. He didn't jump off the ropes, I don't think he even ran. Jericho was down on the ground, and Road Dog raised his hands up and brought them down and put X Pac on top, and X Pac won. This axe handle, man. This is a vicious move. Maybe he hit him in the base of the skull. I guess so. Yeah. So they they go to hold Jericho so Stephanie can slap him. I'm not making this up. They miss the slap to get a close up of Stephanie's face. This segment made me very angry. It's like she's related to the boss. I guess so. Just show me what's going on. All I want to do is see what's going on. A brutal segment. So basically, she needed large implants for them to zoom out. I guess. Mm. I hadn't thought of it that way. Okay. Yeah. Well, it worked then. So she slaps him again and kicks him in the balls and cross chops him. Kurt is backstage polishing his crown and talking to himself. They gave him the most cartoonishly large crown. Of course they did. And it's awesome. What's the butter commercials that have the crown? Parquet? Okay. There's an old. Thank God, you. you're old. I'm very old. I don't I'm, think that commercial's aired for 30 years. I am very, very old. Jesus, that's like margarine. Yeah. I don't actually. even know if you can buy margarine anymore. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you can. Tris tells Val, do what he did last night if he wants some gold. I love this. They finally give Val Venus a attractive blonde with giant fake boobs. Mm-hmm. And now he's not a porn star. He's not a porn star. Right. He's a serious wrestler now. He is a serious grappler. Yes. I have no idea why. Eddie tells a joke to China, and they're laughing. They are the cutest to people together. They are a great couple. This is they act, are awesome. I don't think it lasts much longer, because I believe Eddie gets in trouble. 
no. But uh, while it lasted, it was great. Godfather and some ladies arrive at WWF New York. Eddie Guerrero versus Val Venus. What an overcomplicated bullshit DQ finish after like two minutes. That too. There's like 30 things that happened. Well, we'll get to the chase. The only thing that matters is they did a double clothesline. China took the ref. Trish put Val on top after a double clothesline, which apparently was going to decide the European Championship, except China hit Val for the DQ. This is dumb. So China goes after Trish. Val makes a save, but they kill him, and then Trish gets power bombed anyway. I will say the crowd went absolutely crazy for China destroying Trish Stratus. They did. So at the end of the day, they they, I guess they gave these people what they wanted. I guess, even but, though the lead up to it sucked. And 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 where does it go from here? Will they feud more? Who the shit knows? Maybe a mixed tag. And if so, wouldn't you save this spot for then? You you'd think. Huh. Kurt is backstage doing a promo with a commoner. Was this Ralphus's dad? I, I don't know, honestly. I was looking at this. It's this old dude with like a weird mustache and beard. That, that checks out. And I, I'm, I'm writing down what's happening, and I, I wrote down, Kurt's talking to a security guard. Then I was like, this fucking dude's like 85. He's not a security guard. So like... Everything okay? Okay. So did everyone hear that screech? Yeah. Yeah. I was I was very concerned. I run downstairs. She'll kill me a few years that I explain. I would this just part move on if I were you, but okay. She's she's FaceTiming her sister. I see. <laughs> and that noise was her recreating Paisley's meltdown from earlier today. I see. Were you there when this meltdown happened? <sighs> well, we had like six she's got a cold. So there were like a dozen meltdowns I today. See. So I'm not sure which one she was recreating. I see. <sighs> Maybe it was a compilation. Fucking heart attack right there. All right, where were we? Kurt Angle and the comic. Oh, yeah, the old guy. Yeah. yeah. He's too old to be a security guard, is my point. Yeah. So I think it's Ralph is his dad. Okay. I have confirmed it was the parquet commercials from the early 80s. Okay. That I was I'm glad something productive came out of that segment. Yeah. So Shawn Michaels comes out. He poses on the throne they have out there for Kurt Angle's coronation and then tips it off the stage and knocks it to the floor. A five-year tease was begun right here <laughs> to a great match oh, at WrestleMania. Yeah. Totally forgot about that. Yes. This is where it began. And then it was dropped for like two and a half years. So, Sean is the spokesperson of the WWF, in case you had forgotten like I had. He is about to announce a new top contender for the Rock's title when Hunter interrupts. Hunter is friendly at first, and he shakes hands. He says he never lost his title. He's had to deal with everyone calling him a loser. He knows Sean will name him the top contender, then he'll have an announcement of his own. And he said this, the words he chose were all very friendly, but as he got into the promo, he started to get more and more angry and mean and threatening, implying Sean better do what he, what Hunter City would do. Then Sean said, hey, you're right about all of that. I agree 100%. They're buddies now? Well, they've been buddies for a while. No, nah, they had that big problem where DX beat up Sean, almost killed him, and... Well, there's that. I mean... I'll be honest, I've forgotten. They, 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 they've certainly had their ups and downs. They left him dead in the snow on the top yeah. of the car. He was all bloody. They beat him up in the snow. Was that the last time we saw him? the windshield. No, I think we saw him a few times and he was feuding with them. Yeah. I have forgotten all that. Well, that's what happened, Vinny. Yeah. I'm telling you right now. I believe you. This storyline's dumb. I believe all that. But the point is, Sean says, I am not the commissioner anymore. I cannot make those decisions. But this man can. It is the new commissioner, Mick Foley. Mick comes out with his head all buzzed. We've been watching this every episode of the show, in fact, for, well, many years now. Is it just me, or was Mick happier here than we have seen him at any point we've been Absolutely. watching the Monday Night Wars? Absolutely. Probably. Pressure's all off. He retired. Doesn't have to get He's hurt making anymore. money from his book. He's, He's probably still under a contract. Show up here and have fun. Doesn't Cut have to get beat up. Cut that fucking hair off. Cut his cleaner now. Having the time of his life as Commissioner Foley. Still gets to wear sweatpants. Still gets to wear sweatpants. So Foley gloats. He's just happy, energetic, a, a bundle of joy. He a bundle of joy for 35 minutes. He didn't go on for a while. <laughs> he uh, to ironically, do one thing. Ironically, he buried Hunter for having long, boring promos. Yes, he had to do one thing, sign a goddamn match. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, if you watched this live and you watched how long it took to set this match up, at the end of the day, it wasn't even a title match. No. He signed Rock versus Kurt versus Triple H. 
And if Kurt or Hunter win, then they get a title shot on Thursday. And if not, I guess Rock can tell them to go to hell. Rock can get a night off. Yeah. That was the stips here. I would like to add that Kurt Angle came out and argued that he should be the number one contender. And his arguments were that he won last night the King of the Ring. Mm -hmm. Fair. Hunter lost. True. He was a Eurocontinental champion. Right. And he's royalty. Yes. You know the one thing he didn't mention? That two fucking weeks ago, Hunter himself said the winner of the King of the Ring is the number one contender. (laughs) I guess there's that. That's an important detail that he left out. (laughs) Yes, there's that. I like how this show is in Worcester, Mass. And everyone was very careful to say Worcester every time they said it. I'm probably saying it wrong, but I'm a lot closer than Kurt, who came out here and talked about being in Worcester. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, Rob. Why are you looking at Vinny and nodding? Uh, Because I actually lived there or around there, and it actually is pronounced Worcester. Oh, I did it right. Yeah. We all knew that. I didn't. Yeah. (laughs) And I was closer than Kurt. It's definitely not Worcester. It is not Worcester. No. So, yes, we got the three we announced. It It was actually hysterical because... They're going to do a three-way. Foley says there will be a three-way for the number one contender. And the first man will be Kurt Angle. And the second man will be Triple H. And the third man will be The Rock. No pop. The fans cheered as much as the four of us did. Because they were baffled. They were confused. What's the champion doing in a top contenders yes, match? Right. They had no you will never in it. the year 2000 hear The Rock's name announced to such little reaction ever again. That and Benoit getting a dud. They're tra- probably trying to figure out how The Rock is going to wrestle it. himself as the number one contender. What a twofer. Yeah. So Foley leaves, Hunter sucker punches Kurt and goes out and... They clearly don't watch the G1. Yeah. I thought this segment was fun. It was fun. It was just... It was not short. I was I was still furious about that Vince promo that went an hour, so I couldn't handle the second one. This next segment, though, was great. This actually is. Okay, so they're going to have a match. <laughs> it's Dean Malenko... Versus Jerry Lawler, stay with me here, Mm -hmm. in an over-the-top stripper match. Kinda. Now, when you hear that, you think, why would I want to see Dean Malenko or Jerry Lawler strip? Well, they explain that Dean Malenko will be accompanied by Terry, and Jerry Lawler will be accompanied by the cat. And every time somebody goes over the top rope, the person who lands on the ground, their woman must take an article of clothing off. So... They're backstage, and Dean is playing pool with the hose. Yeah. He still has them? I guess so. This was weeks ago. Yes. This was quite a deal. It's Dean. They're following him. So Dean's back there, and he's playing pool, and the cat is is begging, and she's saying, or no, it's Terry, I I don't want to take my clothes off. I I can't strip. You've got to win tonight. And Dean just calmly says, so you mean you don't want to take your clothes off? (laughs) She says, yes, Dean, you've got to win tonight. I'll make you a deal. You win tonight. I'll give you a private showing. And he scratches. Scratches. He just yeah. can't even take it anymore. Yeah. I laugh. He was playing. Pool he rushes scratch. out and he tells the women to watch his stick. It's actually even better than you give me credit for because there's a point when she's begging him and he's playing it cool. He sinks a ball in the pocket. Yes. And Terry mutters, "Nice shot." Yes. And he just moves on. He's he is Joe Cool here. Then they and, go to Lawler. <laughs> he is with the cat. The cat is claiming she doesn't want to take her clothes off. Huh. She says everyone has already seen her boobies, and she cannot be humiliated again. She took her top off voluntarily. Jerry Lawler says... What was his exact line? (laughs) The last thing, he says, the last thing that I want to see tonight is you naked. Mm Mm-hmm. And she says... That's the truth. Jerry, oh, last thing I see tonight, I see. Are you telling me the truth? And everybody laughs. He doesn't have to say anything. Mm-hmm. And he stands up very tall and he goes, "I think so. I think so." <laughs> and so she promised to give him a Bronco Buster if he won. Yeah. The official. This is so stupid. <laughs> this is one of those things where it's so dumb, but the people involved were so good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's totally unlike today where there's stuff that should be good, but it ends up being so dumb because of the way that everything is scripted and overproduced and all of that other bullshit. This was good stuff. So the official title for this match was Over the Top, Off with the Top Match. Yeah. They had to take the bottoms and the tops off. Well, in theory, it went shirt, pants, bra. I see. So the, the bra would then be the deciding fall. Basically, it's a best of five falls battle royal. Uh, there were five eliminations in three and a half minutes. 
so both women lost their shirts. Both women lost their pants. Shocked. I'm sure all of you are that both women got as naked as possible. I did love where first Lawler tosses Dean. Terry takes off her shirt. Dean drop kicks Lawler, who of course is distracted by Terry not having a shirt on. Yes. He gets drop kicked outside. Cat takes off her shirt. Malenko gets tossed, and Terry is supposed to take off her pants, but instead she takes off her tiny necklace-like metal belt. Yeah. Jim Ross is appalled. <laughs> <laughs> he is outraged that she is not following the rules of the over-the-top, off-with-the-top match. Then the referee, the licensed referee, turns to her and says, you must take your pants off. She takes her pants off. This is a ruling by a referee. Yeah. Okay. So Lawler gets tossed and Kat has to take off her pants and she says, Jerry, you promised. And Ross goes... He's promised a lot of things, baby. <laughs> Jim, Jim Ross on commentary all by himself calling the over-the-top, off-with-the-top match. He should have won commentator of the year for this performance alone. You've never seen somebody. He had nothing to work with. And he was alone. And he was tremendous in this match. So Lawler eventually wins. Tosses Malenko. So Terry, in theory, now has to remove her brazier. And she goes to the middle. And she of, doesn't want to. She does not want to. Being forced but to then get, she does. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't want to strip. Sure. But well, then she, when she has to strip, she turns around. She smiles dances, and gets all flirty, yes. Takes yeah. her bra off. Mm -hmm. And Stevie Richards runs out and covers her with a board. And she's outraged. Yes. He, I'm supposed to be showing my titties well, here. She, what are you doing? She didn't want to at first. But then, of course, the crowd got to her. And she enjoyed the I attention. See. Her things changed. I see. And yes, yeah, Stevie Richards debuted the right to censor gimmick and mm -hmm. covered her up and yanked her backstage. Now, <laughs> all I know is that I have the payoff for all this. Am I the only one who enjoyed the... Thong shot we did get of Terry more than the silicone shot they teased us with? Well, I don't know, because we I, didn't see it. I understand what you're saying, Vince. I'm pretty sure I'm happy with what I got. Sure. Yeah. By the way, we will file this under things that would never happen in 2019. God, it can you imagine how different. they overproduce this bullshit? They wouldn't even think about doing this. Are you well, kidding no, me? no, but if they did, it would be just so goofy and scripted. And Yeah, I am trying to think about this now. No one not happened. It's horrible. There's no way. There's not, they're not doing. Just let these people go out there and have fun. Baron Corbin and Seth Rollins will not do this oh, with, with Becky and, and uh, oh, Lacey like on pedestals. Baron doesn't need any. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> <clears throat> Edge and Christian are appalled to learn the Rock has his own dressing room. Oh, by the way, they're the tag champs again. Yes. No explanation of when or where this happened. They want their own dressing room. They tell Mick they want one. He begins to quote movies and he leaves them confused. What has he ever done for this company? They want to know. So after the break, Edge and Christian have their own dressing room. They have big fancy recliners, but now they want Mick to bring them sodas as well. Because sodas rule and they high five. There's supposed to be a tag team battle royal to name top contenders for Edge and Christian. Too Cool comes out, the Hardys come out, TNA comes out, and the APA comes out. Now this is not all the teams, but at this point a huge pre-battle royal brawl breaks out. <laughs> Edge and Christian are enjoying this. And Mick comes in with our sodas. He also wishes them luck in their match tonight. And they say, what match? He says, you have a non-title tag match against Kane and The Undertaker. And, of course, they are upset. So we go to commercial. We come back. The Dudleys come out, and the Battle Royal begins. And 30 seconds later, the Dudleys are out. Kai and Ty goes out, and then the Dudleys are out. Dude, this Battle Royal sucked. <laughs> it was no good. God I, damn. I watched this entire thing because half the teams didn't, didn't get intros. So I'm trying to figure out who the teams are. Like, okay, there's Taka and 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 Funaki. So that's Kai and Tai. Mm. I saw the Dudleys come out. There's D'Lo Brown. Who the hell is D'Lo Brown? Tagging? Right. Just Saturn half a part of what's going on. And it gets down to three. It took. It got down to three teams, and I realized D'Lo Brown and Saturn are a team now. Yeah. Right. What? I feel like they were something with the Godfather. Were they? Yeah. Remember? No. Obviously. Yeah, remember Dean walked out because he got the hose, and then Saturn was there. So they swapped partners. Yes. Kind it was of. that weird thing that was all baffling to us. Well, I guess I guess they stuck with it. Yes. So they actually, did. They were the second to last team. They almost won this damn thing, and then who did win? Actually, <laughs> the, APA? the acolytes. A APA threw them out. Yeah. There's a point to this. So yes. the acolytes win the tag team battle royal. So they are going to get a tag team title shot on SmackDown. So. They have some MSG house show clips with, of all people, Donald Trump. 
Yeah. He's heard the show talking about Rocks. Donald is there and he's getting booed by everybody. And so they ask him, who's your favorite wrestler? He says, The Rock. And then they all cheer him. Mm-hmm. Like, look at this. It's a politician. So anyway. Oh, wait. Then they go right to Edge and Christian, the WWF Tag Team Champions, against The Undertaker and Kane in a non-title match. The Undertaker and Kane destroy the Tag Team Champions and beat them clean in the middle of the ring. If I were fucking Farouk and Bradshaw, I would have been so pissed off. I would have been right. fucking furious. What the fuck was this? Yeah, why do we need to see the match again? We just saw him get destroyed. I don't have an answer. Does this mean Kane and Taker will get a tag title shot now? They Hell should. if I know. I doubt it. Well, I don't know when what you're I'll... that big a star, you're above the belts in this company. Apparently. So they just buried the entire division to put over yes. two guys who are already made events. Yes, that's what happened. Well, that sucks. Mm-hmm. It does, in fact, suck. Hunter and Steph go for a walk. King Kurt goes for a walk. And The Rock goes for a walk. They just do our main event of Kurt Angle versus Triple H versus The Rock. <laughs> so, I couldn't actually hear what they were saying. But there was more conversation in this match than in the the, 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 the Democrats are starting their debates next week. There, was, there were more conversation in this match than in, the, in that debate that's going to happen next week. They are talking constantly. Now, it worked. Everyone was in position for everything, and the crowd was going crazy for all of it, for God bless him, but it was amusing. Well, this was back in the day where the things were not quite scripted as intricately as they're scripted on TV today. Mm-hmm. They they had stuff that they could call in the ring. Yeah. And a couple spots they had to do at the end. It was a very good main event. It would pretty much be impossible for not to be a great main event with these three guys in there. Everybody hit their moves, and then as noted... Rock hit the rock bottom on Triple H after Chris Jericho interfered. This fucking feud's still going on, by the way. Well, he kissed his they wife. They never give yeah. Jericho anything. No. But it, the feud's still going on. Yeah. And Rock pinned Hunter. Yeah. Did you notice that after he pinned him, Hunter grabbed his right quad? No, I did not. Yeah, I wonder if he had a, a thing that was bothering him that eventually snapped. Hmm. I don't know. Mm. Some good sleuth in there, Brian. I don't know. Yeah. I do like, by the way... I'm, I'm, I'm sincere. I like this. Triple H is distraught and angry and furious about losing his title, and he has no time to be concerned with the fact that a man put his hands on his wife and kissed her. <laughs> Doesn't give a shit. I've got a belt to worry about. That's a good heel. So yeah, Rock wins, and that was that. Dave Meltzer at Anyway, we have got Edge on the line. We want to get to him. How you doing today? Not bad, not bad at all. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Um, this is the first time we've had you on the show, and um, I, I guess you know one of the things that uh, I had heard about about you um, is the uh, very beginning. You have a real interesting introduction into pro wrestling, as far as that the contest and everything. Uh, could you kind yeah, of tell it, everyone about a little bit about the background of your your, your begin your beginnings in wrestling? Sure. I mean, it was one of those things. Uh, as a, as a child, I gravitated to it. I was always into things like Kiss and comic books. So when I saw wrestling for the first time, it was like real-life superheroes. So uh, it just seemed like a natural for me. I, I kept watching. I was nine years old saying I wanted to do it. Um, but I was 17 and still saying it when I saw a contest in the Toronto Star that said, if you ever want to be a wrestler, write in an essay to uh, the column. And the, the free prize was uh, training at Sully's Gym in Toronto. So they called me up, Sully's did, once I'd uh, entered it and said it's down to you and a few other guys who want you to come down and see who we're going to choose to train. So they chose me, and that was the beginning of it. And uh, how, long, how long did you train, and how long was it before you had your first match? Well, let's see. I started training when I was 17. I trained for a year. I had a, a little battle royal that I don't actually count, um, and that was on June 1st. 92, um, but I, I mean, I was wearing track pants and running shoes at that point and been in the gym for about two months, so I kept training for a year. Exactly one year later, um, I had my first match, uh, which I consider my first match. It was a, a handicap match. It was myself and uh, guy by, or actually, it was a tag team match, myself and El Fuego against Joey Legend and Zach Wild, and that happened in Monarch Park in Toronto on, uh, on June 1st of 93. Now, and uh, the rest is history so far. Now, explain your path in, in getting to the World Wrestling Federation, because, um, I mean, I remember you with the, I guess, Sexton Hardcastle. And, and, and I guess I should ask you, where did that name come from? <laughs> it's uh, a, friend, a friend of mine who's uh, he's pretty creative, and uh, 
He actually had, he writes books and comic books and everything like that. He he always uh, would come up with characters as we were growing up when we were aboard in French class, and uh, one of his characters was Sexton Hardcastle. And uh, we we just decided that if I ever uh, started doing this, uh, that I would use that name. It was cool with him, and uh, I just thought it was hilarious. So, and it incites the, the kind of reaction that I wanted, and I could go and act like an idiot and dance around, which is kind of a little bit of what we're doing right now. Where did the, where did the thing about the flash photography? Who came up with that? Um, that was one of our writers, Brian. Um, he came up with an idea um, where basically we just you know we won the titles and everything goes to our head, and we just think that everyone wants to take pictures of us because of it. Uh, we don't come through the crowd because it, well it's just gotten out of hand, things like that. Um, so you know we'll sit down the three of us, and uh, a lot of times now Kurt and uh, the four of us will just sit down and just brainstorm ideas for each city, and we try not to get pigeonholed by doing you know the teams thing too much because then when you go back to that same city, what are you going to do um so we're always trying to come up with different things between the three or four of us we we usually come up with uh some different things now with the with the jay riso christian um yeah you guys go back how how, how far do you guys go back because i remember i remember like independent christian cage and sexton hardcastle you know going yeah. back many years yeah well we uh we actually met in grade six and um it was a funny story we uh he, he was a new kid in school. I went to Princess Elizabeth Public School. He was a new kid, kid, and he had a ninja star, and that made him, like, the coolest kid. So uh, we hooked up and started throwing his ninja star into trees, and that's how it all started. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you and him are, the, are actually the same age? Uh, yeah, both 26. I'm actually exactly one month older than him. And uh, we just, you know, watch wrestling. We're, we're diehards. And, um, you know, we'd wrestle, not that I'm condoning this, but we'd wrestle in his side yard and jump off of washing machines onto mattresses and things like that. That's why uh, I think we get along so well with the Hardys because they, they were doing the same thing on a trampoline in their backyard in North Carolina while we were doing it in Canada. Now, um, now, now, how old were you when you, um, when you when you guys first started watching wrestling? Did you start very young? Like, or... <laughs> Yeah, I was pretty young. I was like eight or nine, um, which I guess isn't all that young. But up until that point, I, like I said, I was consumed with Spider-Man and, and Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley. So, uh, you know, from there, it was just, uh, you know, when I saw wrestling the first time, it kind of took their their place. Now, what, um, there's, there's something I've always kind of wondered about, um, and that is something I noticed about a, a, a kind of a slight difference. And this is probably so, so slightly stereotypical, okay, but, but still... A difference between um, the Canadian wrestlers and the American wrestlers, and that the Canadian wrestlers, generally speaking, and I have often attributed to to the difference between Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan, that the Canadian wrestlers that that have come in tend to be better technical wrestlers and more uh, fans of the work rate aspect, whereas a lot of the American wrestlers that come in are kind of fans of. And not, not, and this was this is overly stereotypical, but, but on a higher percentage of the American wrestlers that come in are kind of like. Uh, you know the bodybuilders, and that not, they're not really. Let's put it this way: not as much into the work rate. Now, that may have changed in recent years, but like the generation that you came up with, that you know, yeah. that, like in that period. I mean, well, you, you I think. I, sorry to interrupt, but I think you know, per capita, there's so many more wrestlers that come from the states as opposed to Canada, and uh, I think that's why you you still get your core of wrestlers from the states that are good technical wrestlers and everything, but. With such a vast range of guys coming in, you're always going to have your your posers, your bodybuilders that aren't aren't real concerned about the work rate. I think what a lot of uh, the Canadian wrestlers uh, with our work rate has to do with Stampede Wrestling, um, and I think that's really influenced a lot of of well, it influenced me. I grew up uh, watching Chris Benoit, Owen Hart, Brian Tillman, you know, Bret Hart, Dynamite Kid, guys like that who. You know, enough said. They, their work rate is is top notch. Um, I know that's what Christian and I watch. We also watch WWF, but because of watching Stampede, the guys I watched were Ricky Steamboat and uh, Randy Savage and and you know Dynamite and Brett when they got there. Um, you know, and I think also a lot of us, as you can probably see, were highly influenced by Shawn Michaels because coming coming up at that time, as you're wanting to get into the business, he was the man, um, and and probably arguably the best ever so um I, I think in between stampede and michaels he, he's probably influenced a lot of the canadian guys the most um but it does seem like with, with the the small handful i guess not that small but the handful of guys that come from canada it seems like the work rate's pretty high i, I think that's uh it's a good compliment 
Yeah. Now, now you um. Okay, so you started out in in Toronto. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, I mean, were you were you someone who came in there and once you started out, it's like this is this is how I'm going to make my living and I'm going to make it and I'm going to go because you you went you traveled a lot more than most independent guys at that time period did. Uh, yeah, I don't know, just to get noticed or just to just to get matches or, or I'm not sure, but I just I just saw your name around in a lot of places. Well, it was a little bit of both. We do it to uh, get noticed and get experience. Um, it uh, you know we we went wherever we could. Um, one tour it, we called the tour from hell. We went down to uh, Tennessee for a month, and Christian was told, Jay was told that we had 18 bookings. It ended up being three. We wrestled in a barn in Fall Branch, Tennessee, in front of six people, um, and you know just got got dates where we could, and it was just uh, one of those things because we knew what we wanted and we knew in order to get it we had to do this um i always said to myself that i never had a doubt that i would make it not to sound egotistical or cocky but i think if you have that doubt then you won't um i had sat down i had a conversation with a friend of mine when we were both you know trying to break in and he said he didn't have that same confidence and to this to this point he hasn't been hired and i think that has a, a lot to do with it you need to have that confidence in yourself in order for someone like vince mcmahon to have that confidence to put you on tv now, how 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 was uh, working with uh, Dory Funk Jr. Because I guess I oh, worked with him a lot before starting with the WWF. Yeah, at the uh, the first Funking Dojo, um, Dory was the trainer, and uh, a year before actually, I had sent Dory a tape. Um, I was in two teams at the time. I was teaming with uh, Jay a lot, and I was teaming with Joe as uh, Second Violence. And I had heard they needed teams for a tournament in all Japan, so I thought, well, why not? I, I sent Dory a tape, and um, he uh, he said he liked it. So we, we had talked uh, on and off that year, and then I found out that he was going to be the trainer of that first camp. And so I was really looking forward to it, and it, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, I look back on all the people that I've learned from, and I, I was trained by Ron Hutchison and Sweet Daddy Siki. And then from there, I worked with Brett a little bit out in Calgary, and then from there, Dory Funk. So, I mean, the list of guys who helped me get to where I am is a, is a really good list, and I look back and I'm thankful for it. This first question here is from Ryan Anderson, who says, uh, how, what would you rate as your best singles match and your best tag team match so far in the WWF? Oh, yikes. Um, hmm, best singles match. I had a few with Jeff Jarrett that I really enjoyed. Uh, I think a fully loaded pay-per-view where I dropped the uh, the IC title to him was fun. Um, I've had some with D'Lo that I've enjoyed. Uh, yikes. I don't know, some with Jeff Hardy I've enjoyed. Hey, it's tough to really just narrow down one. Um, tag team I can kind of narrow down just because of so many of them since I've been there. We had one against uh, Val Venus and D'Lo uh, that was on Sunday Night Heat. Um, that I that I really enjoyed, and I think you know the one that everyone always wants to mention, um, which is probably my favorite, is the tag team ladder match at uh, No Mercy. Yeah, I and mean, that's the one that that everyone remembers. I think you know if yeah. you have to pick one match of Edge and Christian, that's the one that everyone that pops in everyone's mind. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's start hitting the phone calls. We'll go to Masad in Pennsylvania. You're first up with Edge. Hi guys. Hey uh, Dave, Edge, and Brian. How are you? Fine. Good. How you doing? Um, I'll ask Dave a question first. Uh, or one of you guys. Did you notice uh, Jim Ross making the comment? Pat Patterson came out on Monday. He said, uh, here comes Pat Patterson. Uh, and he went to uh, Tony Awards with uh, Lisa Lane, who I guess is supposed to be uh, homosexual. What, did he, what, what exactly did he say? He said um, Pat Patterson just went to the Tony Awards with, uh, oh, with Nathan yeah. Lane. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I forget who, but I, I actually remember the comment, and I didn't even know the person who was saying it out, but I figured that's I kind of, you know, you know you know where the Pat Patterson jokes always are, so, you know. Yeah, but is, is there any legitimate heat between those two guys, or is it just, like, uh, kind of ribbing? I, it's, I think it's more ribbing only because um, every commentator... Uh, that the WF has had, with the exception of when Vince, because Vince always played straight man, always made you know Pat Patterson jokes. I mean, you can go back to Jesse Ventura and all of them. It was just a, uh, it was kind of like the, an inside rib type of thing. I don't, I mean, I don't know that there's not heat, but um, I don't know. I mean, it's just it's just one of those things. It's it's I think it's part of WF culture is uh, that the commentators make fun of Patterson uh, in that in those situations. And the guy doesn't mind Patterson. 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know him well enough to know if he minds or not. I mean, it's just something that's always been done. I don't know. I don't know if, if what Howard Finkel used to think when they used to always kind of use him as the butt of jokes either. It's just something that they do, you know? Um, I don't. I, I really don't know the answer as to if he minds or not, though. After the broom spot, I don't think he could. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Assad? Que- yeah, my question for Edge was: uh, Has has WWF ever talked to you about a singles uh, singles push without without the tag team? Um, well, I mean, it's been thrown around uh, off and on all the time, um, but things change uh, minute to minute um, with the the, cult, the current uh, state of playing. Uh, you, you always have to keep people interested. When that happens, everything changes a lot. So there's been times where, uh, you know, a single push is coming and then it just ends up being a tag team thing again, which is fine by me. Um, I, I've kind of looked at it like the way Brett and Sean had their careers. And if I could, uh, try and forge the same thing, I think that'd be a really cool thing. They didn't, they weren't rushed into anything. They weren't pushed into anything. It just happened. And, uh, I'd, I'd like to think maybe that's the same path I'm on. Your you last uh, Owen Hart's last match was with, 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 was with you, right? Yeah, yeah, in uh, Chicago. It was uh, Chris and myself against uh, Owen and Jeff at the uh, Rosemont Horizon. Oh wow, was it the night before the pay per view or the week before? Yeah, yeah, it was the night before. Wow, I didn't even know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Anything about that, Masad, or just wanted to ask him if that was the truth? That yeah, was the case. just wanted to know if that was the truth. Okay, I'll hang yeah. up now. All right, bye bye. Okay, thanks yeah. a bunch. Okay, let's go to Kevin in Seattle. Kevin, you're next up. Hey, Dave. Hi, Brad. How you doing? Hey. Doing good. Hey, uh, Edge, first of all, I want to say, uh, as a fellow Torontonian, that uh, you're Uh-oh. my favorite wrestler. And uh, uh, thank you. congratulations on uh, everything that you've achieved so far in the WWF. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I saw your match at, uh, I was at WrestleMania, and uh, I'm going to say the triple threat uh, ladder match sold the show. Uh, other than that, I just want to ask, um, what happened to the angle between you and Val Venus, and was that supposed to be a work or shoot angle between uh, uh, you and uh, your wife or Val Venus's uh, sister? Um, it was one of those things. It was basically the beginning of a start of an angle. Um, we had uh, that match for the European title, but in that match against me, Val sprained his neck. Mm. Um, and that put him on the shelf. He tried to come back two weeks later, but, you know, like I was telling him, it takes at least a month of doing absolutely nothing to heal a sprained neck. So to hop back in the ring, I mean, it just wasn't a good idea, and it wasn't because I put him on the shelf for about another month. Um, at that point, it, things totally changed. Um, Christian and I went off and started, you know, going into this thing with the Dudleys, and at that point it had such good momentum. Uh, with the whole triangle thing that was building up to Mania, that it wasn't a good idea to stop it, um, to go back into something that had happened, you know, almost two months prior. So uh, that that's why that got shelved, and now we've kind of just gone our own separate paths and are doing our own thing. And uh, I'm engaged to, to Val's sister, so it uh, seemed like a natural. Are you ever opposed to having her uh, being part of WWF angles or part of a TV or uh, anything like that? Um, yes and no. I think if it were to happen, I'd rather it be Atlanta just because I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that with someone else. But at the same time, I wouldn't want her, you know, exposed to, to what we go through night in and night out because it's hectic and it takes a toll. Um, and uh, it, maybe if it were short, you know, if it were just for the one storyline, but then you see how popular some of the girls become, and, and you wonder if it would actually be that way. So I don't know. It's a uh, double-sided coin, I guess. Mm, okay. Well, I got one more question for. You. I was wondering, you uh, obviously you, Christian, Chris uh, Jericho, and uh, Chris Van Roll are, uh, I guess you would say, on the uh, on the bottom level of the top tier right now, working your way up. Who do you see in the next? group of people uh, coming up to the uh, the main event status, so to say. Let's see. Well, I, I would have to throw Kurt Angle in that group. Um, Kurt's one of the, those guys. He's only been wrestling uh, all together for, I think, about a year. And to me, he seems like a natural. Um, he's really picking it up. And from teaming with us, he's like a sponge. Not that we're teachers or anything, but we have more experience. And uh, he definitely listens, which is good. And he already has natural instincts on, on knowing what to do having to be told. Um, so I would say Kurt. I would say uh, Chris Jericho. I would say Chris Benoit. Um, I'd like to think we are. I don't know. It's it's always hard for a tag team to, to crack that, that top tier. Um, 
you know, so it may be one of those things where we have to uh, break up and, and do a program against each other for us to be able to crack into that. But, uh, you know, who knows? Well, I, um, certainly, I, I see you guys as being in that pop tier already, and uh, uh, I just want to say continued success in WWF, and um, good luck with everything else. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Edge. Okay, thanks a bunch. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, um, are you, are you living in Toronto or did you, um, move from Toronto? Actually moved from Toronto. Right now I'm in Toronto though. Um, I'm in my truck in Toronto, but, uh, we moved out of the Bahamas. And that was, uh, strictly because of the, the taxes here in Canada. When you, when you fall in the, uh, highest tax bracket, the tax are 48%. So that that just seemed like a lot to me, and I decided, well, you know, Lynn and I will move down there and give it a shot. So I moved down for a year, and we've decided that it's not for us, and we're going to be moving again. So it, uh, you know, it, it was worth a shot. We can say we lived on Paradise Island for a year. Are you going to move to the United States, or are you going to move? For, or are you going to go back to Toronto? I'm uh, going to move to the States. Uh, I'm going to buy a house in Tampa. Uh, and eventually I definitely want to buy another house in Toronto because it is home. And uh, both of our families are all still up here. Uh, so that, that'll that be where I, uh, you know, come to in the summers. But during the winters, I'm thinking Florida is a lot better. Have you, have you like, uh, before you went to the to the WWF, was there ever, like, a situation where, I mean, did you you had contact with say you know whether it be WCW or ECW or someone along the way, um, and you you was was it something where you always wanted to get in with the WWF or was there? Well, you had actually mentioned you were considering all and all you know you tried to get into all Japan at one point. I mean, how did how did the, your pre WWF career? Uh, who did you meet and not meet and and were there any like near misses? I guess. Um, actually, no. <laughs> Believe it or not, the, I mean, the one place I always wanted to go was WWF because that's what we watched in Canada. We we actually didn't get NWA at all. There was one show called Pro Wrestling Plus that showed little capsules of everything, so I'd see 30 seconds of Ric Flair. So to me, that was all foreign territory, so I was always geared toward WWF. Um, believe me, if the opportunity had to come, I would have gone to either ECW or WCW. Um, but, you know, wrestling where we did, everyone was in the same boat as us. There was never really any, you know, names on the show that uh, were there or were still there kind of thing. Um, there were always, you know, journeymen at that point. You know, we'd do shows, guys like Butch Reed and Greg Valentine, but they had already spent their time there and were done. So, um an opportunity never really came. Um, the first opportunity was the one I jumped on. And, 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 how, and what was that like? Who did you meet and, and who found you? It was actually, uh, I was wrestling an independent show uh, in Ajax, Ontario, and uh, a fellow by the name of Carl DeMarco, who's now the Canadian president, was in the crowd that day. He was friends with Brett and uh, said, you know, you got something there. Uh, I'll give a tape to Brett. And uh, eventually, Carl ended up getting the Canadian presidency job, like I mentioned. Um, when Brett went down with a knee injury, well, even before that, uh, Carl called me one day and said they needed to work some uh, Bob Hawley in uh, Cops Coliseum. Would I like to do it? And I said, you better believe I would. So I drove down to Hamilton, and I worked Bob, and uh, I was really happy with the match, and so were the agents. At that time, I was 22, so we kept in contact, and that was that. Finally, Brett went down with his knee injury. Um, Carl said I should head out there. I went out and talked to Brett. I went out there um, without a penny in my pocket, and uh, Brett said, we got to get you signed. So uh, that, that was that was the start of my WWF career. What were your feelings as far as the Bret Hart departure? Being um, that, you know, it was one of the guys who got you in. Yeah, it was really strange because my first uh, dark match was the day after. Oh, uh, Ottawa. Brett, yeah, so it, wow. it was... I had no clue what to think. I was just, you know, uh, I, I had no clue if that would affect me or what would happen. Um, and it didn't. But, uh, and it was the place I always wanted to go. And, and you know, I think uh, it, was, it was a really strange time. And um, so I, it was one of those things. You, at that point, I was just sitting there and, you know, saying hi when spoken to. Other than that, I'd just go off in a corner and do my own thing. Um, be respectful of everyone, and, and that was pretty much it. Uh, so I just tried to be quiet <laughs> and roll with been, everything. That must have been a real weird uh, dressing room that one day, because I mean, I, I just remember that that 24-hour period after after the Montreal match, and just you know, just talking to several people in the company and things like that, on uh, with, with with various viewpoints, um, all kinds of different viewpoints on what happened. But it was just. Uh, it was like a weird powder keg that didn't explode. It almost seemed like. I mean, certain times there were some very vehement people uh, that night. That you know, eventually everyone simmered down, and the company yeah. actually went through the roof afterwards. But it was that that one day must have been very, 
very unique first day, I guess, in the dressing room. <laughs> well, yeah, it, was, it, was a, it was a pretty uh, strange first day, but at the same time, no one knew who I was. So they wouldn't convey their feelings to me. Um, so I, I just kind of, uh, I was on the fringes that day and just, you know, went about my thing. And I think uh, that day I worked Glenn Culk in a dark match. And then the next day I worked uh, Jay in a dark match in Cornwall. So, um, and then from there just went back and sat around and waited. <laughs> waited for them to come up with something. So I was at home for the majority of the aftermath besides those two days. Uh, no, so I didn't get a full... Full, get the full aspect of it, but uh, I mean, I was there, and it was it was different. When okay, so we have Jay. Now, did you guys basically uh, were you were you brought in together, or did you get in first and help him along, or or how did that all you know kind of? Break I, down? I I had actually uh, I was already signed and gotten the first uh, invite to the first uh, Funking Dojo. At that point, uh, Jay wasn't signed or anything. Um, so we went to Japan a couple of times. We came back. I did the first camp and. Uh, Finally, when my character started rolling a little bit, I said, you know, I have this partner. If you're doing more camps, uh, you know, maybe you'd like to take a look at him. Finally, they said, yeah, okay. And uh, so, I mean, I've always said if I, don't, if I open the door a crack, he kicked it open for himself um, and went down and, and did a camp, and they were impressed, and he was signed from there and brought in as my, uh, my little brother. Uh, let's, let's go to uh, Derek in New Jersey. Derek, you're next up with Edge. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Too much. Uh, Edge, this is, I've been thinking about this. What was better, winning the tag titles at WrestleMania or winning the IC title in Canada? Um, I have to be honest with you, uh, I think the IC, because it was the belt that I always uh, really watched. Those were the matches I really watched growing up. Um, I mean, Steamboat, Savage, uh, Kurt Hennig, uh, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, they all kind of, uh, that, that was their springboard to the top. Plus to do it in front of all my family, all my friends in a building that I went to WrestleMania 6 at. That was a pretty special feeling. Um, that, I mean, that was still my, my favorite night in this business for me. Um, you know, I still get goosebumps when I think about it. But at the same time, Jay and I always, Christian and I always said that one day we'd win those tag team titles standing there in a side yard wrestling. So they were both real special, and to do it at a WrestleMania was even cooler. Um, so it's real close, but I, I think i got to go with the IC title because my hometown. Who came up with the idea of winning a viewing title at a house show? Um, <laughs> pretty pretty strange story. It uh, it was supposed to be uh, Jeff Jarrett and Ken Shamrock, um, and Ken got stuck in Detroit. I had wrestled in the opening match with uh, Christian against the Acolytes. I got back and I said, well, you're probably going to have to wrestle Jeff because I was wrestling him the next day. They said it would be a non-title match and uh, that we'd do a deal where I went, went over, but it wasn't, uh, you know, title match, so therefore there was, you know, the title wouldn't change hands. They, uh, as we were in the ring and I was holding the belt up, gave it back to referee Earl Hudner, and uh, Jack Lanza came out and said, what are you guys doing in the pay-per-view tomorrow? And uh, Jeff said I'm, he was going over. So he said, ah, go get your belt, champ. And I went, what? <laughs> and there's actually a tape of it that I have at home, and you can hear me saying, what? Are you, are you serious? Went in, grabbed the belt, and that was that. So wow. that would that would mean yeah, it was it was it blew my mind. So that would result in a shoot comment you said on Slam Wrestling. I, I'm sorry, I, I missed that part. When you when you were interviewed by Slam Wrestling, you said it was yeah. a complete shoot. Well, it was something you didn't. I guess you didn't know about it ahead of time. No, no, I, I had no clue. I was completely shocked, and there was a there was a picture in the uh, Toronto Sun the next day where I'm in like disbelief because I was, and uh, <laughs> but it was fun, you know. And none of my family expected it or anything, so everyone was just as shocked as I was. They thought I was holding out on them, but I wasn't. Wow. That, yeah, that, that, pretty that, cool story. That, yeah, that is a really cool story. I and, finally uh, have a question. I just thought about it during the break. Okay. Um, you used to work for Tim Flowers, right? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit actually out in Winnipeg. How'd that go? Oh, it was great. You know, Tim. Tim's definitely a character. Uh, one of those guys that you can't help but learn from. He, he's a, he's a veteran who, and everything he does looks sharp. I mean, it looks crisp. It looks solid. A lot, kind of like a Fit Finley. Um, we actually did an angle uh, myself and Chi Chi Cruz, where a tag team out in Winnipeg, which uh, was great territory uh, when you look back at the roster I and mean, to see it now, where all those guys have gone, it's incredible. But uh, against uh, my old partner Joe and Tim, and uh, it, it was it was good stuff. It was a lot of fun. Hmm. 
Um, this, uh, this is an interesting question. I never heard this before. Wow, this is. Uh, this says, is it true that when Vince Russo was in the WF, he wanted Edge to do a deaf mute angle? Um, I. <laughs> I had heard rumors. Um, yeah, I, I don't know uh, how true it was, but uh, I, I had heard rumors about it, and you know, people still come up to me to this day and, and say, "Glad you're on a deaf mute." Um, so I, I don't know whose idea or, or, or what, or if it was even true, but I heard the rumblings, and I, I just don't. I was like, "Oh God, no." <laughs> That's when you like think about getting nervous or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> they gave it to Kane. <laughs> This is uh, this is from Steve Gerwick, which is, is, has nothing to do with uh, with Edge, but uh, it does have something to do with what we talked about earlier. And he says that my full time job is a school teacher, like Bruce Mitchell. On a daily basis, I come in contact with kids ages five to fourteen, so kindergarten through eighth grade. The hot move right now with the younger kids is the worm. The sec most second and third graders that I talk with believe that they can do the worm and often attempt it. Children with better memories, the middle graders in particular, still like the stunner. So that's the older kids that grew up with it. Also popular right now are the pedigree, the rock bottom, the people's elbow. I knew the people's elbow. And the choke slam. He goes, I come in direct contact with 450 kids, and in my six years of teaching, I have never seen one kid attempt a WCW move. That's the scariest thing I've ever heard. In wow. fact, kids rarely talk about WCW. It's considered boring, consisting of old guys that the kids don't care about, Flair, Hogan, Page, etc. Now, I was always told, because uh, you know, my, my girlfriend's younger brother uh, is a super big wrestling fan, and he's 12 years old, and uh, he he has talked about, WCW. In fact, at one point he was a real big WCW fan, but the one that he would talk, talk about was the Diamond Cutter when Paige was really hot, which yeah. used to always kind of surprise me. But uh, <laughs> can you mention well, I think, uh, the pedigree on there, friend? Uh, I guess they're doing pedigrees. I, I mean, geez. I mean, I rem now I remember I remember him telling me once. This is when I got really scared. He we, he came by for a weekend and. Um, we were just talking about wrestling, and he just goes, oh, yeah, we had a kid, you know, um, who got all bloody at school today. And he goes, what happened? In recess, they DDT'd him on a tree stump. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, that's so bad. Bad. I mean, you know what, though? It's going to happen. I mean, we were doing it when we were kids, too. It's just uh, whether it's any kind of physicality, I mean, it, people, will, kids will run around and say, I mean, when I was growing up, Ninja Turtles, um, G-Force, yeah, that's really old, but... Uh, yeah, and nowadays, kids will say Pokemon, whatever, yeah, or wrestling. It's always going to happen. Kids always wrestle around. A lot of the times, wrestling gets the blame for it, and uh, I don't think it's always fair. Um, you know, kids will wrestle. But uh, back to the signature moves, I think it's just because the WWF does such a good job of, of making sure that it, the name of a move gets over. Really, in the WW, WCW, the only one I can think of is, like you said, a diamond cutter or a Hogan's leg drop or, or the Stinger splash. Stinger um, hammer with Goldberg. Oh, okay, yeah. That one really. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's another one. And um, uh, But, I mean, a lot of them, uh, any moves that are that are now happening in uh, WCW were coined in the WWF. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know. And when I think of uh, Scott Hall, I still think of the Razor's Edge. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I don't know. Maybe it's just uh, the way different company or different announcers, prom you know, uh, promote the moves. I don't, I don't know. I've always like that. That's what's interesting to me, bring that up because years ago, when a lot of the new moves were being introduced from Mexico and Japan, you know, when yeah. wrestling was really starting to change in the United States based on younger wrestlers watching the videos from the other countries, and guys would be doing new moves, and the announcers would have no idea what it was, and they would never say anything. And, and I would go, like, you know, I would always be on the announcer's case, you know, and, and, and all of them. And Ross finally caught on, and Joey Styles actually caught on before Ross. He was the first one, and then Ross caught on. And then the guys in WCW, Tanae, I mean, Mike Tanae did, but the other yeah. ones, you know, almost had a mindset that we're not going to learn any new moves because we know wrestling, and all these moves should go away. Um, yeah. And I, I would always say that, like, then people go, well, what does it matter what the name of the move is if they call it right? And, go, and I would always say, like, it doesn't matter what you call the move, but what matters is you call it consistently by the same name over and over again because then people react to it. A guy can do this spectacular move, and if it's not a move people are primed for, the reaction will not be nearly as good as yeah. a more simple move that people are primed for because it's been drummed into their head. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the people's elbow is a good example of that. It's probably the most simple move in, in anyone's repertoire. It's an elbow drop, but uh, because it's been programmed in, uh, you know, I mean, look at how over it is, you know. And I remember guys doing helos or, or everything was a moonsault for a long time. 
in the States. And any kind of flipping move or any kind of intricate move somehow ended up being a moonsault. Um, I remember that, uh, that, that era for a little while. Yeah. So, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts as far as, you know, you were in that, that match at, uh, the match at WrestleMania and, of course, the, the, the other ladder match. Mm-hmm. Um, you know where uh, Jeff Hardy did the one that, with that that senton or swanton off the top of the ladder and and some really really crazy stuff. I mean, yeah. sometimes you know when I watch watch those matches. In fact, the, the WrestleMania match came to my mind. It's like it's like you know yeah it's it's a great match, but I get scared because it's like w- at what risk you know at what point does the risk you know become too dangerous? Yeah, where, where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line exactly? Well, I think that's, uh, and that's a, a danger that we've kind of fallen into where now if we were to do another one, then what do we do? <laughs> you know, do you get a, instead of a 15 foot ladder, do you get a 25 foot ladder and, and so on and so on. And I don't know, anything, any uh, risks I take are calculated, um, because I want longevity. And, uh, I was watching Jeff as he was going up. I was on the outside and I was like, oh, be okay, you know, be safe, Jeff, be safe, be safe. And uh, I didn't, you know, didn't find out until later that he he was okay. He banged up his heels pretty good, but uh, other than that, he he could walk. Um, so I don't know. Uh, it's uh, it's one of those things where you do have to draw the line somewhere because if you don't do that again, then the fans won't be appeased, and then they'll say, oh well, that wasn't as good. And and you always want to live up to the billing number one and live up to your your matches before. Um, so you, you have to. Be careful you don't pigeonhole yourself into being this daredevil that, that people expect to see those things all the time. And I think uh, maybe a good example is a guy like Sabu. Um, I've never actually met him, but just from seeing maybe he's, he's just a hell of a seller, but uh, he looks like he's in pain. <laughs> and I think, you know, he, he's known as the the uh, suicidal, homicidal, you know, I don't know the, the whole phrase, but, uh, you know, from doing moves like that, and that's what got him over. But at the same time, you have to wonder if at some point he should have drawn the line. And I think that's sometimes about Jeff. You know, Matt, Matt kind of got on to it a little bit. You know, you still give the people what they want, but uh, you still got to be careful. Yeah, because um, I, I just like, wor- you know, sometimes you watch the stuff and you, you worry about, if it if if it takes this much to move some you know move the fans and they start expecting it I mean I, I just give an example is um the other night Ric Flair and uh, Vince Russo were brawling on the top of the cage somewhere to the hell in the cell on Nitro yeah. and a lot of people were going like you know they were disappointed because Vince Russo who's not even a trained wrestler didn't take a bump like Foley did or or Vince McMahon yeah. sort of did from almost because Vince was almost at the top of of a, of a similar cage and and I was just thinking like you know like I mean a super trained bump taker I would I would hate to see do it, but I mean I guess if it's you know it's been done, but well, some you know it's like you, you, it's something like people were actually expecting once he got up there he was going to take a bump off the cage because they have actually seen people do that. Yeah, I it, uh, and, and the he, thing he is, like super trained bump the taker would hurt fell into the ring, and the cameras missed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a lot. I mean, falling into the ring was okay. Yeah. Okay. Let, let, let it edge. What, what, what did you just say? Well, I mean, a super trained bump taker would hurt himself. No matter what, no matter what people say about wrestling, you take that kind of fall, it hurts, whether you've been doing it for 10 years, whether you've been doing it for two months. Um, so someone who knows what they're doing will still, you know, jar themselves. Vince Russo would have killed himself. Um, and I think, you know, that's kind of a precedent that's been set now. And, and any time you do a match like that, you're almost pigeonholed to try and to top that. And, and that makes it really tough. <laughs> Uh, phys- physically. This is from Kathy, yeah. <laughs> who says, I have a question for Edge. He goes, I live in the Maritimes, and I was wondering how you enjoyed your time in Grand Prix Wrestling. Actually, you know what? I had a really good time. Um, it was uh, it was a good experience, and uh, didn't make much money, but I didn't expect to. So uh, so it, it was a good time. I wrestled uh, Bad News Brown in the main event every night for the first month, and then the second month I wrestled uh, Rick Martell and Don Callis in tag team matches with Christian. So it was a really good time, and uh, we lived in Moncton in a little apartment uh, just off the university. Had a great time and a lot of fun. Did you did you talk a lot to uh, to Bad News Allen or when, when you were when you were working out there with him? Oh, yeah. Uh, Bad News, uh, we, we've done a lot of tours together, whether it was Winnipeg or uh, Bad News actually got Christian and I to uh, Japan. Um, so he's uh, he's done a lot for us, and, and we've learned a lot from him. He's a great guy. We, we, had him as a guest on, we had him as a guest on the show. He, his stories were phenomenal. Oh, he, he has got so many awesome stories. We've done like 12-hour drives, and he's just, you know, talked the whole time with his stories. Yeah. Great stuff, really good yeah. stuff, interesting stuff. 
Let's get back to the phone calls. We'll go to Casey in Tennessee. Casey, you're up with Edge. Hi, Edge. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, I have two questions for you. Okay. Um, what would you be if you were not a wrestler right now? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Casey. What would you uh, be if you weren't a wrestler right now? Can you repeat that one for me, Dave? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, she goes, uh, what, what would you be if you were not a pro wrestler? What would I be? Yikes. Uh, <laughs> that's a scary <laughs> thought because this is all I ever wanted to do. Um, I, you know, at, I've always wanted to entertain, and uh, I, I don't know if uh, I was meant to or what, but I've always pictured myself in front of a group of people doing something. Um, and uh, to me, wrestling uh, was what I wanted to do because it was physical. It was in front of people. If I wasn't doing that, geez, I don't know. Um, I've had a little bit of fun with acting. It's a little bit more tedious and monotonous than I thought it was going to be, but uh, that's fun. Um, maybe maybe hockey I would have gone after. Um, you know, being Canadian, that's what we're all born and bred on. Um, but that, that's tough. And I went to college for radio broadcasting, so that might have been, uh, I might have dipped into that. Who knows? <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to know. <laughs> <laughs> my, my next question is, when do you plan on getting married? Uh, we haven't set a date yet, actually. We just uh, we closed on our first house in Tampa. We move into that June 30th, and then uh, from there we're going to set a date. We're, we're not in a huge rush. We kind of want to get all of our furniture and everything moved in, get those headaches out of the way, and, and then we'll, we'll set a date and try and uh, get all of that uh, ironed out. So I would imagine sometime next year, though. Oh. Can you do me a favor? I'm sorry? Can you do me a favor? Am I what? Depends on what the favor is. <laughs> oh, my okay. friend, Ashley, is sitting right next to me, and she's crying. She is your number one fan, and I was wondering okay. if you could say hi to her. Sure. <laughs> Get her on the phone. Hold on. That wasn't too Hello? bad. I, I'm always afraid when they ask when they ask if you'll do a favor and you don't know what the favor is. It's yeah, to it's say yeah, it's like, uh oh, what I got myself into. Hello? Yeah. Hello. Go, go. Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh my god. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. See, before if I do this and I said hello, no one recognized my voice because I never talked. <laughs> so now, now I guess that's a good thing. They recognize my voice. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm sitting on a gas station waiting for a seat. I, that's what all the noise is about. I just been <laughs> filling my truck up with gas. So, oh, there we God. go. Back in the truck. <laughs> any, any, any questions, Ashley? Yeah. Ed, when are you going to come do an autograph session in Nashville? In Nashville? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's not really up to me. I just kind of go where they send me. Um, so uh, it's. I don't know. Call the double deaf and say you uh, you want us in Nashville. Um, generally, uh, I just get my booking sheets and and uh, wherever we have uh, autograph sessions, I show up. Okay. Well, I think I okay. might do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Oh. Thank you so much for talking to me. You're you're welcome. You have a good night, nice night. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye bye. Think we've ever had a call like that. We we have never had a call like that ever. We have never had we have never had an orgasmic reaction on the phone in the history of this show. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Uh, my mom ends up getting all my letters. Um, so uh, when I when I come up to Toronto, I have like a whole bunch of letters to go through, and uh, it's pretty much the same theme throughout all of them. A lot of a lot of teenage girls and a lot of oh my gods and things like that, which is flattering. Um, but and one thing that I didn't honestly really expect, but uh, at the same time. When I first came in, um, I, I didn't know what to expect. I never thought I could be a face in, in the climate of today's, uh, you know, wrestling. And when it ended up that I, it seemed like I was getting face reactions, I was surprised. And then the whole brood thing, and then the brood became faces, and I didn't think I'd become a heel after a while. Um, and uh, then the guys kind of started turning on us, and, and I kind of realized that with all the teenage girls writing, maybe that was why. <laughs> You know, um, it's real interesting though. Even even now, when you guys come out and um, and you're doing the total heel character, the the initial response is that scream. That you know, I mean, well, it, I, I I haven't heard a lot of that in wrestling. The Hardys are getting it too, but I remember like the Von Erichs used to get that 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 initial scream at the matches <laughs> when they would first like the, the, the you know when they first walk through the curtain or, or whatever. Well, it's uh, it's strange, and it, like I said, it's flattering. I think it's just uh, the hair, to be honest. You cut off our hair, and then <laughs> I don't think those screams will happen. But uh, I don't know. It's weird too. Now, now that we're doing this character, I notice guys our age are now on our side, whereas before they hated us. 
Um, I mean, not all of them. Now there's a lot of them that, uh, you know, have pretty degrading signs. But a lot of them now before would have been, you know, hating us. But now they I, they get a kick out of what we're doing. They're laughing. They're, you know, having fun, which, I mean, as long as they're reacting one way or the other, I guess that's all that matters are being entertained. But I think uh, right now our, our whole objective, uh, objective is to uh, get people annoyed with us, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, this is this is from Adam who says um, uh, you seem to be very natural and confident as a heel. Do you enjoy being a heel over a face? And uh, do you have any inspirations as far as your heel character? Like, were there any heels that you watch tapes of that you kind of like picked up a lot from? Um, to answer the first one, being a heel is a lot more fun. Um, just because I've always found it's a lot easier to get people to hate you than like you. Um, with that being said, being a babyface is fun too. Um, yeah, a lot of fun, actually. You know what? Either or, but I have to admit being here a little bit more fun because right now I'm being Adam Copeland a lot more than, than you know, the original Edge, the, the mysterious enigma. That that wasn't me, and I didn't know how to uh, how to treat that character, and I think it showed. Um, the Brood, a little bit more of Adam came out and uh, was a little bit more successful. And now, this is a lot more like me, so uh, I'm having a lot more fun with it, to be honest. And I always wanted the opportunity to uh, cut promos and speak and show that. I could do it, and uh, or both of us could do it, and um, so we're, we're having a lot more fun now. I'd have to admit, yeah. Uh, heels, yikes! Uh, Shawn Michaels, I, you know, I always watch Shawn, and uh, when I really started to get into Shawn, I mean, I was I was a big Rockers fan, but when he turned heel, I was like, yeah, this guy is he's the next guy. Um, so. Uh, that uh, and I'd like to think we kind of put a little bit more of a maybe an intelligent twist on being a heel than most guys do. Um, maybe we don't. I don't know. We we try and do it where we're talking down our noses at people, um, as opposed to saying you know we're going to kick your stinking butt things like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but uh, it, I guess Shawn Michaels would be the, the big one. Okay, okay, guys. Now it's time for WF Daily Trivia. So here's today's question. What city was the first ever Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair match held in? And I will tell you that, I won't tell you where it's not. Well, it wasn't Madison Square Garden, so I guess I could tell you. That's where it certainly wasn't. Uh, we are back here with Edge, and of course we have Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly here as well. We've got a ton of emails and uh, a couple of calls. Uh, let's get to Chris in Detroit. Chris, you're next up with Edge. Hey, what's up, Edge? Chris, how are you doing, Chris? Uh, Brian? Uh, I just got a question. I'm kind of go back a few years with you, Edge. I used to go to some of the shows locally here in the Michigan-Detroit area, and I just was wondering, yep. what was some of your opinions of it, and what were some of your favorite angles or moments from working here in Detroit? Um, actually, I always like going back to Detroit, too, because I see uh, the same little group full of fans that, that were there at a lot of my indie uh, indie dates. So it's kind of cool. It almost feels, I've always said that Toronto, uh, in a way Hamilton, because it was my first match in Detroit, feel like three hometowns. Um, so I, I always enjoy going back to Detroit, like I said. But uh, let's see. I enjoyed Thug Life a lot. Um, you know, that little group that we had, yep, and uh, that. That, that was a lot of fun. And really strange thing, too, is we had started doing that Canadian thing two weeks before those guys started doing it in the WWF. And uh, I know they didn't, you know, bite the idea or anything. It just happened at the same time. But we were like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, so it, uh, that was a lot of fun, the whole Canada U.S. thing that like, we did. Uh, and uh, having Rhino and Joe, myself, Christian, it was fun. Wasn't there, like, a point where, like, Joe, like, they did an angle or something where Joey was pissed at you because you chose Christian over him and he was looking for a partner or something? Yeah, yeah, they did the whole deal where they were both arguing over my services, I guess, as a tag team partner. And, uh, you know, they fought, and then Joe and I fought, and uh, it was uh, worked each other. It was a lot of fun. Um, you know, that, but that was after a little while, after we uh, wreaked havoc over the, the couple of companies there for a little while. Right. Um, okay, and one other question I have for you. Do you have any more – you said you mentioned you wrestled in Japan. Do you have any more aspirations of ever going back? Because, I mean, I think, like, like, especially with the roster you guys have now, if you guys could ever hook up something with, like, a All Japan or whatever, where you guys could, like, take on guys like Misawa, Kawada, Kobashi, and Akiyama, I think that's, like, right now with the WWF wrestlers that you guys have, with being able to work the style and everything, um, that you guys would be able to pull it off now compared to five years ago when – you had the big, you know, oaf lumping around. Yeah, 
Well, it'd definitely be a lot of fun. I mean, uh, just from wrestling guys that style, uh, like Johnny Smith, I wrestled Johnny Smith before, who's, you know, all Japan through and through, and I loved wrestling him. His, his style is, is just really cool and crisp, and it, it's, it was a lot of fun. You know, wrestling, uh, I haven't got to wrestle Ben yet, which I'm totally looking forward to, but, uh, Chris Jericho and I have, uh, you know, worked each other a few times, and just that whole Japanese style, it's nice, it's stiff, it's snug. Um, a lot of the Canadian guys work that way too, mind you, a lot of Americans. Americans do too, so but it's a lot of fun. I think uh, I definitely like to go back to Japan someday. Um, whether you know it was with the WWF or not, uh, who knows what the future holds. But I'd like to go back uh, again. Although I hate the food and I lost you know like nine pounds in nine days the last time I was there. But uh, you know, other than that, you know, I'd, I'd like to do it again. Yeah, okay, it's a crowd well, over there. My last question is, uh, is there anybody, like, are any, like, is anybody in the, your guys, you know, locker room, does anybody ever watch tapes of Japan or anything? I always just wonder that, because I, sometimes I watch Venus, and I see him doing some of, like, Akiyama stuff, because they'll do, like, yeah. the, uh, that blue thunder where he'll get the guy in the German suplex and turn it around into a, uh, into a uh, power bomb, and he also, like, sometimes they'll pull out the exploder as well, and I just wonder, like, if he ever, like, you know, if some of you guys ever, like, grab some of the stuff that you see over there. Well, Val's a big All Japan fan, and he did some tours for them before. Um, so he likes to try and incorporate some of that stuff into his style. Um, uh, generally, I know from my own experience, I, I actually don't have any Japanese wrestling tapes. Um, I always want to get my hands on some, but it, it just ends up that you, it doesn't seem like you have any time. Um, we're on the road so much that we don't get an opportunity to see any tapes. The only stuff you get to see is our shows or, or WCW. Uh, when I'm at home, I'm so always thinking spots and everything, but I'll go back to my library of, of Brett and Sean and Ted DiBiase and Bob Orton and guys like that, take what they've done, put my own little twist on it and tweak it up a little bit and uh, try and make it a little bit different. Um, Japanese-wise, I, I don't really, uh, like I said, have anything in my catalog, but uh, I'd like to one day just to take what they've done and make it uh, a little bit more of my own as opposed to theirs. Okay, hey, thanks a lot, guys, and keep up the great work, Dave, on the show. I enjoy it a lot. Okay, thanks a bunch, Chris. Let's go to Josh in Tennessee. Josh, you're next up. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, Josh. I was just uh, wanted to say, first off, to, to Edge, I'm a big fan, uh, really liking what you guys are doing with the new direction oh, for the you. characters. Um, I was wondering if there's any plans in place for maybe a name for the tag team uh, for you and Christian. Have you all thought about any names? Like a lot of times you hear... Uh, or two is Maple Leaf Blondes, uh, Suicide Blondes, things like that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I, we at first I think it's a little too late now, yeah, almost to to come up with the tag team name. And uh, you know, we did the Suicide Blondes thing, but you know, I don't think I'd like that in the WWF. I don't think it would fit. Um, we we just we were trying to think of a name, and that just kind of stuck. Um, and at that point, we were doing uh, basically what we're doing now. But when we first started teaming, we were still, you know, the mysterious, uh, the two mysterious guys that came through the crowd. So to come up with the tag right. team name, you know, the brood would have worked. Um, but it wouldn't work now. So I, I think we're probably, you know, I always just call us ENT. It just seems e easier. I, I don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. But I think that to change it now, it, it wouldn't really work. And I've always liked the fact that we still have two separate identities that way. Right. Once you get, uh, it's almost like you get pigeonholed when you get a tag team name. It's like, oh, that's that guy from the Brain Busters or, or something like that. As opposed to, yeah. uh, Arn Anderson came out of it, but uh, for a while he's probably Arn Anderson, that guy in the Brain Busters. Exactly. That's well, that's a good point. You always hear like. Uh, smash referred to as demolition smash or demolition. Yeah, smash. yeah, and and that's one thing I've always enjoyed that we're just he's Christian, I'm Edge. Right. Well, that's a good point. The, the other thing I wanted to know is, uh, you guys been teaming with Kurt Angle a lot, which has been great, made for some really uh, not only good matches but some hilarious TV. Uh, are y'all uh, interested in maybe staying with him? Is there a stable maybe forming, or is that possible? I'm sorry, I missed that last part. Um, would y'all continue teaming with Kurt? Uh, could y'all possibly be forming a stable, maybe adding some more guys to it, or is it just uh, you three right now? Um, the, the thing with Kurt, it, it just seems like a natural. Uh, we all kind of, the three of us do the same kind of thing. Um, 
I, I've always kind of looked at it like we're the tag team version of Kurt Angle, and he's a singles version of Edge and Christian. Uh, not appearance wise, not wrestling wise, but uh, just attitude wise. And even in the back, I mean, the three of us are all you know basically best friends. Um, so it just seemed like a natural. We we all. Uh, operate the same way and uh it, and it's entertaining we're having fun when you see us out there if we're laughing we're laughing because we're having a really good time and uh we're, we're having a good time you know pissing people people off yeah well i know the fans are enjoying it. i just wanted to say uh been a big fan of yours for a while and it's good to see uh you finally getting the character development i think you needed and uh oh thank you I appreciate great it job on the mic so uh keep up the good work looking forward to seeing you in thank the you very much thanks a lot guys Okay. You ever had a problem coming through the crowd? Um, sometimes. Uh, not anything real threatening or anything like that, but, uh, you know, you have uh, tough guys that uh, as you're walking downstairs with sunglasses on, there's no lights on that try and push you. Um, you know, you have, uh, well, like I said before, teenage girls that kind of try and tear at your coat and stuff. Or, you know, I've lost some hair. But uh, other than that, it's not been too bad. My, my uh, debut on... Uh, Heat, I guess. Uh, I think it was the first heat ever was against Jeff Jarrett in Anaheim. And I was going through the crowd. I thought I was cutting right to go through a path, but it was a bunch of chairs. And I knocked over like four girls, landed on top of them. You know, I, I disappeared for four seconds on TV. And, uh, oh, that's just too good. <laughs> yeah. It, and I knew it was going on. I don't think anyone else did, hopefully. Um, but uh, just totally bowled them over. And, uh, you know, I don't think they were too upset about it, but it, it was embarrassing. So I got up and went in and did the match but uh, you know th little things like that and I remember one time in Chicago some guy uh, you know jumped in front of me and I had to shove him out of my way and it got picked up on TV um, just things like that I mean when, when you're in that mode you're getting ready to go to the ring and you want to get there just due to time constraints for the match if anybody gets in your way you just start stiff arming them you know it's uh, you have to that, that, that but I'm glad I don't come through the ring through the crowd now. That scene, that scene in uh, that you just described. I, someday someone has got to do a wrestling movie and 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 do like a, a spoof of your character who does that all the time. <laughs> just to throw people around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just like you know, like uh, it's supposed to go left, goes right, you know, or something. And, and fall, yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't be much of a spoof. It'd be me. <laughs> it, could, it happened more than once, but that's the one I really remember. We got, I want to make a quick mention that um, this is when we do these trivia questions, we either get no response or we get answers within like a minute. So anyway, two correct answers already. Andrew Wallace of Essex, Essex UK, and Daryl Scully of Auckland, New Zealand. They got the question. The uh, the first Hogan Ric Flair match was held in Dayton, Ohio. So I did not uh, know that. Yeah, the, the first advertised match was in Oakland, California, but they actually did a match that was unadvertised in Dayton as a dark match at a TV taping, like three or four days earlier. Wow. Uh, let, let's let's head to Vincent in uh, New Jersey. Vince, you're up with Edge. Hi. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Hey, how you doing? Hey, Vince. Um, how you doing? You have um, been a fan for a while, and I was wondering, well, me and my friends, we always talk like, oh, Edge and Christian and the Hardy Boys, and these guys are going to go have great singles careers. And do um, you think we're now with the mic skills? That you have in the whole that whole new attitude, that you will be a singles wrestler faster than any any of the the three of them. Dave, can you translate? I missed all of that. Oh, okay, he was just wondering if uh, if you thought no, that you were going to be you you were going to be broken. You know, you and the two Hardy brothers and Christian, if you thought you would be broken into a singles wrestler uh, quicker than the other three because of your mic skills. Um. I think Christian has mic skills too, so uh, I don't think it would be because of mic skills. Um, and and the Hardys will too once they get a chance to develop them. Um, I mean, when we first started doing them, we were just nervous. We and the four of us have never had an opportunity to do promos before. These ones you're seeing of Christian that Christian and I are doing, these are the first ones we've done, and we're having to do them in front of a nationwide audience. Um, but we wanted to do them, and I, I hope that we're doing an okay job. Um, but I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think that'll break me apart from the other three quicker. But I think the Hardy Boys are definitely a team. When people think the Hardy Boys, they think the Hardy Boys. They don't think of Matt or Jeff Hardy um, so much. I don't think. And I think they'll be a team for a while. Whereas who knows with Christian and I? It's, it's been rumored we'll break up, we'll be together, we'll break up, we'll be together. Um, I think we're more. Uh, we it's. 
Hmm. <laughs> That's a tough question. But, uh, I mean, they even look like a team, whereas Christian and I have always tried to keep our own identity. And I think in the back of our minds, it's always because eventually we know we're going to go singles. Um, and who excels further past that, who knows? Okay. Um, can I ask one more question? Is that how the first um, comedy bit, I guess you did, if that's the word for it, uh, were you guys like, having stage fight by any chance? Or? Oh, but for the first time you started doing this gimmick, did you like? Were you scared about like uh, the fir for the first time you you started in this in this thing? Um, it, I mean, the first time that uh, you know you, you try to, it's like my first match on Raw. You try not to think about how many people are at home watching, and uh, I was a little bit nervous, yeah. But uh, you know, once I started rolling, I just thought about everything and just wanted to get my point across and get a little bit of my character and, and try and be, you know, just uh, forge a new path for the character of Edge. And, and now, uh, you know, I still get a little bit of butterflies. I, I, I don't get butterflies about wrestling matches now. I get butterflies about my promos <laughs> because I want them to be entertaining and, and hopefully people will react the same way as, uh, as I do as I'm thinking of, the, of them along with, you know, the other guys. Um, but that, that's when I get uh, a little bit nervous when matches don't do it anymore. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Ed. No problem. Okay, uh, before, we hit, before we hit a break, I want to mention, i got a couple of emails here. This is from Chris Viola, who says, uh, Your first pay-per-view was SummerSlam 98, and you teamed with Sable. It kind of came out of the blue, was never explained, and never went anywhere. Um, and he's he just going like, uh, was, were you supposed to be, I mean, how, how did that come about? And uh, at the time, did you think it was going to be a long-term thing, or was it just something that came and went? I think it was just something that came and went. Uh, I think maybe at some point it was, you know, talked about that we'd be together, but it was just the uh, right place at the right time. Um, I just started. Uh, no one knew who the partner would be, and I guess it just seemed like the right thing to do, although what made it hard that night was I think that night Sean and her danced in the ring or something to that effect, so everyone was hoping it would be Sean. Um, but I think it was a pretty entertaining match, and I had fun doing it. Uh, you know, I got one under my belt and could move on from there. But, yeah, it was just one of those things that uh, happen a lot in wrestling. You do it once, and that's it. When you when you first were introduced, I, I sensed it as sort of a, a, a ravenish character, you mm -hmm. know, uh, with, the, with the original vignettes. By the way, someone asked, and I, I, um, where were those vignettes originally filmed? They were actually all filmed in New York City, uh, between, you know, Brooklyn and the Bronx and all over the place. And uh, they, they were a lot of fun. And at that point, no one really knew what Edge was. It was just Edge. He's this, uh, you know, originally it was supposed to be like a 90s modern-day Jim Morrison, which I never really felt comfortable with because, you know, what was I supposed to be, like this guy that walked down the ramp in a drug-induced haze? I, I didn't know what it was, where to go with it. Um, and that's, I think it shows in my first few matches. I, I didn't know what to do, you know, uh, and like I've said before, the brood really helped with that. It kind of uh, made me feel comfortable. I was with two guys that I enjoyed working with, and we were all just having fun. And uh, once I started having fun and not being stressed out about what I should do in between moves, how I should react to the crowd, things like that, it made it a lot more easy and comfortable. And uh, this is from uh, Chris Hussein, who wants to know uh, where uh, you and uh, Christian went to school in Toronto. Um, actually, we... Uh, we went to uh, Orange Hill District uh, Secondary School. Uh, that was our high school, and then we went to Humber College together, too. Uh, we actually uh, ended up living in a place with our three other best friends, um, and we all went to the same college. So we went to, uh, like I said before, Princess Elizabeth Public School, from there ODSS, from there to Humber College. And uh, also, this is, uh, this is asking, uh, what did, well, how was, how was uh, doing the movie or the, um, the TV show Highlander when you were in the it was actually the movie, the, the fourth movie in, in the series, and uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, it, uh, I mentioned before about acting being a little bit more tedious than I thought it was, and it was, and it was a lot more monotonous. And, and you know, so many wrestling, it's, it's one or two takes you're done, and in front of the crowd, it's definitely one take. Um, but in comparison, you know, all of a sudden, it's 14 hours. Uh, so when you use the thing snapping off really quickly and it's taking, you know, forever, it was a... Oh, we're losing him. Oh, okay, he's on his, I guess his cell phone's going down. Maybe he went through a tunnel. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, anyway, um, until we get him back, I guess, uh, well, we should probably hit some, hit some phone calls. Uh, let's get to, uh, Liam in Boston until we get, uh, Edge back. Hey guys, how's Liam, it going? How you doing? I'm doing all right. Doing really good. 
Um, good. I um, I actually had a question for Adam, but I was going to ask you what. Do you he'll be, guys... he's, he's he's on. He's on. Oh. So oh, don't, don't worry about that. Yeah. Adam, how's it going? Um, We've got hello? William from Boston on it. Okay. Um, I okay. was just wondering if there's a reason that they switched the finish from the downward spiral to the spear. If if there's a reason for what? Sorry. For, uh, that it's... they switched the finish. They switched your finish from the downward spiral to the spear. Um, it, you know what? The spear's not really my finish per se. I just, you know, it fits well and the people react. Um, and depending on the person who's taking it, I, I, I won't use it. Um, so I'd still like to use the spiral, but at the same time, it's one of those moves that it looks like I'm taking just as much punishment as my opponent, and it doesn't get the reaction I've always wanted. So I've, I've been trying to think of something else to use um, that would, uh, you know, keeping in mind things that I could do to, like, any opponent or good reversals if I'm working someone like Rock or someone like, uh, you know, uh, a Stone Cold or a Helmsley, good reversals in and out of moves that, uh, you know, will will take the fans on a nice little ride. And I thought the spiral would do that. I When I first uh, thought of it, uh, of using it, I thought of, you know, reversals with uh, Shawn Michaels' Sweet Chin Music or with the Stunner or with, uh, you know, the Rock Bottom. Um, but it just, uh, maybe I didn't use it enough for it to catch on, but I'm just not sure it looks good enough, to be honest. Hmm. So the the spear was just kind of one of those things that I started doing when I was shooting Gangrel because it, it had intensity and our, our shoot was supposed to be, our angle was intense. Um, and it just kind of stuck from there because people started reacting and you kind of go with what works. Um, but if anyone has any ideas, feel free to tell me. <laughs> Brian, you got any good hold ideas? Hmm. The Blue Thunder. Steal it from Val. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I have to think of something that I could do to a guy that's the size of, you know, Rikishi, too. So uh, that's the hard part. Um, I just had one last question. Um, What do you guys think is the best tag team finish of all time? I guess this relates to Adam somewhat. You know what? They don't have one. This is a strange one uh, because uh, Bubba, Matt Hardy, and I were talking about this the other day, like two days ago, what we thought was the best uh, tag team finisher of all time, and we said the 3D has to be up there. Um, I think uh, Event Omega, as the Hardys call it, uh, the splash leg drop is a cool one, but one that always sticks out on my mind is the uh, the heart attack clothesline. Um, oh, thank you. Know, yeah. The Heart Foundation, it it was simple but effective, Um, you know, and I I tried to think of one for the Rockers. Being such a great team, they never had any good finishing moves, and I I, I hope Christian and I don't go down as one of those teams because we use the stack plex, which is – you know the, the suplex off the shoulder, superplex off the shoulders, which is pretty impressive looking. But we don't use it, uh, you know, every match, so therefore it's not considered a finish. And now that we're heels, it's like, okay, well we use the belt. <laughs> you know, um, you know, at being a heel, you don't get too many straight finishes over guys, so you you, you use uh, gimmicks here and there to get yourself over as a heel. So now, uh, you know. Team move wise, I mean, we have all kinds we could use, but it just doesn't really fit right now. Um, other tag team finishers that I like, I mean, the Legion of the Doomsday device was insane. Yeah. Um, so I think those would have to be, uh, you know, the top ones that I. Now, I want to remind everyone uh, if you want to call up for Christian, uh, you should probably get on the line right now at 1 877 392 3200 because we're only going to be able to have him for a, a limited amount of time and he's going to be up in just a couple of minutes. Until he gets up, we'll hit some emails and you can always email us at davemelzerdiata.com. If you want to email questions for, for Jay Riso, Christian, you probably should do that right, right about now. In fact, he's up right now. Christian, how are you doing today? Uh, not bad. How are you? I'm doing really good, doing really good. That's good. Um yeah, um we had uh we had Edge on just Wednesday. Yeah. Uh so and uh you two had actually exact uh back, exact similar backgrounds being even together since since sixth grade as we found out. Yeah, yeah. I moved um to the town well, it was a small town outside of Toronto and then uh, actually I moved from even a smaller town and then we met when I uh when I enrolled enrolled in the same school that he was going to and we've been friends ever since then, so were you like always best friends, or were you like in and out as friends? No, we were. Um, well, actually, it was a kind of a weird story because we uh, we were kind of more or less acquaintances because we weren't in the same class. But um, for some reason, I, I had a friend that gave me a ninja star when you know one of those throwing ninja stars, and uh, 
Um, I was like the only kid in school with one, so everyone was like all fascinated by it. And that's pretty much how we became friends because he liked my my ninja star. And we just used to go out after school and throw it at trees and stuff like that. So, you know, that's basically how we became friends. How old were you when you guys started going to wrestling matches? Oh, man, we, that, that was another thing. We both um, had a common interest in that. We just started talking about it, you know, the you know, we both were huge wrestling fans, and uh, we would go any chance we got. You know, we there was um, a lot of independent promotions at the time that came through every summer in the town that we lived in, and we'll put shows on in the, in the small arena there. So we would go a couple times a summer to those ones, and whenever we could, we'd, we'd go down to Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto and watch WWF shows. And, you know, pretty much all of our Saturdays were spent in front of the TV watching as well. So, you know, it was a big part of our, our lives growing up. Now, now you watched. Uh, he see, you, so you watched a lot. You watched, but both on um, WWF Stan, and, and Stampede as well, right? Yeah, we watched. Stan, yeah, Stampede was on. We got that um, on the Canadian Sports Network, um, TSN, the same one that carries uh, Raw now. They carried it on Wednesdays, so we'd uh, we'd um, kind of rush home from school and watch it. So after, like an after school deal? Yeah, it was like an after school kind of on Wednesday afternoons at five. We used to watch it. So yeah, we grew up on that. And then there was also international wrestling from Montreal that was on Sundays. So we yeah, we got quite a bit of wrestling on TV. I think that they was the was they have an English language version because I know I used to watch the international tapes in but it was in French. Yeah, no, ours was in English. I guess they had they had done that for um I guess for both markets. I guess but they uh, the the um, announcers did speak in English when they showed it in in Ontario. So. Yeah. Now in that in that era when you first re your first remembrances of Stampede International, who were like the the top guys in both of those companies at that time? Um, International, I guess the top guys were um, like uh, Martel, um, Bruiser Brody was there, um, Dino Bravo, um, Sweet Daddy Siki who ended up training me, um, mm. and then in, uh, Stampede I guess you know was always um, I guess Owen. Hart. So, was the, so this is like the Owen Hart era passing yeah, you. Yeah. The Bret Hart, Dynamite Bulldog, King. Era, right? Yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. So. Now when uh, when um, when Adam Copeland, you know, he got he got I guess trained originally by writing a letter uh -huh. or, or winning a contest with at the, at the Toronto Sun, right? Mm -hmm. And you were his friend, so did he kind of um, did you kind of like follow in like he started training and then he go you know how did how did you get in as far as training? Did he start training you or did you? No, did no, you I like... trained I trained at the same school he did. And actually, it was funny because, like I said, we always used to kind of sit around and you know we beat each other up in my backyard all the time, and we'd be like, you know, you know, we talk sit, sit in the backyard and talk about how when we were WWF tag team champions we were going to do this and this, and you know we kind of plan had our whole careers planned out, and we were like, oh yeah, you know, we just sit there for hours and talk about it, and um, you know that opportunity came up and he won that and actually I went down the day that he went um, after he wrote the essay there was like came down like five finalists or something like that and they all had to meet on a Saturday afternoon at the school so I went actually went with him um, he didn't want to go by himself so I went with him and um, and uh, so he actually ended up training for about a year year and a half and you know I was um I was starting in college and stuff like that. No, actually, we've been in a high school. I was, I don't know. I, I just didn't have the money for it and stuff like that. But I still knew that I wanted to do it, you know. So he he was doing it. and He was like, "Oh, it's great. I know you're gonna love it when you get a chance." And I was like, "Yeah, you know, I want to save up the money and all that kind of stuff." Then I started college like a year or so after that. And then, um, you know, when I was when I was going to college, I just we were we were roommates and all that kind of stuff. And I just decided that um, there was a time that I. That, um, that I trained and actually I used my student loan for school to pay for my wrestling school. <laughs> which, wow. <laughs> so that's basically, you know, that's what that's what happened. So I didn't really have the money for it until I went to college. Now, how uh, how 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 long did you train before you started going on the road or before like like what did you start working lo local independence and then some of the guys like saw you because I guess you guys I used to see your names around in a lot of different you, you did a lot of traveling for independent guys. Yeah, we did. We um we our our, our um whole thought of the deal was that we would just go wherever we could and um, just to try and get our name out and get work and meet people and kind of network, you know what I mean? And um, I guess the best way to do that was just to talk to different people that came to shows. When I started out, I did my first match. It was I trained for about nine months, and then I had my first match, and it was actually at my school. We put a show on and had people come into the school and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, a couple weeks after that, I went to um, – and I did another one for another guy in Toronto that was running a show. And then um, at this point, um, Adam and uh, another guy, Joey Legend, and that 
they were had met some guys from Detroit on a show. And they said, oh, you should come down and check out, you know, what's going on in Detroit. You know, we run a couple times a month, whatever. So they went down, and then eventually I went down with them. We started working in Michigan, and then, you know, we met people there that happened to be from, like, Cleveland, or, you know, we ended up going down there, and then we met people that were in Tennessee, and we ended up going there. You know, so we just constantly met people, and we just exchanged numbers with whoever we could, and we are just like... Basically, we just wanted to work. You know, we just wanted to wrestle. We just wanted to be in the ring in front of people and learn and um, and get experience. And that was the best way to do it. You know, never mind that we were, you know, putting more money in the gas tank than we were making. We just we just wanted to, to get in the ring and wrestle. So to us, that was the best way to do it. Was just travel wherever we could. Did you um, ever like? Did your thoughts as far as like ever waver as you're running around, like not making any money, working the independent scene, or was it always like we're we're gonna make it, and this is just this I is just it, how you make it in wrestling? I think it made me work harder. You know, I was like, man, I'm putting a lot of time and energy into this thing, and not to mention I'm broke. So, um, and it was, I knew that anything less than than making it to the WWF for me was failure, and. Um, this is what I've wanted my whole life. This is what I've wanted to do. I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to do this as a hobby on the weekends. This is what I wanted to um, make a career out of. So anything less than, than that wasn't good for me. And I, um, the more that I did that, I think the, the more that it made me um, strive to um, be the best that I could and to, to make it to, to where I am. And that's uh, that's the way I looked at it. I was just keep, just kept saying to myself, if I just keep working, someone's going to see me or I'm going to get a chance and, you know, all I need is a chance. And I just had it in my head. I just quit was it in my head, you know. I didn't have it in my head. And my, my parents were totally supportive of that. You know, they knew I wasn't making any money and I was living at their house and they didn't even charge me rent or money for food. My mom let me take her car on numerous trips, you know, and, um, they were saying, no, we don't want you to be 40 and look back and say, well, what if you could have done this? You know what I mean? They said, we want you, if this is what you want, we want you to do it. And I did. So, you know, I didn't have any doubts in my mind. I just was trying trying to, to prepare myself for when I got the chance, I was going to uh, I was gonna make the best of it. Were you real confident when you first went to uh, Dory Funk Jr.'s camp, which I guess was the prelude of getting your WWF contract, or was it the other way around, you get the contract first and then go no, to camp? No, I didn't. I, I um I had I actually had to go to a camp before they signed me. Yeah, um, I was nervous, anxious. Um, it was everything that I, I felt that everything that I had worked towards was going to be um, in this one week. You know what I mean? And I didn't look at it. I, I was trying not to psych myself out or get scared. I was just kind of looking, saying, you know, I just I was trying to, to, to convince myself that I deserved to be there and that just to do the best I could. And if that wasn't good enough, hey, you know. I tried, you know, but I, 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 like I said, I didn't doubt myself. I just went there and said, I'm just going to go over there. I'm going to work as hard as I can, and hopefully, you know, they'll like what they see. And, and fortunately for me, it worked out. Now, um, were, were you pretty con as far as like going there? Were you pretty confident in your ability? Because I know that like from the first camp, you got real high raves from from Dory from Junior as far as being, you know, a ring general, ring psychologist, you know, able to uh, control and lead a match. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, was that something going in where you you felt that like, hey, I know some of these guys and and I can hang with any of them, or I'm, I'm as good as any of them, or were you just like, man, I don't know how I rank with all the different guys they're bringing into this camp. No, I didn't know any of the. I knew one other guy that was going in the, in, into the camp, and that was Rhino, who now is in ECW. And um, other than that, I didn't. I didn't know any of the other guys. So, um, you know, I was just. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. All I knew is what I could do, and I just, you know, like I said, I was there to to work as hard as I could, and, and um, you know, um, I, I really appreciate everything Dory did for me. He was great to me, and um, I learned a lot from him. And uh, I had a great time when I was there. I was there to work hard, and, and I, I think I did that every day that I was there. I tried to anyway. Was it a pretty big thrill the first time you you got the tag team title or the light heavyweight title? Was yeah, it like actually, a it was a bigger. I think it was a bigger thrill for me to get the tag tag team title. It's more recognized, you know. It's um, um, and that's kind of what we dreamed of um, from being kids. You know, we used to sit around in the backyard and talk about how we were going to be WWF tag team champions. And to actually, you know, after having the matchup and to have it on our first match at WrestleMania. You know, and then just, you know, with knowing my parents were in the crowd and my fiance and my brother and all that kind of stuff was just a really cool feeling, you know, to grab the belts and, and, um, and it was, it was really cool. I just, it was like kind of like a dream come true, you know what I mean? I really, uh, it was a great feeling. Have you ever thought, I mean, you're like very early in your career, but have you ever thought of like, you know, you thought as a kid of, of getting to the WF now, have you thought of like how long you would want to do it or is it just as, as long as you feel, you know, healthy doing it? Yeah, I think as long as, um, you know, I'm able to to compete on a 
on a high level. You know, I mean, my body will allow me to. You know, I'd love to do this for as, definitely as long as I can. So I, I wouldn't like to put a time limit on, on that, you know what I mean? But to say, oh, I'd like to do it, you know, five, six years. I would, I'd like to do it as long as I possibly can, whether that's uh, 10 years, whether it's 15, whether it's 20, as long as I'm having fun doing what I'm doing and my body allows me. And, um, yeah, I just, I just I wouldn't want to do anything else other than this. So as long as I can do it, I will. What's the best and the worst part of, this, of of your travel schedule, as far as how grueling it is and everything? Um, the, the best part is you know getting to meet different people and um, seeing a lot of different places, and um, and probably the the the, um, the worst part about it would be, you know, sometimes you don't get to have as many meals as you'd like, or you have to skip a day in the gym training because you just don't have time. You know, the, the, you know, it all, you know, you have to take the, the good with the bad. So. We we have um we have a full bank calls. Before we go, I wanna I wanted to ask you, have you heard anything as far as uh, WWF as far as banning DDT or Tombstone pile drivers? And um, cause someone told me that that kind of came down Monday, and then I was watching the show yesterday, and they did have a, a DD. I noticed a DDT on the show by Rock. And no, I didn't hear that. Okay, that. I'm gonna try to find out some more about that one. Okay, okay. Uh, let's go to uh, Dave in Pennsylvania. You're first up with Christian. Oh hello. How you doing? Hello. Hello. Yeah, Dave, you just stole my question there. I was going to ask that exact question. Oh, okay. Can you think um, of another one? <laughs> <laughs> no, anyways, um, I guess a good question uh, for Christian. I think I'm really a fan of the work he's doing right now with Edge. Uh-huh. But it seems like it seems like the momentum stops. You, you win the big match at WrestleMania. Uh-huh. You do the next night. You do the, the great heel promo. Mm-hmm. And then it was like you guys were tweeners for an X, with this X-Pac and Road Dog thing. Then it starts up again with a flash photography. And it's going great. Then your job to too cool, <clears throat> and we see subsequent jobs to The Rock and last night to the Dudleys. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I wonder, do they have a long term in place for you guys, like a long term plan? And um, um, just yes or no. And um, what would you like to see for a long term plan for yourself? Or is it with Edge and Christian as a tag team, or? You know, what are you looking for in the WBF long term? Like, um, I think we were, our, our main goal was always to keep our own identities so that if it ever came to the point where you know it was time to go our separate ways, we could do that without being labeled just a tag team. But um, this, I would like to, to you know, ride, ride this. Um, it seems to be going well, really, uh, really well right now with what we're doing. And I'm enjoying it and having, you know, the most fun that I've had yet. So, you know, I'm getting a lot of uh, mic time, and, and um, we're doing a lot of backstage stuff, which has been a lot of fun. The matches have been good. And um, so, you know, when you talk about momentum, I don't feel like we've lost any since WrestleMania. You know, it's all about um, – I, th- I think we're, we're going forward. And I think as long as it continues that um, that way, I think we'll, we'll be fine. You know what I mean? I think eventually, you know, I don't know how long down the road we'll split up or, or even if we will, but um, – you know, like I said, we, we, we've we kept our own kind of identities. That's why I've never had, like, a team name or anything like that. We've always just kind of been edging Christian um, in that respect. So we have our own identity. So if it ever came to that, we could we could, we could could do it that way. Mm-hmm. I like to think of you guys as kind of like a new version, like a new take on, like, the Midnight Express. Uh-huh. And you've got this that, nice... That's, that's, the, that's a good compliment, actually. Mm-hmm. It is. you got this... Oh, yeah. sorry. you got this nice heel thing going. Uh-huh. Going really well. It's, it's one of my favorite segments on the show. Well, thank you. And I think there's a... There's there's lots of uh, drawing power in a feud with you guys as the heels instead of a face versus face feud with the Hardys uh-huh. and then also with the Dudleys. Yeah, and I, I wonder um, the Dudleys would need someone. Have they thought of putting a woman with, with you to put, so the Dudleys can put them through a table? I would hope not because you guys stand well on your own. No, I don't, that's what I mean. I don't think I think we stand pretty good on our like own. That. And for me, I, I don't personally. I, I think I think we're we're better off on our own. Yeah, um, myself too. That's that's my opinion, and um, you know, any time we can get in there with with uh, the Dudley Boys or the Hardy Boys is great with me because I, I enjoy um, wrestling both of those teams. They're fantastic, and um, like I said, I would love to, to go into another long thing with the Hardy Boys or the Dudley Boys. Any any time, they're they're great. So I look forward to it. I, I hope we get to. Um, when you had when you had, well, let me just get this when you had that the ladder the first ladder match with the Hardy Boys uh-huh. did you did you going in with you four guys did you have the idea that that you know you were going to have a match that was going to be 
you know, you were going to tear the house down with a match. This was the match that, you know, because it was kind of a match where you guys were all on the show and, and you were all doing very well, mm -hmm. but that match kind of like made everyone sit up and notice, and, and I think it made the management notice as well. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it um, or was it one of those things where it turned out better than you expected? Well, it did turn out, uh, it turned out as we had hoped, to put it that way, because we expected a lot from, I think when we, um, when I speak with the four of us, being the Hardy Boys and myself and Edge, that we're all kind of perfect, perfectionists about what we do. So um, if if there was anything that had gone wrong with the match, it would have been, um, you know, we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have liked it very very much. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm glad everything came off, you know, the way we we had hoped it, that it would. And um, God, I kind of lost the question. What was the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, it was it was just like uh, I mean, going going in, I like, say the day before the afternoon of the match was. Did you have? Did you guys have the attitude like we're, we're stealing the show, and and, it, and everyone in management and every wrestling fan's going to know who we are when this match is over, or was it just one of those things where when it was over, it's like, you know, like w wow, you know, well, that was like the best match we've done or something. So you, know I, I you know what I think it was is that we wanted to at least have it on par with what Shawn Michaels and Razor Ramon had done, and we held the standard. That was, pardon me. That's a hell of a standard. That was the standard. We wanted to be on par with that. You know what I mean? And um, I, I think we, we we pulled it off personally. And um, uh, don't, I, like I said, you know, it was just we were just hoping to go out there and do the best we could and make sure that every person that bought a ticket um, that night to be live or on pay per view were entertained. And hopefully that was the that was the case. And um, like I said, that was that was what we were shooting for was to be on. And I know I watched both of those those matches um, a couple times before. Just so, you know, so I get a a feel for what we were in for. You know, what I mean, it was it was pretty tough on the body and all that kind of stuff. So, but uh, it was great. You know, had, had you guys ever had you ever done a ladder match before? I never had before that. Wow. And um, I'd done stuff involving ladders, but never actually had a ladder match. And and whose idea was it? Did they did, did it was the Hardy's idea, or did management just come to you and just go, hey, you know, this match, you know, kind of put Sean. I would say put him on the map, but. It was like the, the big. It was a big step for Shawn Michaels and and, and everything like that. Um, and and maybe like this will be the one that can do the same thing for you guys. Well, it's funny because Edge and I were talking about having a series with those guys, and you know the the Terry stipulation and that wasn't in it. Um, that was kind of what they had come up with. We were you know we didn't know what it was. We knew there was going to have to be some sort of stipulation or something. And we and I was like, man, what if we could do like the best of seven series with these guys? That that'd be awesome. You know, we should you know see if we can do it and. Um, so we kind of talked about it, and then we talked about it with the Hardys and stuff, and then uh, we figured that if it came down to it, to, you know, to the final match or whatever, there would have to be some kind of special match, and we kind of all, all agreed on, on pitching that double ladder match. So that's kind of how that ended up. Anything else, Dave? Oh, just one last thing, Dave. Thanks for staying with me. Um, if the WWF came to you, Christian, and they said, you know, we want to do some upward mobility thing here, we want a, a stable, like to, to feud with maybe DX, if the expert turned face the void or something like that, just to make a stronger faction kind of thing, um, like a kind of like a horseman, like or the Heart Foundation was a few years ago in the, in the WBS. Um, what two guys would you like to see put with you and Ed and Christian? I could think Ed, Christian, Benoit, and Jericho. Uh -huh. I think that'd be an excellent stable right awesome. here, a good. year or so down the line. Or maybe Kurt. Than that. Yeah, Kurt Angle. <laughs> Kurt, <laughs> Kurt Angle. Sort of linked with you guys right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that would, that would be great. I'd kind of like to see a U.S. Canada thing though myself, but. You never, you never know what could happen. <laughs> you never know, but that, no, that would be, that'd be sure. I would love to, to get a chance to work with, uh, to, with Benoit. He's always been, you know, one of my favorites to watch, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to being able to work with him sometime in the future. Okay, so I Chris say, uh, one of my good friends, so oh, that'd okay. be great too. Let's go to, let's. Uh, I want to thanks, okay. Dave. Uh, I want to, let's go to Nick in New Jersey. Nick, you're up with Christian. Oh, hey, Dave and Christian. How you uh, doing? I have a question for Christian. I was wondering. Uh, what do you feel about uh, all the high-risk maneuvers that you've been taking recently, especially in the ladder match at uh, No Mercy? Um, <clears throat> well, what do you mean? How do, how do I feel after or how do I feel about doing them? How do you feel about doing them? You know, there's been countless injuries and everything. Um, I don't really try. I try not to think about the injuries too much. I think if you do that before you go in, you're going to psych yourself out, and I think there's a bigger risk of, of hurting yourself or somebody else. Um, of course, you're aware of what could happen and and all that kind of stuff, but I uh, you know, if I, I'm sitting maybe after the, like a day or two after it, I'm watching it. I'm saying, man, you know, we really could have got hurt there or something. I try not to think about it when I'm doing it because I don't want to psych myself out. And when you're out there and your adrenaline's pumping and the fans are cheering, and you know, you're just you're just in the moment. You know what I mean? You don't you, you feel it more the day or the day after that. You know what I mean? 
Mm-hmm. The first couple days after is when your, your body feels it. So, um, I don't know. I just I just want to entertain people and uh, give them their their, their, uh, their money's worth and hope they have a good time. And uh, that's basically how I feel about it. All right, that's about it. Great. Is there any is there anything that you have done uh, in in one of these big matches? That you either looked at the tape or you felt it with you felt it like the day after, and you just go, you know, wow, that one maybe I shouldn't have done, maybe, you know, like like uh, you know that you know my back hurts a little too much, and I know exactly which one it's from, or 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 has that not really happened to you? No, um, in WrestleMania when when um, Jeff Hardy and I were on top of the ladder and they shoved it and we both fell off the top of the ladder over the rope to the floor, I landed on my side, and the next morning when I woke up, I tried to roll over out of bed, and I was like, oh my hip, you know what I mean? So, you know, just. I don't know. I don't. You know, I know exactly what it's from. Some of them, you know, what they're from and that. But a lot of times, when you're taking so many bumps and, and you're getting hit, you don't really know which, which exactly is which. So, but uh, do you have do you have like a a feeling as far as like uh you know just just, just like to chairs to the head worry you or is there anything that you do actually that that kind of worries you or that you would want to back off on or is. Or right now is everything everything cool? You know, you you pretty much feel like you're comfortable with everything that you're doing. Yeah, I'm pretty comfortable. You know, um, I I try not to um, do anything that I don't feel that I can do. Um, and I don't think I don't think anybody should do if they don't feel comfortable with something. I don't think they should do it. So definitely, if I don't feel comfortable doing something, you know, I would say I don't think I can do that. You know what I mean? Or you know what I mean? Because either otherwise you're going to hurt yourself or somebody else is going to get hurt. You don't want that. So you know, basically, I don't do anything that I don't think I can do. What was your What was your feelings as far as like uh, going to Japan and, and wrestling in Japan? I loved it. You know, I, I it was a dream of mine to, to wrestle over there to experience it because um, I was always um, you know I got Japanese um, tapes or magazines whenever I could. And I, I just always, it was something that I really wanted to experience, was to be over there and be able to go over there and do two tours. It was great. And I had a great experience and a great time, and it was a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, I wish I could have, have ended up going more. But, um, yeah, I had a good time. I, I'm, I'm glad I went. SmackDown last night did a 5.0 rating. It opened at a 4.0. Main event went off the air at a 5.7. So that's a... It's a pretty solid rating. It's actually uh, better than the overnight sort of indicated that it would do. So that's pretty good. good. Let's 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 go to Tanisha in California. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. I just want to say that first day. I think you are a great piece of talent that the WWF has right now. Thank you. I think you're pretty underrated. And oh, thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. And on a side note, I was at the WWF Access the uh-huh. WrestleMania 2000, and I almost had the chance to meet you. I was too busy yelling at Bob back when I turn around and I see the back of your head. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, man. Did you have a good time there? Huh? Did you have a good time at the Access? Oh, yeah. It was it was the best thing in the world. And it's got that it was the first one, and I was there, too. Good, good. I think they're going to do another one next year, too, so it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, next door in Texas. I, I need to get a car. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... If you weren't a wrestler, what do you think you would be doing? Because I know that you've like grown up watching it and you dreamed of doing it, but you so have mic skills and <laughs> that you could do. You so have them. <laughs> what do you think you'd be doing? Um, God, I don't know. You know, I was um, I was actually going to go through school to be um, a physical therapist, uh-huh. and I actually had ambitions of also playing pro hockey. So I played. Uh, I was a goalie in hockey up till junior. And I always tell my parents, you know, I'm either going to be a pro hockey player or a pro wrestler. So you never know. Maybe I, uh, I would end up going the hockey uh, route and would end up being a pro hockey player. I don't know. That would have been my dr- my other dream other than this. So. Oh, that's pretty cool. And what, what do you really think about, like, the negative things people say about wrestling? Because a chick, because me being a chick down here in California, I get a lot of crap just for being a fan, having, like, your picture all over my folder and everything. And, uh-huh. and I just really hate it. <laughs> I get sick of it. What do you think about it? Because, like, for me, it just makes me want to watch more. Um, I don't know. I, I just think I don't think it's anything um, that people don't see already in right. um, movies. You know, people have to realize it's entertainment, and um, it's um, a live action adventure series, basically. You know what I mean? It's it's nothing they wouldn't see in a movie or like on NYPD Blue or something like that. You know what I mean? If you don't like it, then don't watch it. Change the channel. It's as simple as that. You know what I mean? Or um, you know. That's my that's my thought on it anyway. Yeah, I always say that. I say, go on. 
shut up. So. Well, I mean, every, everyone, you know, I mean, one of the things uh, that, that all of us growing up as wrestling fans have encountered is, uh, is, is that, you know, sometimes wrestling brings it upon itself, and sometimes people don't know anything about wrestling and make um, stereotype judgments and suppositions, and you just have to realize that, you know, uh, you know, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of both, and and um, if the if the comments are made by people who don't know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. take them for for what they're worth, and if they're made by people who who do and there's something to it, just go well, you know, it's not a perfect world, and <laughs> nor is any other form of entertainment perfect. You know, you have a, I have a lot of people say to me, oh, I'm sorry, you know, um, I don't watch wrestling, you know, I don't I don't know who you are, and it's like that's fine, you know, I mean, it doesn't bother me. Not everybody likes. Uh, likes football, so, you know what I mean, not everybody's going to watch football, you know, I mean, it's just a personal preference, you know, if you like it, that's great, if you don't, that's fine, too, you know. Opinion. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, as far as, like, uh, to, to me, like, it's like, if people make, like, what you would, what I would call a stereotypical comment, uh -huh. where they blanket the whole industry, or they yeah. blanket, you know, like, oh, every wrestler is stupid, or every wrestler is a barbarian, or, or yeah. wrestling is stupid, you know, just go, like, you know, that's just, I wouldn't even, like, listen to that, because it's like, there's good and bad, there's good and bad in everything. Right. You know. And you shouldn't be ashamed of, of being a fan of something oh, that you enjoy yeah. at all. I'm, you know, I mean, I people don't tell people. I, I never really understood why people like, you know, people used to go to me, and, and it was always like, um, oh, you know, those wrestling fans, they're so crazy. And I would go to hockey games, and I would go to football games. And, I mean, people lived and died. I mean, in this area, just growing up, people used to live and die if the 49ers won or lost. And I was uh, thinking, like, And there's people you know, dying at soccer games in Europe, so, you know, yeah, there you go. yeah. And I was thinking, like, you know, it didn't matter to me that much who won the wrestling match. I didn't live and die with it the rest of the week. It was just... Uh, so you're going to be entertained is basically what it is. You know? And if you're being entertained by it, that's great. And if you're not, yeah. then find something else that entertains you. It's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Anything and, else, Tanisha? Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who wants to be in the business one way or another? I don't want to, like, wrestle, but... Just... Um, I would say... Uh, uh, best advice to give is probably um, try to be patient, and because um, you know at times it can be it can be a, a tough a tough thing to do. It's it's hard, and um, uh, if you re if it's something you really want to do, um, if, and it doesn't just go for for the wrestling industry, it goes for any industry. If it's something that you really want to do, then pursue it, and don't let anybody tell you any different. And um, try your hardest, and um, Get your name out. Get as much um, uh, work you can, you can, and uh, that's basically the best advice I can give. I think I think you should probably go to a school that's like t taught real wrestlers too. Really? Okay. You know, I mean, as far as um, I mean, there's a million wrestling schools. I would mm -hmm. go to one that that um, you know, where where you could look and go, okay, you know, this person has gone. You know, there's people that have gone through this school that have gone somewhere or the teacher someone who's, you know, well respected in the industry or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's but, more than just one too. You might want to check out a few of them and make sure yeah. that that's you know, I mean, and see which one may be best suited for you. Or um right. you know, there's 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 many. So, you know, you may want to check out, you know, five or six or or whatever. I've got a couple in mind up in Northern California. Okay. I don't know I don't know much about the mountain California though, so Yeah. Okay. 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 We're just talking to okay. you. Okay, thanks so much, Tanisha. Uh, let's go to Dominic in Virginia. Dom, what's happening today? Pretty good, David. I actually want to say great interview last night with Tom Zink. Got a chance to I, listen to it this morning. I was re I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Just like that was a time. real that was a real entertaining show. I wanted to hear more stories about Brian Pillman, really. <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll have him on. I tell you, I think the last two days have been two of of my favorite shows when we had Edge on Wednesday and and Zink yesterday. They were just real. The, both shows I thought were just like a lot of fun. Uh, definitely, uh, Christian. Um, actually, two questions. Okay. Uh, first of all, I know that um, before you started full time with WWF, you did a few spot shows with uh, uh, Jim Kentner up uh -huh. in uh, Delaware, Maryland. Uh, just wonder what your opinions of him and a lot of the young wrestlers he pulls out from up there. And secondly, if you had to choose, which would you prefer: an hour's worth of stink faces or an hour's worth of naked lap dances from Mae Young? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll answer the Jim Kretner question. <laughs> um, Why won't no one answer my questions on that? <laughs> Jim Kretner is uh, is a good guy. He's um, he was very good to me. He treated me great from the day that I was that I met him, and um, um, I enjoyed working for him very much. And um, I think he, he he has a great little show there that he runs and has some loyal fans. And he really tries to make a little show into a big production, and I think it's great. And um, 
you know, he's got a, himself a little video screen so he can show, um, you know, music videos and entrance videos and little backstage interviews and stuff like that. And it's great, you know what I mean? He, and he has lights and um, ring announcing and, and um he, he makes tapes and, 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 and all kinds of stuff. You know, he's, he's, just a, he's a good guy, and um, he treats his guys good, which is really important. And um, the guys that work there, too, are, are great. They're really nice guys, and um, he's got a great little promotion there. Yeah, because I've only, I've only been in Virginia for two years, but I've heard a lot about his promotions. I've already hit a couple shows, uh-huh. including the um, Great Eight, which to me is one of the most unbelievable at least of getting as much talent, not just of Northeast, but from all over. Uh-huh. Like he was pulling guys out from California, from the Midwest. I yeah. Mean, basically, yeah, he, he, he flew me down from Toronto um, to do a few of his shows, and I appreciated that very much. It saved me having to drive 12 hours. <laughs> yeah, I've told Dave he should get him on, because, I mean, for a guy who's been in the business for over 30 years, pretty much you've been there. Yeah, he's been, he's been doing this for over, I believe, I think 32 years he's been doing this. I was looking yeah. on the... Oh, oh, I'm aware. Yeah, I'm aware. He, you're right. And he's been, you know, there's there's very few guys that have survived on that independent level. I don't know of anyone who's survived that long. Mm-hmm. And he, like I said, he's got some loyal fans there, and he puts on a great show, and, and uh, the fans are happy every time they leave his uh, his shows, which is important. I sure think, Christian, uh, actually a legitimate question. Um, okay. What do you think the WF should do really in, to try to um, work on the light heavyweight division? Because you kind of got into that right away before that unfortunate task with Gilbert, which uh-huh. I don't think you really want to put that as a highlight of your career, being the first win for Gilbert. Uh-huh. But um, I mean, what do you think they should do? I mean, would they best thing be outside sources, either Mexico or Japan, or even just try to work with what they can, bring some guys up from Memphis? I mean... Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I guess you know the only thing they really can do is um, is um, bring in more guys that would fit into the the light heavyweight um, that would you know pretty much wrestles light heavyweights all the time. You know they just need uh, I guess like you said more more uh, light heavyweight guys to, to fill up the um, the division. Yeah, basically, you know. Um, they have they have a few now. I like to. I don't personally see myself as a light heavyweight. You know. Um, what's what's your what's your legit weight? Um, right now I'm about two two sixteen. Two sixteen. Just about six foot one. When you were when you were growing up, did you ever worry about size being an issue, especially in the eighties? Well, when I was growing up, size like, was an issue. You know what I mean? I, I, sure. Uh, guys were huge. monsters. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it, it's evolved to athleticism, and um, and that, that's that's worked in my benefit. You know what I mean? Um, and, a, and a lot of the other guys, like the Hardys or, or other guys like that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was definitely intimidated. That was one of the questions I had when I was starting training at, in wrestling camp. Was, Am I going to be big enough? But uh, I train pretty regularly, and I know that I'll, I'll never be the biggest guy in the world, And but I'll just try to keep myself in the best shape that I can um, for me, and that's fine. And um, I feel like I'm at a good size because I um, – I can I can move pretty well and I'm not the smallest guy there, but I'm not the biggest by any means. So I feel good about the way that I am in the ring. So, all right. Well, I think Christian, um, enjoy the rest of your career. I've always enjoyed you. Um, Appreciate that. Thank you very there. much. And uh, as somewhat of a fellow Canadian, I'm a border town. I'm okay. kind of surprised that it's not superior that every person, every young boy who's in Canada dreams up of being a pro hockey player. Yeah, I'd like to be <laughs> one who doesn't. That's right. <laughs> all right. Enjoy. Take care. When um. When you were growing up, um, and even now, what, what are there any wrestlers who specifically you enjoy? Like as far as you talked about getting tapes and things like that. So, so you you grew up and like saw Japanese tapes and tapes from from the states and things like that. Is there was there were there any people going like well you know in that in that mid eighties period I guess is when when you're when we're talking about that you were just like oh, I can't wait to get a tape of you know this guy or like a match was there ever a match like uh, oh I wish like Ric Flair would wrestle Owen Hart or something like that. Yeah, there was. We- it was funny because Edge and I used to sit around when we were like in seventh grade, and we would uh, we we had um, we had an, an old um, school textbook, and we'd write in it dream matches that we we would like to see, and then we also also put in the other column who we thought would win the match, you know, stuff like that. So <laughs> it was, um, you know, I, I enjoyed watching um, tons of different guys, you know, um, and actually in Stampede they had some Japanese talent there, like um, uh, Hirohase was there. And uh, Lager was there actually before he was Jushin Lager, and um, I used to enjoy watching those guys there. And uh, you know, I used to enjoy watching guys like um, Ricky Steamboat was one of my favorites. I always watch like watching Savage and Bob Orton, and you know, I like watching the Honky Tonk Man just because he was such a great heel. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, of course, uh, Bret Hart. 
Because of that, I just love watching Mr. Perfect. I love just well, love watching guys that could wrestle, go out there and, and really wrestle. You, you, so, so when you were you were a kid, you recognized the 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 I guess athletic wrestling ability right uh-huh. away. Because almost all of the guys that you've named, with the exception of Honky Tonk Man, pretty much mm-hmm. fit that bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, I um I, I just enjoyed watching guys that could really go out there and just go. You know what I mean? And um, to me, all those guys could. You know, like one of my favorite matches of all time was Steamboat and Savage WrestleMania three. I still have it on tape and watch it from time to time. You know, so. Did did how how old were you when you sort of realized that uh, you know, uh, the the big aspect of the match was the guy selling the moves and things like that? I mean, were you like, could you recognize that when you were like a young kid, or or was it going to wrestling school or somewhere in between where you go like. Hey, you know, wait a minute. This guy always has good, this guy always has good matches because you know, you know I really didn't r- really understand it until I um when um Adam got into it before I did, I started to understand it a little more. But up until then, I was just like, you know, I didn't really really know. I just knew that I love watching these guys wrestle, you know what I mean? And uh, but I understood I started to understand why they had, they always had such good matches and why I under- I, I I liked watching them so much when I started to get into it. Yeah, because when I was when I was a kid, I, I didn't understand that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But I always it was weird because, like, you could sense certain guys, you know, always had good matches, uh-huh. and and other guys didn't, you know. And 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 I would always and I knew like who were good workers and who weren't, but I never understood the carrying and the 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 um the selling and and why. You know what I mean? I, I, I like it's like you you knew who was going to have a good match, but. I mean, I, I can't remember. I mean, I was a lot older than most people think before I understood why, even though I always knew who would have the good match and who wouldn't beforehand uh-huh. usually. Yeah, it was the same okay. kind of deal. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's get let's get a couple of the emails because we're flooded with them, actually. This sure. Is, um, this is from Scott in Maine who says um, he wonders if you have any good stories about Owen Hart, if you knew him well at all, and um, and also did you ever watch tapes of the Super Junior tournaments from Japan and ever want to be in something like that? Yeah, I always thought it would be cool to be in the Super J uh, tournament. I, I did watch one. Um, I believe Benoit won the year or the one that I watched. Um, I've watched a couple of them, and I, I really enjoyed them. You know, I thought it was pretty cool, cool tournament to have all the, the different guys from the different companies there in uh, one tournament. I thought it was a pretty neat idea. And um, Owen was a really nice guy. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Um, and he was one of the funniest, and he helped me out a lot. And um, with anything, could have been advice for a match or just about a, changing a plane ticket to get home. You know what I mean? He uh, he was like, uh, it was funny because Edge used to call him the road guru. So we'd always go to him and ask him questions and stuff like that because um, he was just such a good guy. You know what I mean? And uh, actually, one funny story that I that um, just when you mentioned that popped into my head was we were in Philadelphia and um, we were doing. Um, house show there and that was when we were doing the brood and um went out and did our match and we came back and gangrel couldn't find his watch he's like man i can't find my watch and then owen walked by and said dave do you know what time it is and he said no i can't i can't find my watch so then um like three or four months later whenever we came back to philadelphia went out had our match we came back his watch was sitting in the exact same place that was three months earlier when he left. So he's like, what, what's going on here? And Owen walked past again, Dave, do you know what time it is? <laughs> so he kept, you know, he kept his watch for like three or four months and then put it back in the exact same place I think at the, I the same arena, you know. <laughs> you were, so it was wow. funny. Oh, man. This is from um, Kathy and Tara. They had a whole bunch of questions. You know, when when you and Edge were on, or you, you today and Edge Wednesday, we, we never, I just want you to know this, we never get any phone calls from women. We get uh-huh. almost no emails from women. Okay. The only the only person before you guys that I remember ever getting emails from women, like were more than maybe say one or two, mm-hmm. was Bret Hart. And then like when then we had like a ton of them, and we have a ton of them again today. But anyway, so you should take that as a compliment, I guess. Oh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite moments from uh, Grand Prix wrestling? Grand Prix. Oh. Ah, man. Um. <laughs> I had a lot of fun out there. It was actually my first experience where we worked seven nights a week. We worked every night and sometimes twice on Sundays. So actually it was a really good experience, and um, I got a lot of ring time and got in really good ring shape that summer. So it was um, – I thought the whole experience as a whole was good for me because I really got to learn what it was like to work in a territory. And um, – it was good, and uh, you know, the last month of the tour, we got to work um, with Don Callis and Rick Martel in the main events every night, and that was a lot of fun. So, and also uh, because we're actually running low on time, um, it's like, uh, what was the most embarrassing moment for you in your career? Hmm. 
most embarrassing moment. Well, it, made, it might have been like my third or fourth match, and I was wrestling. There's this stuff that you can, you know, a lot of guys put on um, oil to get a shine on their body. Well, there was this stuff called hot stuff, and it was supposed to make you more vascular, you know, supposed to make your veins pop out and stuff like that, but it looks like oil. And um, I didn't realize when I sprayed it on that, you know, you know, it's got a really strong smell to it, and if you really smell it, it can make your eyes water and everything like that. So I had this on, and I was out there wrestling the guy, and the guy got it on his hands, and he raked my eyes, and my eyes were swollen shut about a minute into the match. So I ended up doing this 15, 20-minute match, and I didn't see anything, so it was like just a horrible match, and, you know, I couldn't open my eyes for like a day. <laughs> so that was, oh pretty, that was pretty embarrassing. That was probably the most embarrassing moment of my career. Oh, my God. <laughs> anyway. Well, we, we're, we're out of time this hour, and uh, I want to thank you very much for doing the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It was great. Oh, it was great, and uh, good luck uh, good luck uh, coming up on the next pay-per-view. And thank just, you. Uh, you know, keep injury-free and keep, uh, you know, keep, keep putting together those entertaining matches because you're doing a great – you guys are doing a great job. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me on. Uh, let's get Eddie Guerrero on real quick, we gotta, and then we're going to head to a break because we're running, out of, running on commercial time. Eddie, how are you doing today? Fine. How are you? Um, I'm doing pretty good. I guess to start, um, we've gotten some reports on your match with Dean Malenko last night. Uh, were you okay with the finish as far as, or, or did you get, you get shake it up a little? No, I got shaken up a little. Uh, how do you feel? I feel all right. Still a little woozy, but, you know, uh, well, what? not 100%. Uh, what exactly, well, what just exactly happened? Because I was shooting through the frag diner, uh, his head hit my head at simultaneously. As the back of my head hit the mat, so... It was kind of a double shot in one, you know. It wasn't done on purpose, but, you know, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's... Yeah, I was more just upset that me and Dean, you know, we usually give great matches, and that was just a so-so match for us, you know. Uh -huh. Well, you've had, a, you've had a, a lot of chances to have some, some good matches with a lot of... Uh... A lot of good young wrestlers in the company. Yeah, and it just hasn't been happening. Maybe I'm losing my touch or something. I don't know. Oh no, I, I think that uh, I think that you've been doing you did real well. Like uh, match for that Matt Hardy last week was real good. No, I uh, could have been a lot better. No, I'm just you know that sometimes 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 I I notice that the best wrestlers are the are their worst critics, and the and sometimes I've also noticed that the worst wrestlers are. I think that they have the best matches. <laughs> <laughs> you ever, you ever I haven't heard that one in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I've, no, I've noticed that, like guys that, that really aren't that good are, are always like talking about how great they are, and then like someone like you or Chris Benoit, like you know, almost you know, will always like down and play the, the quality of your own matches, and you're like probably the top guys in the country right now. Uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I think the run that. The top of the game, the guys that are the top of the game right now, and this is from a shoot point right now, I'll be honest, is Hunter Hearst Houndsley. Man, that guy has impressed me so much. Well, he's got Jericho, I thought, was phenomenal. And, and Chris Benoit and Jericho has improved immensely. Oh, my God. Uh, those guys, they, you know, they, they if anything, they're going to make me work hard in the gym again. Because, you know, I've been real timid because of my arm. And I really haven't been at my 100%. At least I don't feel I have. And just watching those guys work and perform and give the matches that they're giving and, you know, uh, entertain the people the way they're entertaining them. I mean, you cannot help, uh, help but help. You have uh, the utmost respect for them. I mean, they're just, they're awesome. They're, they're good people. I, th I thought I thought the match with Helmsley and Jericho on Monday was just phenomenal. Wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, I when Chris came, Chris, you know, me and Chris, we we get along good, you know. Uh, and when he came down, all I did, I couldn't stop complimenting him because, you know, uh, I know Hunter, you know, he's the leader out there, and that's what gives me. He's to me, he's the Ric Flair of the '90s. I'm sorry, the 2000s, right? The new millennium. Uh, he just, he, he can have a match with anybody. And, and the thing that I was impressed about Jericho was Jericho was right there for everything. He had great charisma, great timing. You know, he, he wasn't slow. He never backed off of anything. 
he was there. I mean, Jericho, Jericho's got it going, man. He really does. He's put the whole package together in the last year or so. so yeah, he has. He, he's kicking ass. And, and Benoit, not because he's my friend, but Benoit, man, what a talent. You know, oh, yeah. he, he's producing. They're, they're, it, it, it's kind of like a challenge. It's kind of like they're testing him every week. And every week they test him, he's coming through. You know? And, I, I mean, how can you not admire guys like that? You know? I want to read this one for Brian. Uh, it's also for me. Uh-oh. It's from Scott Shapiro in Orlando. No, no, it's nothing to worry about. It says, I work out at the same gym as Rena Miro, World's Gym in Oviedo, OV- Florida. Miro uh, uh, Sable, right? Yes, yeah. Sable. And he goes, and I can honestly tell you that Rena Miro cannot come close to squatting 405 pounds. <laughs> he goes, she's stronger than the average woman on the street. But I'm he just, I'm 5'11", 200, and I can barely squat 405, and and uh, Rena Mero is probably not able to do more than 250, which is actually a hell of a squat. I'm but, thinking about uh, the 225 bench, though. What? She meant 225. Really? That's more mm-hmm. than I bench. As opposed to 225 <laughs> pounds. No, 225s. She was doing benches with 225s with dumbbells, right? Is that what you're yeah, telling one me? One in each hand. That's more yeah, than well, I bench. That's not 225s is not more than you bench. <laughs> Hey, man, I'm a weakling. <laughs> no, there was an article in Muscle and Fitness that just came out where it said that uh, Rena Merrow can bench press 225 and squat 405, and I was rather skeptical of those numbers. Well, if you believe that, then you believe that uh, pigs can fly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Rena because she's a sweetheart and she's a very nice person, and I love Mark Merrill. He's a good guy. But, you know, the, I think uh, the magazine sometimes tends uh Exaggerate a little bit sometimes, you know. And in that case, quite a bit. Anyway, <laughs> we're in a. If you ever wrestled European? Uh, no, I haven't. But watching Dave and 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 people such as Pit Finley, and and also, uh, you know, uh, God, who was the other one? Uh, uh, uh who was it? Stephen Regal's partner? What was his Chris name? Chris Adams. Pit uh, Finley, Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor, yes. Dave Taylor, uh, the phenomenal wrestlers, phenomenal wrestlers, all of them. You know, they just never got their due due credit. You know. You know, in you know a lot of, a lot of people sort of know your background in that your your older brothers were were pro wrestlers. Your father was a, a legendary pro wrestler in Mexico. At, at what age? Um, I mean, you 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 started professional wrestling. What about eighteen, nineteen? In nineteen. Nineteen. Yeah. At what age did you? Uh, gravitate towards wrestling, and was it something you always knew you were going to do, or you know, just you know because of the family? Dave, uh, one thing that I admire about my dad is that he never uh, he never pushed wrestling on us. He let us play other sports, and he never uh, insisted on wrestling. You know, he let that be a choice of our own. But when we did decide to wrestle, he man, he was a perfectionist. You know. And basically, we were representing him, his name out there. And at that time, you know, being the world heavyweight champion and, and you, you know, the junior heavyweight and the name that he carried, well, you know, he was harsh on us. So, you know, there was a lot of pressure there when we did decide to carry on the, the, the wrestling tra- tradition. You know, the doors were open, but at the same time, it was hard to live up to the name. So it was kind of like, to, it was a it was a plus but a negative at the same time, and like you know, getting back to your question, growing up, my dad never pushed wrestling on us. He, we played all sports: football, basketball, baseball. But you know, you you watch your father growing up wrestling and your older brothers, and you know you get out on the road with him and you live that lifestyle and and you live it and you see you you just learn to love it. And and that's what I've always wanted to do. You know, I can speak for myself, and I know that Chavo Jr., you know, was the same way. I mean, he's three years younger than me. He's basically like my younger brother. You know, technically, he's my nephew, but he's my younger brother, you know, like in real life. And that's all we dreamed. I mean, I remember wrestling. Everybody had jungle gyms in the backyard. We had a wrestling ring. And I remember we used to wrestle. We used to make up, you know, scenarios and wrestle cage matches. And, I mean, we even had, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, ketchup, 
packages of ketchup, you know, oh, for, and, for blood. and we would put it on our forehead and pretend we were bleeding and stuff. I mean, our game, you know, was wrestling. I mean, we we lived and we we our game we lived and played wrestling. So I guess maybe that's why it comes natural to us in the ring. And maybe that's why we're so we're so uh, hard on ourselves when it comes to wrestling. When somebody thinks, "God, that's a good match," and we say to ourselves, "You know, that was a shitty match," mm-hmm. because we know what we can produce out there. You know, now, I, you, I guess that's where it comes from. You know. Yeah, now you would have been, you know, because uh, Chavo, uh, your 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 older brother, is uh, what would he be um, about? Uh, what age? He's 19, nineteen years he's... older than me. Yeah. And, yeah. and and he was uh, in Los Angeles and Japan and in, and in many places, yeah. Mexico as well. I mean, a lot a lot of newer fans, you know, and a lot there's so many people who have come on to wrestling in the last two three years, you know, and, and Chavo Guerrero, uh, you know, the father of, of the WCW Chavo Guerrero Jr. Right. Uh, his father, when when we were growing up, um, I mean, what, it was a phenomenal wrestler. Oh and, yes, and he, he was. I mean, he yeah. was the top of the game uh, when it came to junior heavyweight. Uh, Dave, I don't know if you know this, but he was one of the very few Mexican wrestlers. He's the only Mexican wrestler besides, I think, Mil Moscow that actually held a, t- a title in Japan. And he held it for not only, he held it for like three or four years. Oh, yeah, that international junior heavyweight. That's right. And, he, yeah. you know, he beat Fujinami for it. Uh, and then he switched companies with Baba. And then he held it there for like two years. You know, so he was, you know, my brother, Chavo, he accomplished a lot. He just never got the, the international recognition that I have had the opportunity of having because, you know, of the evolution of wrestling and stuff like that. But my brother, Chavo, accomplished a lot, just as my other brothers, Mondo and Hector. They accomplished a lot, too. They just, you know, they never had that national exposure that I've had the uh, pleasure of having, you know, the opportunity of having, you know. This, we've got a lot of emails and, and also got a full bank of calls. Um, this is first from Alan Blackstock in Blackpool, England, who wants to know, looking back, what, what would you consider your, your funnest time and the best time of your career? My funnest time? I think I had a lot of fun time with Art Bar. God rest his soul. Man, we had a great time. Because uh, we were just always having fun out there, you know. And, uh, you know, if I wasn't with my wife and my kids, I was living with him. Basically, he was my family. So, uh, you know, he he was like, believe it or not, when I first met him, I wanted to kick his ass. I couldn't stand <laughs> We could not, we, could, we couldn't see each other. And then Tonio, uh, Tonio Pena, I don't know why, he uh, tagged us up. Maybe he saw something. And, and like, the first couple months, I mean, we were basically at each other's throats. And then sooner or later, we just decided to uh, work together. And then, uh, I mean, the chemistry flowed. And then he was like a brother to me by the end of the second year. You know, I mean, literally like a brother. That's why when he passed away, it was so hard for me, you know. But that was my funnest time. And I'll be honest with you, I'm having fun again. I'm mm-hmm. having fun again now in WWF. This is a dream for me to be here because I never thought I could be in WWF because at the time I was growing up, it was a big man era. You know, you, you would never see a smaller wrestler out there. And now that the business has changed and people know that it's entertainment and it's about talent and they like to see, you know, good, good, solid wrestling out there, plus being entertained with storylines and stuff like that, um, you know, being able to do that in WWF, uh, which to me is probably, you know, the number one company in the world. And I'm not just saying that because I'm working there. But, uh, you know, to be able to do that is just a dream come true to me, and I'm having a lot of fun. I'm having fun in the dressing room, which I haven't had fun in like four years. You know, something I was going to a- ask you about is um, how was the comeback? You know, a couple of, what was it, a year? A year ago. Uh, a year and a half ago, you on New Year's Eve, you got in a really bad car accident, which right. from the injuries, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean, I, I, nobody ever said to me that, that you wouldn't be able to come back from it, but I heard those injuries, and knowing your style being high-flying, I was going like, you know, boy, this, you know, if the injuries don't heal, you know, like for, for a guy with your style, you know, well, a lot of injuries. You know, I'll that be can, honest with you, I was really scared. Uh, for the first two days, I didn't know if I was going to live because my, I had a lacerated liver. 
and I was bleeding. And even if they would have operated, they didn't know if the bleeding was going to stop. So thank God, you know, uh, the, the liver rejuvenates itself and it stopped bleeding. And then, uh, you know, I had reconstructive surgery done on my left ankle, my shin. Then it was like, well, we don't know if you're going to walk normal again. And it went from that to you're gonna, it's going to take you eight months to walk again. And then, and then uh, it's going to take you a year to wrestle again. Well, thank God, you know, within six months I was back in the ring. You know, and it was a big, heavy pressure to go out there and produce because you know the fans, you know, the fans don't understand that you're hurt. They don't understand, you know, what you've gone through and stuff like that. And your personal, uh, how do you say, problems or situations, you know, they want to be entertained. That's why they pay the ticket. So, yes, yeah, it was a, it was a heavy burden for me when I came back to go out there and try and produce the same kind of matches that I was producing before. When, when you when you first came back, I noticed uh, it, it was I mean, and I don't know um, how you would describe it. Um, your first match back, there were it would be like on and off, like like you would have one match where it was like technically wrestling wise, you were really good, but it seemed like you were subdued as far as um, you know, I, I don't I don't want to be careful. Yeah, I, I would say careful. Up. It's all right. I won't be offended. No, 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 no. But being careful, and then you would have matches where actually it was the other. It would be like you'd have a, a really good match, and then you would come back with a match where it was almost like you were being careful. And I almost got the sense that you know, you know nobody said anything, but the sense that you were hurting a lot worse, at least when you first came back, than you were letting on. Oh yeah, yeah. I was in a lot of pain when I first came back. Uh, I came back too early. I, I think the doctors told me not to come back that early. But I was really getting antsy at home. I should have waited at least another three months before I came back because my back wasn't completely healed. And I had still uh, scar tissue in my... I had broken my right hip socket, and that wasn't completely healed either. So, you know, I would come back in some matches, I would feel good, and some matches, you know, I was in a lot of pain, which I would favor. And that's kind of what's going on with me right now with my elbow i know i'm holding back a lot because I, I can feel it you know a lot of people say no you're doing good and but you know what i know inside my heart that i can do a lot better and i know that without wanting to i hold back i think it's a subconscious thing and really what i want to do is just get rid of the brace and start wrestling like i used to and just take my chances again you know, but I can't do that, you know, just not just yet. I, I, I think I, I need to wait maybe a couple more months before I uh, really get rid of the brace and, and go full bore because I am not, I'm not going full bore out there right now. You know, with between me and you, I'm, I'm going about 80%, 80 to 90. I am being careful out there. And the reason for that is you got to understand, you know, I got, I got a family to support. You know, if it was just me myself, I could care less about myself and go out there and just give it all for the fans. But I got to think about my two daughters and my wife that I got to support. And this is the way I support them is through wrestling. And so, you know, I do have to be smart in what I do out there. Was it a uh, decision by you to take the frog splash out, or did they tell you not to do it anymore? Or you know, beyond honest, waiting? yes, they did tell me not to do it. Uh, it, it wasn't my choice. If anything, I want to do it so bad because I know I can rock it again. If anything, I know I can get higher now with these ropes. I don't know if you've noticed, but like on those Frankensteiners, I've been getting my ass up there. You know, <laughs> and that's probably why I got hurt last time. But I mean, uh, I know I can really launch out there because the, the ropes and they really spring. They spring you up. And I know I could really get up there, and I'm I'm dying to do it again, and my confidence is back again. But uh, Vince just doesn't want me. He doesn't want to take that that risk, and I can respect his 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 uh, concern, you know, because uh, he just got me back, and he's got an investment in me, and I'm sure he doesn't want me sitting on the bench, you know. So I what guess I'll get myself general? a little stronger. And a little bit more confident, so he might let me go back to doing that again. Go ahead, Brian. What do you think about the rings in general? I mean, they're bigger. Uh, uh, the the, ring, the springier, ring is but bigger. I, I I like it because it, we can do more spots. The spots can be easier, but it is stiffer 
like you know, like the Ben, the power bombs that I take, like from Benoit and Dean and Perry Saturn. I'm not gonna lie to you, man. They crush me. Oh, man, do they crush me? Especially having three uh, compressed vertebrae in my back. You know, but you know, it, it's not that bad. It's not. It's not as stiff as people as it was before. But it is different than the WCW uh, ring. Um, but, but we're gonna we're gonna hit you a break. Before we go to the break, uh, do you know do you know um, Art Bar's younger brother Sean? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, so Sean? we had a couple of questions. Uh, Art Bar's got a younger brother who's actually going to Mexico as like uh, the new love machine, Sean Bar. So there's a no, couple I questions never, about you. He didn't have a younger brother. Yeah, in Oregon, yeah, I think it was I mean, you know, Jesse Art and Sean. Yeah, Sean, I know Jesse. Right? Yeah. Well, maybe he did, but uh, gosh, man. Yeah. I know about Jesse, but I didn't know him about Sean. Yeah, he wasn't in the business then, you know, and I think he just started refereeing, and he's... Oh, I'm okay, guessing... yeah, yeah, okay, now I remember, okay, yes, he Yeah, did. I think he's probably early 20s right now. Okay. Got a ton of emails and a bunch of phone calls as well for Eddie. Before we start, I got this from Scott Keith, who said, You've forgotten the funniest thing on the Hogan show last night. When Hogan was talking about his heel face, he said, With a straight face, that... Hollywood couldn't hold on to a title if his life depended on it, and he would always lose it after a few days. I guess that one-year title reign, 96 and 97, only counts as a few days. So anyway, I mean, I, I was just like kind of, okay, that's what Hogan said. The whole thing was whatever. Um, let's let's start hitting the... the worst, uh, uh, buy rate ever, huh? What, the one Sunday? Yeah. I haven't heard Sunday's buy rate yet. I heard it was um, the worst, even, even the worst. It may not necessarily be good. That's what I heard. I don't know how true it is. Uh, I, I mean, I, I haven't. I don't know. I, I haven't heard a number for that one, but uh, I was, boy, if in that's your true. your personal opinion, how was the pay per view? Not good. Um, Not good. No, no. Yeah, the, um, you know what? And and I know this is going to sound really ironic, but I feel for those guys because a lot of those guys are my friends, and I want to see them succeed. You know, especially my nephew. But those guys, I mean, they say they're going to turn things around. And they put up a front like they are turning things around. But it's basically the same thing, Dave. It's just it in a is. different way, you know. How, how can you do that? I mean, how can you do that to the boys? How can you do that to the business? If the business has given you so much, if the business has, has made you, I don't want to name a person, very particular name, but you know who I'm talking about. But if the business is giving you so much money, you know, and believe me, he did not make wrestling. There was a lot of people before him that wrestled and made a lot of money and that paved his way there. But if the business made so much money for you and your family and friends and friends around you, how can you be so greedy to to hurt other guys that are trying to make a living out of it. To hurt other guys that are trying to climb their way up uh, and keep other guys down. How can you do that? I mean, doesn't that, doesn't, is that, am I wrong by saying that? No. Because you know, if I'm wrong, please correct me. No. You know, the other thing is, is you, you know, you lived, you lived through it for like three, four years. I mean, you and, and, you know, I mean, I, I know, know, I know, I know, but, you know, I just, I, the way you think about it, Dave, I mean, Dave, this business has given him everything. Yeah. Not only him, a lot of other people up there. And instead of giving back, they want to take more, and they want to kill it. I th I think that it's, it's, a, it's, it's a game of manipulation that they want to play, and, you know, now that they have, you know, you, you know, like, it's like, they all went through, you know, no one, no one's making, for the most part, um, with a few exceptions, most of the guys now are making more money than, than anyone's ever made in, in, in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these guys that have been around for 20 years, they had, you know. You know, I will give him that. He did open the doors for that, and I thank yeah. him for that. And I will yeah. personally stand here and thank Paul Hogan for opening the doors and allowing me to have a better living for my family by him opening the doors. And, and, and doing that, but at the same time, now he's doing the complete opposite. Yeah, you know what well, I mean. I mean, well, even you, you know, uh, take yourself 
out of the picture and look at people who you know and then just like for for just throwing a name Chris Benoit since instead of we'll talk instead of talking about Eddie Guerrero we'll talk about Chris Benoit because we all know Chris Benoit and he was there for three four years and 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 we know what happened to him or, or, or even Jericho because for all they want to say about well Chris may not be a great interview so he's missing that piece it's like so Chris what? Jericho I mean, they're great wrestlers yeah, you know? they're great wrestlers. Okay, and, and the interview can come. It's just like, uh, all right, uh, Hulk Hogan's a great interviewer, but he can't wrestle worth a shit. Yeah. He couldn't even tie Chris Benoit's shoelaces. So tell me, how does that even out? Because he's a great interviewer that makes him better to make all the money. And Chris Benoit goes out there and busts his ass and does all the hard work, and he's a workhorse. You know, that way they can come out and do their interview. I mean, how does that make that fair? Well, I think I think part of it is is that is that if they were able to keep you or Chris Benoit or or even a Chris Jericho out of that top spot, they could wrestle each other kind of that easy style or easy. I don't want to say anything's easy. Easier style yeah. than you guys do, and 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 if they can maintain that the main event style is easier. Uh, without you know, with, without guys who are pushing them, you know, because you're not going to go in there and just yeah. lay down and just yeah. not do a match. Yeah. And 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 you know, because you're motivated to do your kind of match, and right. Benoit's very well, motivated. The thing to do... is, Dave, that that you, you got a Chris Benoit, okay, a Dean Malenko, uh, the uh, other people that can adjust to their style of wrestling. They don't have to do our style of wrestling. Our style of wrestling, see. That's what a lot of people don't understand, and you and you yourself are a witness, Dave. We can go out there and do any kind of style. If they want a Mexican style wrestling match, we'll give them a Mexican style wrestling match. If they want American style, we'll give them American. If they want Japanese, we'll give them Japanese. We can wrestle it all. That's what these guys don't understand. And by them blocking us, what they don't understand is that if they would have given us the opportunity to come up there and work with them, I think they would have prolonged their career because it creates more interest and it would have given them different people to work with instead of blocking us and keeping us down, you know, to where we don't even want to be there, to where we didn't even want to show up to work. I mean, I grew up in this business, Dave, I mean, loving it, living it, dreaming it, eating it, you know, doing the, uh, excuse my language, but shitting it. You know what I mean? And for me, uh, the only happiness that I had was when I was inside the ring. When I was inside the ring, see, nobody can take that away from me. No promoter, uh, no wrestler, nobody can take that away from me except God, because that's a God-given gift. You know, whether it be one minute or whether it be 20 minutes or an hour, you know, that's mine. Uh, but... Outside of the ring, it was a living hell. It became a living hell. Inside the dressing room, I mean, you didn't know whether to smile, whether to be happy and all that. And what they're, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to make it, you know, happy again, and they're trying to make it good again. But you tell me, you know, they did that for the first couple, I guess, maybe a month or two, and now they're making it into a ridiculous show. And that's my opinion, you know. I I mean, I I have liked a few of their shows. I've probably disliked more than I've liked. and But, I mean, I think one of the things that I miss, and Brian and I talk about this on almost every show, is that they rarely have a good wrestling match, and it's not because they don't have good wrestlers, because, Eddie, you know better than anyone. You, you know, took I mean, the words right out of my mouth. I mean, we could we could name 10, 12 guys that are really talented wrestlers there, but yes. they, never wrestle each, they never wrestle each other, and yes. if they do, it's ruined by a run-in in 90 seconds, so what does it matter? And right. I mean, they're trying to recreate what they had three years ago, but well, I don't see, think they're they not even doing that. They you know what they forgot? They forgot the fundamentals. What the, what the, what, what's it called? Wrestling. You still got to have some kind of wrestling in there, guys. I don't care how much of a show it becomes. You still got to have some wrestling in there. You know, you know, there's, there's one thing that that uh, everyone for, I don't want to say forgets because Steve, Steve Regal brought this up yesterday. Is that during that period when when WCW was was beating WWF in the ratings every Monday night, there was a formula there, and the NWO was part of the formula, and everyone Hulk Hogan was a big part of the formula, absolutely. Right. But they had great wrestling matches. I mean, Brian, you remember every Monday night? Every I mean, Monday I remember. Night, they had the Lucha match, or they just had Benoit every, and Eddie or Malenko. Just awesome I, I, matches. 
I can tell you, Monday night, I used to look forward to 5 o'clock. I mean, I was excited because Nitro was going to start, and there would be a little bit of everything for everyone. I mean, I could see Ultimate right. Dragon, and exactly. I could see Rey Mysterio Jr., Eddie Guerrero, Psychosis, and, the, the, you know, they, they, you get good wrestling. You got Ric Flair to do interviews. There's hey, a little bit of everything. You're right. They had a little bit of everything for everybody, right? And you're absolutely right. That's what made Nitro so good is that they gave a variety. And I think that's what WWF has now, a variety, you know. Vince had to go that way, you know. He had to get rid, he had to, uh, you know, he still has his big men, you know, and, and I know he still believes in that in certain ways, but he's also changed to the point that he knows he needs to have wrestling matches in there, you know, which is uh, where, where Chris Benoit comes in, uh, Dean Malenko, Perry Saturn. Uh, other good wrestlers like Bell Venus, good Chris Jericho, you know, I can go on and on, you know, and it's kind of switch roles, don't you think? Yeah, the other, the other thing is, is, that, is, is that there there really are not, you know, most of the guys in WWF right now are guys that you could have a match with, and then, the, you know, the other the few guys that aren't quite as good, you know, they know how to use them effectively, too, and they're not the dominant, they're not in the dominant position either. Mm-hmm. You know, they're just, you know, like if, if the Godfather, you know, the Godfather's ring entrance, so he does his ring entrance, and everyone goes up for it because it's it's part of the show, and they love that part of the show. Oh, yeah, he's great but, but at it's, what he does. Yeah, right, exactly, but it's not like, you know, they're not asking him to do what he can't do, and, you know, no one's, I mean, no one's stinking out the joints, if you know what I mean. Right, right. Yeah, we've got to hit the calls because we've got a, a full bank here, and we've been sure, banking into them. Let's, let's go to Hector in Texas. You're first up with Eddie. Yeah, Eddie, I'm from El Paso, uh, and I'm a big fan of yours. I wanted to know. I'm sorry, hey, just I was at the house for a little bit of talk to you. And I just wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about the reaction you got in that show? Uh, he's he, he, he was asking Cruces. about. Yeah, he was in Los Cruces at the show the other night. Oh, God. God, uh, it sent chills up my spine. I just wish I could have had more time, you know, to wrestle. Uh, God, how can I not be excited and thrilled about that reaction? You know, you go to your hometown, and they're chanting your name, even though you're you you may be a bad guy or or a good guy or whatever, and they're you're they're chanting your name. How can you not like it? You know, and especially being a hometown, you know, yeah, man, it, it was a great thrill for me. And another question is, and this is my last question. If you could bring a few guys from WCW uh, other than your cousin, who would you bring, you know, to the WWF? Who would I bring to WWF? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I know this sounds really bogus, but I would bring my, 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 my nephew, Chavo. <laughs> he he I mean, said besides Chavo. Uh, besides Chavo. I, would, I would bring Billy Kidman. Uh, I would bring Ray Ray, Ray Mysterio Jr. And uh, who else would I bring? Uh, got uh, a lot of respect for him. Um, I would like to see Kurt Henning back. You know, Kurt Henning, if they would give Kurt Henning the opportunity to go out and perform the way he can and has before, he was a hell of a performer. You know, so I would, you know, those are people that I admire, that I respect, that I would like to have friends of mine, Conan, you know, obviously. Uh, just a lot of people that I used to hang out with, you know. I think Hugh, Hugh Morris is a hell of a talent that's not being utilized like they should, you know. But, you know, who who am I to say that? You know, obviously I'm not the booker and and I'm a, I'm only a wrestler and and they're the ones that are the geniuses because if they if they weren't geniuses they weren't they wouldn't be making the money they're making. And they wouldn't be producing what they're producing, you know. Uh, oh, thanks, Eddie. Sure, yeah, you're welcome. Representing you Latino on El Paso. Thank Bye. you. Okay, um, real quick before we go to the next call, I've got this because it actually popped in my head, and we've gotten a couple of emails about this. Is ba the basic just is looking back. I mean, you again, we've talked about you know wrestling, you know main events in Mexico, a lot of great matches in Japan, uh, WCW, WWF. If you look back now, what are your your favorite wrestling matches that you had during your career? If it's like a series or or um, uh, a specific match or whatever. Uh, against Chris Benoit, I had some real good matches against Chris Benoit in Japan, and I had a couple of good ones here in the states with him. Also, Dean Malenko, uh, the Dean Malenko matches in ECW, 
and we had some good ones in WCW, and obviously the one with Ray Mysterio Jr. in Halloween Havoc. I think yeah, that was an awesome mask match. Title. Yeah, the mask match, yeah. Yeah, the mask it's, match. The, 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 the one that I always remember is the one in L.A. with you and Art Barr oh, against uh, Santo. Of Arcane. course, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that. But, I mean, that was that's the number one, man. I mean, how can you forget that? Santo and Octagon against me and Art for our hair. Jeez, what else do you want? And Art, Art just stole the show. He was a man. Art was a man. God rest his soul, but he was a man. You know, I, I have nothing. Uh, a lot of my success I owe to him. He, you know? do, do, do you, because I noticed some of your mannerisms and everything. Do you, you picked up a lot, uh, you know, a lot of his stuff. You know you what know? Art taught me, uh, Dave? Not to be shy. Not to be shy in front of the camera. Let it out. So, like, you know, you, you, you see that Latino heat, you know, a lot of people say I'm being stereotyped and stuff like that. Uh, believe me or not, you know, that's really a Chicano, you know. That's what I am, but basically is I, I don't have the accent. But you go to El Paso, where I grew up, a lot of guys talk like that, man, you know. We get that accent, you know, and it, it, it's not being stereotyped. I mean, that's what I am, and I'm portraying that just in a in a fun way. That's all I'm doing, you know, and uh, that comes from art. Art, I would have never been able to do that if I didn't tag team with art. Art, art brought, let, uh, you know, I was so serious about wrestling, and I believed in just, being straight out wrestler in the ring, I never believed in in how do you say portraying to the people and making it entertaining to the people until I saw art and you know I would look at him and I was going, God, why is he getting paid double more than I am and I'm busting my ass, you know, and he's making more money and people love him more than I do. Then I mean, then they do me. And it's just because he was just, he had charisma, and he knew how to make the people laugh, cry, uh, mad, and, and anything he wanted to do. And, you know, you know who else taught me a lot of that was Negro Casas. You know, just two great showmen that could go out there and wrestle and do it all. And if anything, you know, I owe a lot of my stuff to art. You know, not not that I have a lot of great stuff, you know, but I mean... What I do have, art, is a big part of it. Let's let's go to Western Virginia. Wes, you're next up with Eddie. Hi, guys. Uh, Eddie, I wanted to ask you earlier, you brought up a point about how, like, in the mid-'90s, it got more back into wrestling. What are some of the things you thought brought it back and away from kind of like the big, uh, I guess, steroided-up kind of guys that was in the mid-'90s? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, repeat yourself. He basically was going like what, you know, like it's it's gotten so much more, especially in WWF. Uh, there's more. It's a lot more wrestling oriented. Well, part, part, you know, I mean, I, okay. Part, well, just, let me ask you this question: uh, uh, How many times can you see somebody go out there and pose, yeah. and then <laughs> run and hit the rope and hit a tackle I, and not fall down? I don't, I don't know because I haven't been to a bodybuilding contest in years. <laughs> how many times can you see that? Yeah. And you saw that basically for ten years. I mean, in different ways, but that's what you saw, right or wrong. Yeah, well, it was with it was exception a, with an exception of few wrestlers. I'm not saying yeah. every wrestler was like that, but I would say 80 percent of them were. You know, and I think people got tired of seeing that, and people wanted to be see wrestling again. You know, maybe not the American grab a hold, you know, work it, you know, drop down tackle, get it again. You know, but I think more of the Japanese style that Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko brought, you know, uh, Jericho brought to the States, you know, where you get a little bit of everything, a little bit of flying, a little bit of mat wrestling, and a little bit of rocking and rolling, punch and kicking, suplexes, and stuff like that. Just a combination of everything, which entertains the people. And then you got your big men that come out there and kick ass. And then you got your guys that are great interviewers. Such as The Rock, uh, Ric Flair, you know, uh, people that can just turn it on on the mic, you know, and, and that's what wrestling is now. It's just a great around all around entertainment show. It's a it's a physical soap opera. That's what it is, really. 
you look at it. Anything else, Wes? Yeah, I want to ask the one more for Eddie. Uh, a couple years back in WCW, you and Chris Jericho got to be a tag team for a couple of weeks, and it really seemed like it was starting to get over in the rug. Oh, God, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. It's, it's like, this is like one of my pet peeves. <laughs> I just wonder what happened uh, with you two there. No, you know what happened? Um, they knew it was going to get over, so they <laughs> Now, that's the truth. God, honest truth. Do you guys? Do you guys remember? Or I mean, always here. Wes, West, I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know if you remember this or not, but um, this is this this actually wasn't with Eddie, but this was when Ray and Hooventude teamed up about two times on television. Sure. And, and, and it started getting over. Uh, I, really, I, I just remember writing this like I go, these guys have so much charisma, Ray and Hooventude, as a team together, that I know that by writing this, I'm never going to see them to team yeah. again. <laughs> and and, and I, actually, actually, believe it or not, I think they're supposed to team up Monday, but really? up until Monday, they never teamed again. <laughs> <laughs> was yeah, like, oh. you, you know what? Uh, when when you got something good, you scare the guys on top. And when you scare the guys on top, they're the first ones that are gonna go out and have an egg. And if, if I ever get a chance to tag team with Jericho, I know we'd be a good tag team. You know, uh, I think it'd be kind of. I, I cannot compare Jericho to Art because there's only one Art bar. But I know me and Jericho can create our own different style of tag team. You know, that would entertain the people. You know, but uh, Jericho's so over with the people now that they love him, you know. And me, I'm kind of like what you call a tweener. They love China, but they don't like me. You know, they still want to hate me. They still want to see me as a bad guy. And I believe that a lot of people think, what the heck is China, you know, this awesome-looking woman, you know, doing with a dweeb like Eddie Guerrero. <laughs> and I think there's a mixed emotions, and I think that's that's where I'm stuck right now. You know, I we, think we, that if if I were to get one solid direction, either uh, uh, I think I'm a better heel than I am a babyface. But I, I I think that if they would just let me go heel 100 percent and do my thing, that I could really rock and roll. Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia. Here's today's question. And what a coincidence this is. Ooh, who knew this, what the conversation was going to be like today? When Hulk Hogan was WWF champion, I think it was actually the last time he was WWF champion, he, he was said uh, on a tour that the WWF belt was like a Christmas tree ornament in compared to a real world championship belt or a certain belt. Which belt was he referring to? Those of you who were around uh, in 1993 will probably remember there was actually a bit of controversy about this at that time. So anyway, uh, that's today's question. Uh, before we get back to Eddie Guerrero, this is actually from Chris Hussein, who says, uh, actually has a question also, but uh, it, says, it says, the a &E interview opened my eyes so much about Hulk Hogan. I think we should we, we all come down too hard on the guy like they said we do. What we as fans should do is give him a parade at least once a month, just like they did in the interview. Uh, I was thinking back to the whole Hulk Hogan deal, and I was thinking, if I were Hulk Hogan, why would I even want to face the same guys for like three years in a row? I know, there's like well, so much... so boring? Oh, here's another match with Savage. I've had 45 in the last year. Yeah, but they, you know... I mean, you know, you know what, part of, what part of it is, 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 um... Hogan and Savage drew big money in the past, and, 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 in any, and even in recent years. And it's oh, one of yeah, those things yeah. where... Where, where Hogan thinks in his mind, it's like, I can always go back to Savage. I can always go back to Piper. I can always go back to Flair because those are money matches. And he, he respects those guys because they were money players. And the other guys, you know, he can always go in there and say, well, they've never proven in this country to be money players. But the point is, as we all know, is that unless you're put in the position to be in that, unless you're put in that position, you can't be in that position. And it's 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 like it's a weird catch-22. I understand that part. I mean, it's just like... Having to have the same matches though. Well, I don't know. Maybe we should get him on the show and, and ask him. Could we do um, that? I want, I want to ask one real quick question before we get to the calls. The car, the love machine, does that have anything to do with Art Bar or is it just like a, the Latino using the term love machine for, well, for the car? Both. It was both. both. You know, uh, it was there, so I used it. And I always want to have art in, 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 my, in my life in one way or another. And, uh, you know, if I can throw that in, you know, uh, you know, why not? You know, it fit the bill, too, so 
you know, yes, it, it was both, you know. It was there, and it was done for him, too. Okay. Let's let's go to Matt in San Francisco. Matt, you're up with Eddie Guerrero. Hey, guys. How's it going? Hey, Matt. How are you? How are you? All righty. Uh, just a quick comment for you, Dave. I am so glad you brought Zach Arnold on board. Okay, that guy um, is it when it comes to Japanese reporting. Is he, is he something I don't know? I mean, I, I mean, I've I've been emailing Zach Arnold back and forth, but I don't know how the, the you know all the negotiations with the the website have gone. Well, he was on the website today. Oh, that's awesome! There's an update. Nobody, Brian. Nobody ever tells me anything. Come on, Chico, <laughs> get it together, buddy. <laughs> but do you know this, Brian? I think or you do because I saw him there. Nobody ever tells me anything. Oh my God. Okay. Well, that's cool. <laughs> anything <laughs> involving the website that Dave does not know about, you should not be shocked about. I, I don't know anything. No one tells me anything. I, I don't know. I, I have this feeling I have this Yahoo chat at 6 just because it's in, the, in my bones that it's Wednesday and no one said a word, so it must be true. Oh, you do, I think. I got one. Hey, that was pretty good. I got a plug-in for that. But no, I... <laughs> Dave, well, yeah. now, that, now that you have Zach on the roster, what do you think about having him phone in, you know, a couple days a week for the show? Uh, that's not a bad idea. That's, that's, that's a real good idea. Yeah, we should we should get him on and talk about Japanese wrestling, especially, you know, this week. God, no, you know, with everything that went on down there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one question for you, Eddie. What are your feelings about Conan, Bob Barnett, and Vampiro? Uh, what are my feelings about Conan? Who? Bob, Bob Barnett and Barnett. Bob Barnett and Vampiro. Okay. Uh, Bob Barnett. Who's that? That's he may not Vampiro's know Bob. Boy. Bob's a Bob's like he's he's Vampiro's business manager. He's oh, okay. uh, you, you, you've probably met him in Los Angeles. I'm, uh, I'm sure. Conan, you have. Conan's never done anything bad to me. Conan's always been great. Every time, uh, you know, we've all, we've been together basically everywhere we go to, and uh, you know, we've all we, we've had some personal issues, but we've always been able to iron them out man to man, and that's what I respect about Conan. Conan. And what I respect about a lot about Conan is that he takes care of the boys, the Mexican boys. He always tries and does the best for them. Unfortunately, he, he can never accomplish what he wants to with them, you know, because of the situation. But Conan, inside, he is really a great guy. You know, uh, you know, obviously he's a businessman first and foremost, and will always take care of himself just like any other businessman will. But Conan is a he he is a class act. Uh, I agree. Vamp, Vamp, uh, I, personally as a as a as a friend, I love him. He's a nice guy. But as a business guy, as a businessman, uh, I wouldn't trust him. As far as I could throw him. And that's a shoot. I'm sorry, I love the guy, but business wise, he's, he's very different. All right, well, you know, I think a lot of people are like that. And, you know, he's not the only one that's like that. So I'm sure he's just looking out for himself. But I, I've just, I've dealt with too many uh, situations with him to where he's not straight up with me. And I, and he's, he's uh, God bless him. I don't want to talk bad about nobody. God bless him. You know, I just, I just, you know, he's a good guy. He's a good friend. I just don't trust him business way. And Bob Barnett, I don't know enough about Bob Barnett to say anything bad or negative. And even if I did, I wouldn't want to, you know. That's none of my business, and, and uh, you know, I got nothing to do with them, so I'd rather just stay out of that subject. Anything else, Matt? Yeah, uh, question for you, Dave. Why okay. is it that WCW will not let any of their boys on your show? You you have to ask them that question. I mean, for a while there, I, I, I think... You know, there's, there's. When I was at the, the the Pillman show, not all that long ago, a couple of the guys asked to do it, and Vampiro actually did the show, and and Paige wanted to do it that night. Um, but I think that, you know, you have to ask them. I mean, it's. I, I don't know that it's an outright ban. We actually have a, we actually have a couple of guys lined up, but I'm, you know, I don't. I cross my fingers that they're going to be on. So, um, you know, I mean, it's it's the same thing. It's like, you know, I. You know, but you know, I mean, since I was told that nobody would be on, you know, that we had Candido on, we had Mysterio on, so it's like, I don't know what, I really don't know what the what the what the deal it is. It just seems like whatever the day is too. 
Yeah, because guys have been called up and said, you know, you cannot do the show. And then two days later, another guy from the company is on, and no one called them up and told them they couldn't do the show. So I don't... I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know what the situation is. I mean, obviously, there have been guys who have been told, and, you know, Hooventude was, you know, I, well, I've been wanting Hooventude on the show since the first day we did the show, just to give him a Hoobie chance Juice. to talk. Yeah, Hoobie Juice. And, you know, for for various reasons, you know, mainly because he was living in Mexico, it was hard to pull it off. And then finally we got it arranged, and then that day, you know, they called up and said he couldn't do it. And uh, it was kind of disappointing, yeah. you know. But, um you know, as far as an answer as to why you gotta you gotta ask them. I don't know. Hmm. Wow. Do you do you have a lineup for you know the next couple of weeks? Um, I mean, I know like uh, I know next week uh, we've got Cornette on Monday. <laughs> I know we got wow. Kurt Angle. We got Kurt, we got Kurt Angle tomorrow. We got um, Jerry Lynn Tuesday. I can I can give you the uh, the rundown, what, what, guys. Al, Al, why don't you run down everybody? It's uh, Kurt Angle tomorrow. Then we've got uh, Frank Shamrock is on Friday. Uh, next week is Jim Cornette on Monday. Jerry Lynn Tuesday. Uh, Mike Mooneyham on Wednesday. Uh, Thursday Thursday's uh, going to be an archive because we'll be uh, en route to the Louisville Gardens because Friday we'll be uh, broadcasting live from there for the Jim Cornette show. And then uh, Monday the 26th is Lenny Lane. Oh, really? And then tentatively for Thursday and Friday of that week, the 29th and 30th, it's uh, Shannon Moore and Gene Kaninsky. Hmm. That Lane interview is going to be very interesting. So I hear, because I, 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 uh, I heard that he was on uh, WCW Live, and they got rid of him, like, really quick. That's what I was told. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, that's, so, I don't know. Uh, just... One more question for you there, Eddie. Sure. Uh, what, what are your feelings about Crash Holly? Crash Holly? Yeah, Mike. Uh, in what way? Um, in the locker room. Crash Holly? I think he's, just, he's a great guy, man. <laughs> he's fun to be around. He is a character, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, he is. He's fun. You know, every guy I've met in in WWF has been great. They've treated not just myself, but uh, all of us with respect. I speak about Perry, uh, Malenko, and Benoit with respect. Uh they all give us a lot, a lot of respect, and uh, they're just great guys, you know. They really are. So, yep. you know, be honest with you, I'm, I'm happy again. I really am. I really am happy again. Okay, not not being able to predict the future. What was it like? I mean, and the reason I ask is because, you know, you've got kids at home, you're married, and you had a, a, a really well-paying, guaranteed job with WCW, even though as you could, you know, you were miserable a lot of the time. But but still, I mean, it was a a, a lot of money. It was great income, and it was yes, guaranteed. It was. And what was it like? Was it easy for you to leave? I mean, when 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 the time came and we and I mean, made the decision, I, I was, or was it a really hard choice? No, it wasn't a hard choice. It was really easy. Um, okay. I'll be honest with you. I never expected it to happen because I had tried so hard before. And never, they would never let us go. Uh, Eric would never let me go. You know, uh, Eric, we had had our spats before, but Eric, believe it or not, is a really good guy. And, uh, you know, Eric is like, I'm a lot like Eric. We live our emotion. We show our emotion. And the thing with Eric, you know, I'll always be grateful to him is that, when I had my car accident, I had not signed my my uh, contract yet, and he still sent me that contract, and he took care of me, and I will be grateful to him for the rest of my life for that. And if he if he was still there at WCW when that thing happened, I would have never left, just out of loyalty to him because of what he did for me. But then again. I'm sure if he was there, he would have never allowed the situation to get out of hand the way it did with all of us, you know. Because Eric knew he he wasn't using us to our potential, but he knew what he had in us, you know. He, he's not dumb. <laughs> he knew what he had in us. And I'm not saying that Bill Bush is dumb. He's, it's not that he wasn't... Uh, he's not, he, Bill Bush is he's a money man. He was there for to, you know, to economical reasons. He really didn't know what was going on as far as wrestling is concerned. And he had other people in his ear telling him what to do and he was listening to that, you know. 
But, you know, for people that don't think we didn't make an impact, I mean, look at it this way. And I'm not, Dave, please correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm not trying to boast or nothing. You know, you, you guys know me. I'm the last guy that will boast. If anything, I believe in being humble because, you know, you know, I'm a Christian or, and, and, and I believe in that. But, uh, when we left, you know, the ratings in WWF, I mean, we drew an 8.1 when it was that, that poor tag team match, even though I yeah, wasn't the ten, wrestling. The, the, ten, the, the 10 man tag team, like yeah, that. You know, and, and we did draw a lot of attention. And not only that, things got switched around in WCW to where guys, that never had opportunities before got their opportunity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So by us leaving, we did create some, I, I guess, some kind of wave, you know. Um, how was, uh, this, this is from Sam Nord here, who goes, uh, with all your wrestling talent, did you ever think you'd achieve your greatest fame simply by showing your personality after especially after never being, like, you know, labeled as, like, uh, the best interview in wrestling? And how is it working with China? It's, it goes, it looks like you two are having a lot of fun out there doing the gimmick. I'm sorry, repeat yourself. Uh, uh, like, um, the people say I wasn't a good interviewer and stuff Well, like that. just, no, what we said was, with all of your wrestling talent, did you ever think you'd achieve your greatest fame simply by showing your personality? Uh, particularly because you were never, like, labeled, like, you know, the world's best interviewer. And then I, was how never, was I was never, I never had a chance to do my personality. And when they when they did give me an interview, it was like, okay, what do I talk about? Oh, whatever you want. <laughs> well, uh, give me an idea, you know. They never gave me direction. Very few times that they gave me direction. And and when they did give me direction, if I didn't do it the way they wanted me to, they would get hot at me. You know, I mean, the only time I think I really did do some good interviews was when I was working against Chavo, and that's because I was having fun with it. And uh, I think I'm doing some decent interviews and having some fun with China, uh, you know. So uh, I'm not saying that I'm a good interviewer because I'm not. I got a lot to learn as far as interviewing and 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 speaking on the mic. I mean, I'm the first one to admit that. But if anything, I want to learn and get better at it. But uh, to answer your question, Dave, yeah, I was never given the chance, period, over and out. We also have a couple of winners of the trivia question. Oliver Postlewaite of Ottawa and Wes Vance of Kentucky. Uh, the question, Brian, you know the answer to that question? IWGP title. You got it right. That's really That's good. two posters in a row for me. That's right. Uh, we also got a couple of emails, a couple, a couple of notes. On the uh, King of the Ring main event, this was actually said at the, on SmackDown, but we did not bring it up at the, at the, on the show. Uh, the stipulations are that if Undertaker, Rock, and Kane win the match on the 25th, that the one who scores the pinfall will get the title shot at the July pay-per-view. If Vince, Shane, and Helmsley win, the winner of the King of the Ring tournament will get the title shot on the pay-per-view. Hmm. Helmsley, how about Helmsley against Jericho, Rock against Undertaker? How's that? Wow. Okay. Ideas? And I, just ideas. Uh, there's something else in here. Uh, I've got to ask Eddie this in just a second. Also, um, I, I think we have not mentioned this, but it is official that Sikosa, Silver King, Dandy, the Vianos, and La Parca were all given their release by World Championship yeah. Wrestling. When did yeah. this happen? Uh, I guess it was officially today. I had heard about it this morning. That's ridiculous. Yeah. See, that's Isn't it, though? About. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. You got. Tell me which one of those guys is not a good talent. Of those guys? Oh God, those guys are all those guys are all good talents. Especially, I mean, I mean, you, you know, what was amazing to since, me was since um, the beginning. Since they got there, all they did was just use them, you know. Yeah. And they weren't even given a chance. So that, Eddie, that just goes to show you the politics over there. Eddie, did you ever see the match with the Viano, uh, t the Viano three in um, Atlantis from? Uh, no, but I heard it was phenomenal. I mean, it was it's so funny because I'm like watching this match and it, it's probably the, the best match i've seen all year certainly in the top two or three wow and i'm and i'm watching this and i'm going like you know his, his two younger brothers that wrestle in wcw um i mean i think viano four is maybe better than three i don't know you've wrestled them all so you would have a better opinion but i'm just thinking like those guys and and i know saying that there's there's a whole roster of guys who can do this how can we never see it 
I know, man. I I don't want to start raising the issues here. Uh, but you know, hey, it's a good old boy network. Yeah. Take 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 it for what it's worth uh, when I say that. <clears throat> this is a question uh, um, that I was going to that I was going to ask you this way, okay? Yeah. I was there four and a half years. I asked them to do things with me as far as the Latino market. <clears throat> when I when when they did the LWO, and I went to El Paso and California and Chicago and where there's a big Latino uh, Hispanic population. They had no LWO shirts, okay? I had people asking me left and right. I asked for interviews for Latin, to do Latino stuff, you know, because, you know, just stuff in Texas and, and California and just stuff just to help out the company, not just for myself, you know? Four years, I never did that. I mean, I've been here four months. I've been in the cover of Raw Magazine. You know what I mean? All of us. The first month, I think it was. Uh, we were there four years. We never get that. I've already done a uh, an interview with TV Guide Latino. I've already done an interview with People Magazine Latino. It just goes to show you the difference of quality of uh, professionalism. And uh, I don't want to bring up or, like I said, raise any issues, but, you know, uh, I don't think uh, the color of your skin or, or or the type of ethnic background you come from is an issue here in this company that I'm working for, which is WWF, to where it might be over there. You know, How's merchandising going? Huh? How's merchandising going as far as, like, T-shirts and that sort of thing? Uh, we're getting on that. Uh, the only thing is uh, just that my shirt should be uh, – we came out with those radical shirts. you got to remember that when we came in, uh, we came in at a spur of the moment. So, like, the radical shirts and all that, it took – you know, they rushed that. But, like, other people that come in, you know, they come in with, like, four or five months knowing ahead of time, so they get a chance to prepare for all of that. So when they do come in, they, they're they set. When we came in, we weren't set for that. And the, the, what, we're, what, they, what I respect about them is, like, every shirt, they don't just get a shirt and throw it out there. They they go through, like, 18 people, and and everybody gives their opinion on it, and... They want to see what's going to be best as far as the sales is concerned, as far as the character is concerned, as far as where Vince wants to go with your character and stuff like that. And that's what I admire. So, you know, the, I think that's what's going on right now with our merchandising. Uh, not just speaking for myself, I'm speaking for, you know, the Chris, Dean, uh, Perry, and myself, is that our characters really haven't been established. I have a character uh, but it's really not established if you think about it. You don't know whether I'm a baby face or a heel yet. You know, really, if you think about it. You know, you'll have people cheering for China, and then the next minute they're yelling, Eddie sucks, Eddie sucks. And then the next minute, uh, uh, you know, she'll come up and knock the heck out of the guy, and I'll pin him, and they're all cheering for both of us. I mean, it's really weird, but at least we're getting a reaction, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of what's going on. Uh, Chris Benoit obviously is working his ass off. Uh, he's producing, and man, what great matches is he having. I have nothing but the utmost respect for him. Perry, you know, Perry, they still don't know where they're going with him. I think Dean, they, they got an idea now for him, and it's just a matter of bringing it out. You know, so really... You know, we came in there, uh, how do you say, we came in there knowing that we had been let go from over there and really kind of like, you know, the the, the storyline was like, we need a job, please give us a job, <laughs> you know, and now that we do have our jobs, they don't know where they're going with us really. I think they have an idea, but it's just not established completely 
Ted, did, did I make sense? <laughs> you, yeah. you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave. We, 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 we got we got to rush through these callers because we've got a full bank and we're going to get through okay, as soon ahead. as we can. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Let's, let's, let's go in on callers. Just ask, like, uh, maybe one or two real quick questions because we're trying to get through as many as possible. John in Tampa, you're next up. Hey, what's up, Eddie? Hey, what's going on? I just want to ask, who's your favorite person to work in the ring with? Uh, Chris Benoit. Chris Benoit? Yep. Uh, I got some advice for you, too. You said you needed to improve your interview skills, right? Yeah. You should um, get some old Cactus Jack tapes from ECW. <laughs> uh, old Cactus what? Old Cactus, cactus Jack, Jack tapes from ECW. Those are some interviews right there. All right, you're on. I'll do that. <laughs> All right, for the See advice. In WWF, too. <laughs> Mick Foley interviews. Oh my God, the guy's... Remember, do you remember the interview he did right before uh, the, the match where he retired, or even though he came back? I thought it was one of the best interviews I ever heard. Oh, he's, he's incredible, isn't he? Yeah, the Fantastic. one on Smack, the SmackDown interview. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's go to Jamie in, in Alabama. Hi, Eddie. How you doing? Fine, Jamie. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I know you've been in WWF that long, but um, who uh, who has been your idol since you've been growing uh, when you were like in training and wrestling? Who are you? Want to be like, or who inspired you as you were training? Who was my idol when I was training? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I always just admired my dad. Uh, not, I know the people aren't smart to my dad, but I saw a lot of my dad's old tapes. I admired hey, my one dad. More question. I admired oh. my brother Chavo a lot. Uh, obviously, my brothers, but my brother oh, Chavo. Who, really who had would you like to uh, wrestle me. or feud with? And uh, Ric Flair, believe it or not. I love it. I love his psychology. I've always liked his psychology. And Jamie, anything else? Uh, um, that's it. I appreciate it, Eddie. Good luck in the future. Thank you. Did you? Were you? You know, since you brought up Ric Flair, were you disappointed that you never had a chance to do like any kind of a a program with Ric Flair? Or, you well, know, I you did know? at the beginning, you know, but the, they never followed it through. I had a couple matches. I think I had like three or four matches, and I had some decent matches with them. I just wish that I could have kept on working with him. I mean, the man, the man can still go. He's phenomenal. I know people say he's old and all that, and a lot of people say once you've seen him, you've uh, once or twice you've seen it all. But believe it or not, uh, you know when you when he wants to go and turn it on, he can have one hell of a match. He really can, and and a different style of match. You know, he can he can get anybody. And go out there and have a match. That's what he can do. That's what I admire about him. He can have a match with anybody. With Vince Russo and with David Flair. With David Flair while handcuffed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll leave that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, that one Ricardo. Was pretty and... bad, uh, but that wasn't his fault. No, uh, he he had a match with Vince Russo that was was I would call a miracle. Uh, I mean, I, it wasn't like a great you. It wasn't a great match, but it was with Vince Russo. I mean, what do you you know? Yeah. It was a miracle. Uh, know, let's go to for Vince, you know, he's trying to do the best he can. Yeah. Know. Let's go to Ricardo in New York. Yes. Ricar Hi, Dave. Hi, Hi Brian. Hi, uh, Mr. Guerrero. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, just a quick uh, question, a quick question, and and, and a comment. Uh, the question is, uh, could you tell us? Maybe you talked about this already. Uh, what is the difference between the uh, the, the WCW backstage? Uh, 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 environment uh, compared to the WWF backstage environment. And Eddie, I just, uh, I'm gonna hang up, uh, so I just wanna tell you something in Spanish. Uh, usted es el mejor y no deje que nadie le diga lo contrario, señor. Gracias, amable. <laughs> uh, to answer your question real quick, uh, sure. it's the same thing. Uh, backstage, the environment is fun and everybody's on the same team in mm -hmm. WWF. And in WCW, everybody tore themselves. Not not everybody, but the, I would say the top players are for themselves. And it's basically a, a, a den of a, a den of snakes. All right. Yeah. Okay, Eddie. Before we go, um, as far as the, the character that you now play, and there's been criticism of the character. Uh -huh. um, what's your thoughts as far as? Um, you know, how much of that was, was your decision? How much of that was, was their suggestion? And how far? That was my decision. I just think it, it's, a, it's an entertaining character. I think it's kind of like a, like a Cheech and Chong character. Yeah. A wrestling Cheech and Chong. That's what I'm trying to do, really. And if people, people love Cheech, you know. 
So I just think it's entertaining. I mean, what do you guys want? You guys want to be entertaining, right? Now, as far as wrestling, you guys know I can wrestle. You know, I just want to be entertaining in a way that I can entertain outside of the ring. You know what I mean? And I've had that privilege of doing it with uh, with uh, China. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of people may be mad or say I'm being stereotyped. But how can you say that when, when you got guys doing, like, Godfather, I mean, doing the pimp, you know, pimping gimmick, and and you got, you know, all kinds of other stuff that I don't want to mention that are even more stereotyped than that, you know? It's just, all I'm doing is being one of the guys of the neighborhood that I grew up in. So, you know, stereotyping, no, I'm just being myself, that's all. You know, being one of the, being one of my homies that I grew up with, really, that's what I'm doing. I just want to ask you, um, what were your thoughts? Because we got a few emails about this one. It's regarding Kurt Angle, because I mean, here's a guy who, you know, probably two years in the business. If you know, we've talked about this many times Phenomenal. on the show. I've I've seen so f- very Phenomenal. few guys in my life with that little experience take to this business the way he has. Phenomenal. That's all I can say. Phenomenal. I would love to work and angle them. I've worked a couple matches with them. I think they've been pretty good. Uh, I know that if I were to get some more chances with him, I know we could have some hellacious matches because uh, we just get that. You know, you know there's certain wrestlers you gel with, and uh, I feel that I have a good gel with him. Um, that is pretty much. We're running low on time. Eddie, I want to thank you very much, Brian. Anything quick for for Eddie before we got to go? When do we get the Eddie Guerrero's My Favorite Wrestler T-shirt? All right, everybody's been telling me that, and I'm gonna go ahead and come out with that. But I gotta do it in, in my character, so I gotta think of something a little different. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Guerrero's My Favorite Wrestler, as long as Mamacita's on the side. <laughs> what, uh, I got, what, what, you know, as far as like, I, I, was, there, was there any reservations as far as like, you know, like like your real life as far as like uh, the China thing, or was it just like to you, it's like this is just part of the entertainment act and it's no big deal? No, of anything, I uh, before I did anything, I talked to my wife about it, <laughs> and uh, she, uh, uh, the good thing it was Joni, uh, China was so professional. She's such a professional. And she's a, such a sweet girl that she even talked to my wife personally and, uh, you know, made sure, you know, gave her confidence and, and made sure that everything was going to be cool, you know. So thank God for that. And I'm so, happy working with her. She's, she's, she's great. She tries hard. She's always, you know, she's a constant professional. That's all I, I, I can say nothing bad about her because... She tries so hard, and she's always there. Okay, we are totally out of time. I want to thank you very much, Eddie, for doing the show, and I want to remind everyone that tomorrow we're going to have Kurt Angle on, so it should be quite an interesting show as well. So it's been a hell of a week here on Wrestling Observer Live, and we'll see you tomorrow at 6. How you doing? I'm doing really good, doing really good. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, thanks. It's great to be on the show. Yeah, we've had, we have a ton of email questions for you. Um, you know, one of the things... With with you, as long as uh, we've been watching wrestling, there's only been about a handful of guys that I think anyone has ever seen pick up wrestling so quickly. And I mean, do, what do you? And, and most of them, as I started thinking of the names before the show, because I was thinking of uh, Jumbo Saru and Junakiyama in Japan, Owen Hart uh, was was quick, picked it up like really really quick. But that's almost deserves an asterisk because you know he was he probably started doing it when he was 14, but just didn't turn pro until he was older. Right. Um, and you know. But a lot of the names that that would be like that, like natural, you know, guys who come in and, like, just pick it up, a lot of them were good amateurs. And I read a quote from you once where you thought that the amateur background was not necessarily a help. Or, or do you think it was? No, I, I to some extent it can be uh, to an aggressive approach. But uh, um, the way you're taught in a, a professional wrestling school uh, breaks every law that you are learn, that you are taught when you're an amateur wrestler. So it's hard to break that law, but if you take the, pro- the approach of everything you learned, do the opposite, then you're going to do just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was the thing I did. I, I became a lot more passive. Instead of going in there and thinking I was going to kick everyone's butt, I let people kick my butt until I learned. And doing that, I picked up on it pretty quickly. I mean, it depends 
You know, a lot of people have a great work ethic. So I have an outstanding work ethic, and uh, I pick up things very quickly because I always want to learn. I'm always willing to learn. Even, you know, even now I learn a thousand things every day in this this uh, sports entertainment industry that, uh, you know, it, it amazes me. And that's uh, I've always had an open mind, and that's why I'm always trying to better myself every time I go out there. How did the uh, WWF approach you about uh, becoming a pro wrestler? And what did you think about it? Well, the WWF approached me in 1996, and at that point I wasn't quite ready to um, to get into sports entertainment, only because a lot of people were um, against it that uh, were pretty much my peers. And uh, they just felt that it was the wrong direction for me being an Olympic gold medalist. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't understand the sports entertainment aspect, that it's, you know, if anything, it's uh, basically someone that is an aspiring actor or is an actor that also does highly athletic things and what better form of entertainment than that that that's what i wanted to do i just didn't know i wanted to do it at that point in time so i turned them down and i started to watch wrestling which i never did until 1998 and when i started watching it that was the late summer early fall of 1998 i realized how good of athletes these guys were and uh, i called vince mcmahon and said hey i'd like to come up and try out and he gave me the tryout now, what, were there any specific guys when you're talking about this where you did, that like stood out to you as you started watching it? Yeah, I think uh, obviously the, the the top guy stood out dramatically. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, just because he was so aggressive, and he reminded me a lot of myself as an amateur wrestler, and uh, I was always considered a very aggressive wrestler that never let my opponents breathe, and. Uh, so I caught to him quickly, but then when I started to watch, I started to uh, take a liking to The Rock. Uh, I liked the way he approached everything, not just as an athlete, but everything else. I think that he has the gift. He's probably one of the most gifted guys out there in sports entertainment, if not the most gifted. And I started watching him, and I, I thought, you know what? I want to watch how this guy improves how quickly what he does and i kept a close eye on him and now here i am facing him <laughs> you know every other week so it's uh, kind of ironic but um you know i learned a lot from him and now i continue to learn from him because i get to work with him one of the things when you were when you worked in when you were in memphis you did the classic 1970s baby face character sure. and then you came when you came to the wwf it was almost a diametric opposite uh -huh. um I mean, what was there? Who 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 came up with the idea of being? Well, you know, your character sort of based on being a 1970s babyface, right. but in an obnoxious way. I mean, who came up with that character for you? Uh, Vince McMahon and the creative department came up with it because, you know, when I did the interviews up in in uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, at my camps. I always came off as like a sportscaster kind of guy. I always had a smile on my face, almost uh, too, too quote unquote cheesy, you know. And uh, so I think Vince started watching the tapes, and he said, "Wow, this guy, this guy is something because he really is a, an Olympic gold medalist, and he really is uh, basically a goody two shoe, you know, and to a certain extent." So what he did is he took Kurt Angle and my ethics and the way I live and he turned it up 10,000 notches and now I'm shoving them down people's throats and, and trying to preach to people how I live my life and you know the three eyes quote unquote and uh, you know always telling them facts about different things about wrestlers or cities saying it's true and uh, so that's how I came up with that quote but I think what he did is he just saw a lot in me and he basically turned it up a thousand times and made it, created the character Kurt Angle, uh, the, the real athlete or the most celebrated real athlete in the WWF. Did he come up with the three eyes too? Yes, he did. He said that uh, he looked at me and, he, and that's what he saw. Saw a man of intensity, integrity, and intelligence. And, uh, and then he, he ran with it. And anything he told me to do, I did. And it seemed like everything worked out that way. So I'd have to say Vince McMahon really knows what he's doing. If he didn't, uh, he wouldn't be where he is today, but he definitely led me in the right direction. You know, one thing that I had heard about you that I wasn't aware of was um, when you were competing in, in, in college wrestling and you won the NCAA championships as a heavyweight, I think one of the shows Jim Ross actually brought it up, but I'd never heard the story, that you weighed 196. You weighed, you weighed 196 and won the heavyweight championship? 199, the lightest heavyweight ever uh, in NCAA history. 
Is there any reason why you went in at 199 and didn't go down to like the 190s? Because you know most of the guys. Most <laughs> you know of the why? guys. Because I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, that year heavyweight was a much more competitive weight class too. But uh, you know, I started out the year at 222, and if you've ever been in amateur wrestling practice, you'll you'll realize uh, how quickly you can lose weight, especially if. Uh, if your appetite isn't up and uh, and you're stressing out, getting toward the end of the year, you start to lose. You know, the guys in the upper weight start to lose 10 to 15 pounds of weight that they normally don't want to lose. A lot of guys will come into the NCAA's on weight, and usually they're lo- cutting 10 or 15 pounds for to prepare for a tournament. That's just stress coming into the NCAA's, and that's what happened to me. So I found myself the last day. Of course, I went through the tournament. I think I was 203, then I was 201 the next day, and then I was 199 the last day, and I just couldn't believe it. It amazed me. I was under 200 pounds. But to be able to win the NCAA's, especially wrestling guys like um, – Sylvester Turke, who the WWF signed this year, uh, he's a big guy. He's about 6'7", 330. And uh, he, was quite, he was quite an impressive wrestler. And to beat guys like him uh, really amazed myself. So, um, you know, I owe a lot to my coaches and, and just the way I approached the game. And that was that I worked harder than anybody else and I prepared more. And that's all I am in sports entertainment. And that's probably why I'm improving pretty quickly here. But, um, you know, I just don't want to slow it down. I want to continue to do that. And didn't you suffer, like, a broken neck during the uh, Olympic final? Well, what happened was uh, at the U.S. Open right before the Olympics, about three and a half months before the Olympic Games, I got thrown directly on my head. And uh, so I I finished that match where I barely won, and then I had to wrestle in the finals that night, and I couldn't do anything in the finals. It was basically a push-and-shove match where I just tried to uh, be more aggressive. I was just basically pushing the guy around the mat digging underhooks so that the ref would call him for stalling and uh, I barely won that 0-0 referee's decision so I went home and I couldn't do anything what happened is I broke my neck and uh, and I also uh, herniated two discs in my neck and uh, the doctor said I wouldn't wrestle anymore so I went to get a second opinion uh, because I still had the Olympic trials in the Olympics and I knew that was the last two tournaments that I'd ever wrestle in if I could win them so I went to another doctor. He denied it, and then I went to a third, and he gave me permission as long as I showed improvement over the next two months. But we weren't seeing any improvement, so what he did was uh, he would go to my practices, and he would shoot Novocaine into each side of my neck, and he would um, basically watch me wrestle and make sure I didn't do anything stupid, and I'd go half speed just to see how it would feel. And, uh, I, you know, I don't condone that for anyone to have to shoot Novocaine into your neck, but cortisone was illegal at that point, at the, you know, before the Olympic Games. So here I am uh, shooting Novocaine in my neck just so I could wrestle. And I did that throughout the trials, and I end up winning the trials. But, uh, uh, you know, if I could do it all over again, I probably would do the same thing. But it's just that when you get to that point, that level, uh, you don't want to give it up. And, you know, if it were any other level, if it was college level or high school level, I would have quit right there. But this was my last shot, and I wanted to make sure I went out a winner. So here I was doing that stuff, and and uh, I ended up winning the Olympic Games that way, which is kind of ironic. Now, did you, did you, when did you make a decision that, you know, you were wrestling through 1996 and only through 1996? Because, you know, a lot of guys, you know, I mean, there, there are some guys in their, in their mid 30s. In fact, sure. I saw, there was, I think, isn't there, isn't there a guy who's trying to make a comeback? Um, oh, yeah. I, re- I retired at, at one of the youngest ages that anyone, uh, I was 26. So, you know, I, I still had two more Olympic games in me if I really wanted to do it, but that's not what I wanted to do. I'm, I am where I want to be, and that's uh, in the WWF. I just didn't realize it then. Um, you know, I, 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 it's really hard as an Olympic wrestler, any world-class athlete, you know, you only get one opportunity every four years to make an impact worldwide. And, uh, of course, you have the world championships in between, but you hardly hear about them. And so, you know, it was really important to me, all that pressure, it's a lot different than being in a professional sport because you can, you know, you can have a bad week and come back the next week and and sh- show that you're, you know, a, a great athlete or you end up losing a game and winning a game. At the Olympics, you have one shot and that's it. So um, I knew I wanted to do it then, and once I won, that's when I realized I would retire. Until the referee raised my hand in the finals and I became Olympic champion, uh, if that did not happen, if I would have played second or lower, I would have been wrestling still in the 2000. Olympic Games. 
you know, you were talking about going into that, that Olympic trials. At 220, as I recall, there are a couple of names that, that a lot of listeners would know, and one name that I don't think that they they would know that we're all in that trials with. You were in there with uh, what uh, Mark Coleman, Mark Hurd, Dan Shade. Oh, yeah. You know, so... Uh, we had I one mean, of the I, toughest weight classes, no doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, going in there with, like, uh, a neck injury, I mean, those were... Was was the, was the trials any hard? What which was, which was harder, the trials and the, or the Olympics? Uh, you know what? That's a hard question because um, at 220 pounds worldwide, it's one of the most competitive weight classes. Normally, 220 pounds na- nationally is probably you know fifth or sixth most competitive. But at that particular time in 1996, it was one of the top weight classes because we had a lot of studs in there. You know, if you watch the Ultimate Fighting or anything like that, you see Mark Coleman and Mark Kerr uh, completely. Dominant. Dominating, and uh, we had a lot of guys like that. Dan Shade, uh, he was an outstanding wrestler. Uh, he was a three-time Olympic alternate. The guy had some bad luck because three Olympics in a row, he ended up second. Uh, you had guys like young guys like Kerry McCoy, and and uh, you know just upcoming superstars that you're going to see in the future. So um, it was a really tough weight class. Uh, Kirk Trost was a world. Uh, medalist, and uh, so I had to prepare for every single one of those guys. But I, I have to say, when Russia broke up uh, in 1992, you didn't only have one Russian in your weight class at the Olympics; you had 16 of them because they all went to different countries and, and represented different countries. And that's the toughest nation in the world for wrestling, except especially for the upper weights, because Russians are normally big people. And uh, so I don't know which one would be tougher. Uh, I think because I wrestle the Americans all the time. Time, it would be a lot harder to make the team because they know my style a lot more than the foreign, you know, the foreign competition. But that's probably the only reason why it'd be tougher. Uh, what do you think about? Uh, do you follow amateur? And what do you think about Brock Lesnar and uh, Brock Lesnar signing with the WWF? I think Brock can bring a lot to the table. I, I really don't know how he's going to produce in the WWF. Uh, he has a great look. I heard he's a phenomenal athlete. So I think he could have a big future. But you know as well as I do, you can't just be a good athlete. There's a lot of that you have to bring to the table to be a success in the WWF. Uh, all I can say is we'll sit and see how he produces. If he can produce like his buddy uh, Shelton Benjamin in Louisville, then we have a winner. Uh, I heard Shelton's doing an outstanding job down there, and you'll probably see him sooner than later. And uh, I think Brock Lesnar has a lot of potential, but that's up to him, and I hope that he makes the right decisions uh, to make it happen because I'd love to work with a guy here in the WWF. How is it, you know, whether it be uh, for for an, an amateur wrestling superstar or an ultimate fight competitor, or someone who's used to uh, being in, in, in an environment where, you know, you know, like on the ego, where, um, you know, how is it to give up the ego in the fact that, like, you know, you work sure. so hard not to lose, and then all of a sudden some guys coming up. To, I mean, you know, because some guys mentally can't handle being okay. Tonight you lose. Right. And other guys, you know, I think can just look at it and just go, it's it's entertainment, and it's not it's not really even an aspect right. of it. Well, you know what? That's where you that's where you split reality from fantasy. And I'm not going to lie to you. There are guys in the WWF that really think they're their character, and you know that's that's a problem. The thing is, uh, you know, I am my character, but. Hey, that's okay. What I found out in the WWF is the guys that were the best athletes, we're talking at a, a you know college level, Olympic level, professional level, they're the guys that have, have worked as a team with other people and, and have that team concept. They seem like they're the guys that are willing to accept taking the loss a lot more. And that's what uh, I don't understand because a lot of people would be upset with losing uh, me, on the other hand, I really don't care. As long as I put on a great performance, that's all I care about. And it's just kind of funny to see some of the guys that um, that actually, you know, they, they they don't they're not they don't want to accept a loss, especially if they lose um, fair and square. You know, if there wasn't a cheat involved or somebody doing a run in or or a distraction, and it just amazes me that um, anybody would be like that. But I do have to say, in the most part, the WWF, the guys there working together, uh, have been really good. I just heard some rumors in the past where it's, you know, it's kind of hard to understand that you know these guys can't separate that, and it, it amazes me. Uh, Did you ever think about doing no holds barred fighting back before you got in the WWF? The Ultimate Fighting? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've been approached many times by The Ultimate Fighting. Uh, if I were to do something like that, I would not be living in Pittsburgh. I probably would have moved down to uh, 
uh, San Diego, California to train with Kenny Shamrock. And uh, Kenny was trying to recruit me for a long time. Uh, that's one thing about the ultimate fighting. I would never go in there with just amateur wrestling skills. I don't think... And, you know, very few people have been able to pull it off where they can win the ultimate fighting just on amateur wrestling alone. I think uh, Danny Severn might have done it once. Uh, Mark, Mark Coleman has done it before he started to uh, open up his uh, repertoire of technique. You know, that's the one thing about Ken Shamrock and what makes him so effective is he is so well-rounded at all disciplines. And that's the way I would take the approach, too, if I were to do it. And I'd have to go to a school like Kenny Shamrock's. Uh, let's let's start get, taking some phone calls. We'll start with Rob in Connecticut. You're first up with Kurt Angle. Hey, Kurt. Hey, Dave. Hey, how, how you, doing? you doing? I just had a quick, uh, two quick questions for Kurt. Are you uh, surprised or like amazed on um, uh, how fast your character is caught on with the fans? Am I surprised on how fast the character is caught on? Is yeah, that, with is the that heat that you get. Um, yeah, I, I really am. I, I thought it would take a lot more time. I know I've worked my butt off to, to make it happen, but um, I also know that the fans here in the WWF, uh, they're not the easiest fans to fool. I mean, you have to have real um, talent to uh, for them to appreciate it. And I remember Jim Ross, when I joined, I was asking him. I didn't really understand the business at the time. I said, hey, Jim, how long is it going to take me to get on TV? A month, two months? He said, Kurt, you'll go on TV when you're ready. And I swear, the year, it took me a year, but I swear it felt like five years. And I'm glad that he waited, because if I would have went on any sooner, I might have made a fool out of myself. And, uh, you know, for an Olympic champion uh, athlete to go into the WWF and make a fool out of himself, and I've seen guys do it, and I'm not going to say any names, but, uh, you know, <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> you don't want that to happen, because the fans aren't forgiving. And uh, and if, if you're in that situation, it'll be hard as heck to bail yourself out. So I'm glad they took their time with me. I have one more question. Um, with uh, you crossing the uh, handshaking line with Stephanie on Monday, is that going to lead to anything with you and Triple H down the road? I believe so. I think something's going to happen. Um, I think it's going to be a point where she's going to have to choose. And uh, that's not that might just be me talking, but um, I, I think the fans can expect something like that to happen in the future. And uh, uh, I think it's just the direction they want to go with my character. You know, it's, it's, I'm at a point now where I've done so much as this one-dimensional, I don't want to say one-dimensional, but... Um, you know, you always want to change, and you always want to come up with different directions. And I think they they're starting to come up with another direction for me. And I I expect big things at King of the Ring, and a lot of bigger things afterwards. So I think uh, we're all in the uh, you know we're all thinking the same thing. And and Vince McMahon has done nothing but great things for me, and I expect any nothing less than that in the future. So I'm pretty excited about it. All right, thanks, Locker. Thank you. Right. Promo to you, right? Wait, go, go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. Brian. How much of the um, intros do you write your speeches before your match? Uh, who helps me write them? Yeah. And how, uh, how much do you do yourself also? Um, you know what? I'd say it's a, it's a little bit of everybody. Vince McMahon definitely comes up with some good stuff. I have a writer there, Brian. Uh, I can't even remember his last name, but him and I, believe it or not, Brian's a very good friend of mine. I can't even remember his last name, but I know him as Brian. Uh, he comes up with a lot of great ideas, a lot of great concepts, and we sit down and I throw in my two cents worth and then we both go to Vince McMahon and Vince uh, finalizes it. And Vince always changes it around just a little bit to make it more effective. So uh, it's kind of a team thing, but you, you want to be involved in, the, in what you're going to say because you're saying it. Uh, if you let someone else write everything, uh, you're not going to be completely comfortable with what you're saying. And uh, I think that's really important is to stay highly involved in, in your character and portraying your character and trying to evolve that character. And that's what I try to do. I'm always, I call Brian on the week, during the week to find out uh, what could possibly happen the next week so I have something in my mind that I'd like to say. So uh, I'd say it's a team thing, but Vince McMahon definitely has a big impact on that. I, before we before we go on, I just got this email that I had to read. Uh, this has nothing to do with Kurt Angle, but it says, "Did you?" I guess last night on Thunder, and I missed this, Brian. It said there was a sign in the front row that said, "Blur this sign, WCW." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see oh that. my god! What did it say? Blur, because because a lot of times on WCW, especially on the taped shows, oh, they uh, digitize. 
they digitize a lot of signs because I, either they either they got bad language or they have messages that they don't want on television. So there's a sign that goes, blur this sign that you see. And they didn't blur it. <laughs> they didn't blur it. <laughs> oh, right. man. That is great. Now, when when, when who uh, who came up with this, the concepts as far as like some of the stuff like uh, when you did that stuff at uh, the college with the I think it was the Penn State for the abstinence and uh -huh. and that type, that that aspect of the gimmick. Brian and Vince uh, both together came up with that, and I'm not sure what they want to do with that. I think it, it had to do with my character being so clean cut, and really, if you, if you watch my matches and the things I do, uh, I'm not always such a clean cut guy. I mean, I'll win any way I can, so here I am, I'm preaching one way, and sometimes I'll go the other. So, you know, my character's unpredictable in one way, but um, he threw in the abstinence because... You know, athletes, let's face it, we were, we were always told all our lives to, to not, you know, to stay abstinent or don't have sex before your events. So what they did is they blew that up too and said, okay, this guy's never had sex. That's why he won the Olympics. Okay, that's why he won two belts in the WWF because he will not have sex. And so, you know, that, that's what we're doing. We're basically making fun of athletes from the past, uh, having this concept that, that sex is bad and, you know, women weaken legs, if you remember Rocky. So, um. I remember that story. Uh, when, so, when, you, when, you, when, when you were in college, by the way, when you were in college, did you actually get that from coaches and stuff? Because I remember when I was always, in college. Always. When I was in, when I was in college, you know, one of my I, we, had, I, I, we had a very good wrestling team, and uh, one of my good friends was going to the NCAA tournament. And I mean, the coaches banned him from seeing his girlfriend before right, that tournament. Right. You know, it's all theory, and it, it cracks me <laughs> up because it's so untrue. But uh, <laughs> but um, you know, that, that's what we were doing. We we're basically making fun of athletes for for being like that. And and now here I am. I, I did it one time, and we had to run with it because it was so funny. So I, I'm I'm the man of three eyes and a big A. <laughs> and uh, now, now, who knows now, where I'm going to go next? You never know. A year from now, I'll probably be in a bar drinking with Bradshaw, and you know, <laughs> just saying the three eyes suck. <laughs> I love. I, you know what? I, you know, one, one skit that I loved was uh, um, it was when uh, you were trying to get back. I think it was at the Acolytes, and you went to the boss man, and the boss man started talking about you know that angle of the big show. I dragged his daddy and all this, and then you just like kind of looked at him, and go, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was like in shock. Like this guy is crazy. Yeah, you know what? I have a lot of fun doing the vignettes. I think that's my best work, and it's because Brian and I come up with some great concepts where where we make my character seem so off the wall. Where you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll even do like a normal vignette, and at the end I'll say something completely out of the blue that means nothing, and it's just like, wow, this guy is a complete idiot. But um. <laughs> You know, like the other night, I was talking to uh, Edge and Christian, and I basically said, "Hey, if if we if we uh, win this match tonight, we had like a six man tag." I said, if "We win this match tonight. There's no doubt in my mind." And they're like, "Yeah, yeah." And I said, "We will win uh, the honor of you know we'll, we will defend the honor, of Stephanie McMahon Helmsley." And they were like, "So what?" I said, <laughs> and maybe. She'll be in a good enough mood to give you guys another tag team shot. So they got all excited, and we we're getting ready to walk away. And I said, you know, I, I beat Bradshaw last week. You know, just out of nowhere, because <laughs> it's so important for me to win. No matter if I get my butt kicked or not, as long as I win, you know, that's all that matters. Like when I got choked out against Taz at the pay-per-view, I, you know, I, I woke up. I said, did I win or did I lose? That's my first thing. It's not that I get my ass kicked or, you know, it's, and they said it was a, he choked me. I said, that's illegal. I won, right? And it's like I got embarrassed on TV, but as long as I won, that's all that mattered. And it's funny because that's how athletes really are. <laughs> I, got, I, got a, I got a question. You, you, now, you have a couple of, uh, you, have, you have like a brother and like a nephew that were in the NCAAs in the last couple of years? Yeah. Who, who actually, are the family my members? Nephew. He's a three-time okay. All-American. He went to Clarion, and he was ranked first in the nation his last two years. But uh, his junior year, he lost in the semifinals against the guy he beat at the All-Star match. He got caught behind, and he tried to catch up. He ended up third that year, and uh, it was very upsetting to him. And then this year, he hurt his knee about three weeks before the Nationals. And he went out there and just did his best and ended up fourth. So he had some bad luck, but uh, he, he is a much better wrestler than I ever was. Uh, I just uh, stayed healthy. Uh, I, I was a, a little bit better of an athlete, you know, as a natural athlete. But as a wrestler, he had all the tools. And uh, it's a shame not to see someone like him win a national title. Is he interested in pro? And also, what is the reaction that you've gotten now that you're actually a pro wrestling? It's in, in, instead of just going into pro wrestling uh, when you first started, but now that you're pretty much of a success in pro wrestling, what are 
What's the reaction of some of the guys that you competed against? Are they like a lot? Are they a lot more? You know, like uh, they see it a lot easier now than maybe when you first started. And it was some Definitely. people might have thought you were selling out or whatever the term would be. Definitely, I think a lot of people were a little bit upset, but after watching me on TV and getting to know what it's all about, uh, because I didn't understand it at the beginning either. Um, they're happy for me, and they're happy that here I am. Whether I say I'm a wrestler or not, people know I won the Olympics in amateur wrestling. I'm promoting my sport every single time I go out there. And you know amateur wrestling uh, does not get much exposure. So me being in there really helps our sport, whether people like it or not. That's just the way it is. If some pro football player comes in and does uh, uh, and does something for the WWF or the other federation, obviously he's given his football league exposure and that's that's what i'm doing to wrestling and hopefully uh if you notice we're starting to sign a lot of amateur wrestlers so i think they they thought you know we caught on big with kurt angle let's see if we can get a couple more shooters in here um get it get it get the ball rolling that has a lot to do with jerry briscoe because he was a former amateur wrestler and he loves amateur wrestlers so we're you might see a lot more in the future and and uh, you know anybody that's aspiring to be a pro wrestler amateur wrestling is definitely a way to go uh if you want to learn just the pro wrestling tactics uh you know you don't want to be an amateur wrestler but you know it, it really shows you how to protect yourself in many ways and i think that's really important is uh when you come into the wwe or any other federation, if you're an amateur wrestler, these guys, for one, won't take advantage of you because they know that you can protect yourself. And uh, they also know that you're going to be a pretty damn tough guy. And as long as you pick it up and and you do what you're told, uh, you're going to have a lot of respect. And uh, and that's what the guys, I've been really nice to the guys, and the guys have been nice to me, and I've gotten a lot of respect throughout the federation. I think it's because of my accomplishments in my particular sport. Do you think that, that, as far as, like, from the mental approach, that amateur wrestling may have been real beneficial in as far as, like, in that, in that, you know, to be an amateur wrestler at the level that you were, mm-hmm. you've got to be exceedingly mentally tough. And, yeah. you know, like, you know, and not a crybaby and not, you know, you know, you know, or else, you know, you're just not going to make it to that level. And in pro, it's, it's, it's a good trait to have because you're, you know, you're traveling to 18, 20 cities a month. Sure. It's, it can be real hard if you let it be. I mean, it is real hard. You know what? It is hard, but it's not a problem to me because you're right. I did a lot of traveling. I traveled 10 months a year, amateur wrestling, trained eight hours every single day. So I know what it feels like to to be like this, you know, where it's long, grueling, exhausting schedule. And uh, I enjoy it. I've always enjoyed that. As long as I'm working hard and I'm keeping myself busy, uh, that's when I'm happiest. And, uh, you know, so I do owe a lot to amateur wrestling. The reason why I'm... Uh, doing so well in professional wrestling definitely has to do with my mental approach and my mental and physical toughness. You're, there's no doubt about that, and wrestling gave me that, amateur wrestling, no doubt. We'll start with Adam in Brooklyn. Oh, hey, Kurt. I'm a big fan. I have uh, two questions for you. Sure. One's easy and one's a little bit harder. Um, I was looking at WrestleWire.com, and they had some, like, you know, King of the Ring, uh, whoever, you know, who's in it. I was wondering, um, who are you facing in the next round, if you know? Um, I don't have any idea. I think right now, are we in the final 16? Yeah. That's what we were just we were doing that yesterday. I think so. <laughs> I don't even know. Heck, I'd be Bradshaw, though. Do you know that? <laughs> after, tonight, after tonight's SmackDown, it goes. it's the final eight. So everyone who survived, so, so we're really in the final eight right now. Okay, so basically, Kurt Angle got a bye last round and didn't know it. <laughs> Wait, what happened? What happened? What happened? No, you, you beat Bradshaw. I beat Bradshaw in the first round. Okay. And I haven't wrestled since. Oh, well, you should probably wrestle at some point. <laughs> I, I wrestled in a six-man tag, and then I, uh, let's see, after that, I wrestled. I had, a, I had a stack of people sending me stuff where he had it all figured out, and then I threw it away. <laughs> I, I don't know who I wrestled. I, I, I might I, have wrestled uh, somebody. Hey, I think bra- I know what's going on here. We need bracketing real bad. Well, tonight's show is the last two matches of the round of 32. And then on Heat, the first two matches of the round of 16 start. Right. Okay, that makes right, right, right. Okay, okay. That's right. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we would, we'd be in, in the final... Right, okay, it's the final eight matches, but it's the final 16 okay, that starts... Okay, so we're still in the 16, right? Right, and the, and the matches that start this coming Sunday that were taped on Tuesday would be the first matches of the round of with, of the of the round of sixteen. Okay. Okay, so I will have a match uh, this Monday for the sixteen. I'm not sure against two, but um, I do know that uh, you know as the rounds uh, get later and later, you're going to see a lot of surprises. Okay. 
And, and I have I think, uh, this uh, is my hardest question. You're not going to see the typical oh, um, format or, or the final four that you would normally see, and I think that's going to be really interesting. You'll like it. Hmm. I can promise you that. I just don't know who yet. I'm not going to tell you who, but I can promise you you'll, you'll like it. Okay, okay this is my uh, harder question. I was wondering, like, you went to uh, ECW in 1996, like, inquiring about work, or I read that someplace. And he, I, he, was at a, he was at a show doing, like, a commentating appearance. Yeah, and I, yeah, it was uh, when, uh, I don't know, it was like Taz match, I think. But I was wondering what happened there, because I heard it was something about the crucifixion angle they did with Sandman and Raven. And what oh, was the whole yeah. deal about that? Well, actually, um, you know, of course, the ECW is a little more hardcore, and I went to the event. Uh, they were basically promoting it as a more legitimate form of wrestling. Basically, what they told me, and this, this was in, I think, late 90, 96, maybe early 97, they, they told me that it was more my kind of wrestling. Okay, they didn't tell me what it was. I never watched pro wrestling, so you, so you have to understand, when I got there, I was a little bit surprised. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I watched the first match, I was like, oh, my God. So they told me that I would uh, commentate Taz's match with, I think, uh, 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 an Italian kid. I can't remember Guido. his name. Guido? Guido. Yeah. Jeez, why can't I remember that? And uh, actually, they did a little bit of amateur wrestling at the beginning, so I commentated the match. And basically, that's all I had to do. And, and I, wa I started watching the rest of the match. And, you know, me being an Olympic champion that year, I, I did a lot of speaking to kids and, and uh, a lot of inspirational spe speaking. I uh, did, did a lot of uh, speeches for um, uh, churches and stuff like that. And not that it doesn't really matter what people do. It's just the fact that, you know, I went they misled me. And when I got there, they told me they wouldn't do anything unethical that would, uh, offend, uh, you know, what I was doing, and, and he knew, you know, which direction I was going at that particular time, so Polly didn't, re wasn't really honest with me, and what happened is, here I was watching, uh, I think it was Raven putting Sandman up on a cross, where Sandman's son was actually uh, m telling Raven to do it, you know, and he was getting into it, and I was just... And there was blood everywhere, and, and that was fine. I mean, if that's a form of entertainment that people enjoy. But if you would have seen the reaction of the crowd, I mean, everybody was more in shock than they were entertained. And uh, everybody just kind of started looking at each other, and they were just like, oh, you know, geez. And I looked at Polly and I said, Polly, uh, you tell me this isn't going to be on TV right after I just commentated. And uh, Polly said, Kurt, I didn't know they were going to do it, whether he, he lied or not. He told me they didn't know they were going to do it, and he promised me it wouldn't be on TV. It would be on videotape. That was fine with me. But um, he, the problem was I don't care what they do. Uh, they can do anything they want to do. They can put whoever on a cross. You know, I don't, it, it might offend me, but it might not offend other people. And that's, that's the one thing I've learned about sports entertainment. There's something for everyone. But the thing is, Polly wasn't honest with me, and that's the problem I had. So I told him if it aired on TV at the same time that I aired, that he'd probably be hearing from my attorney. So, you know, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm some, you know, idiot jerk that, that uh, you know, won't let Paulie do what he wants to do. I'm just saying they weren't honest with me, and that's the problem I had with them because I don't have a problem with whatever they want to do. I mean, this is a free country. You can do whatever you want. I was just a little bit offended that they would bring in an Olympic gold medalist that speaks to children for a living to, and have a little child helping someone put the guy up on the cross to crucify him. I just thought that was a little bit over edge. That never even made a uh, tape curtain. Yeah. <laughs> Did, did you uh, did you have any kind of a problem as far as like when in the WWF um, when they did because they did some you know crucifixion angles a couple of times as well. Sure, when Stone Cold and the Undertaker and stuff. I I don't have a problem with it. You know, it, it obviously isn't something that that makes me want to watch it. Um, you know, but it, it is entertainment. Uh, you're going to see it in movies. You're going to see it uh, on television shows. And basically, what they're saying is this is no different than that. And uh, so. You know, if it happens, it happens. Uh, that's cool. Um, if I had kids and I was watching it, I'd probably turn the channel until it was off, but I would definitely turn it back on. And I, I'm a big believer in parents making sure the kids don't see what they don't want them to see. And that's easy. That's why you have a remote control. And uh, I'm a big believer in that WWF is great for kids to watch because it's a form of entertainment that kids can get into. Uh, you can always, as long as you monitor your kids and tell them, hey, don't go to school and hit somebody over head with a chair. I mean, that's pretty stupid. What you're seeing on TV might not be all fake, but it's a form of entertainment 
for people to enjoy. It's not the it's not to promote kids to go out and be violent. Uh, but like I said, you know, I think it's real important to to show your kids certain things. You know, I love. I think I think Stone Cold is a great. Um, believe it or not, role model for kids because he shows uh, courage, you know. He shows uh, bravery, you know. So it's not like Stone Cold, this guy just breaks all the laws and, and kicks everyone's butt and he, and, and he doesn't listen to anyone. Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, in a lot of ways, is a role model for kids. He might swear. That's not good. But he does stand up for himself when he has to. And, uh, you know, there are certain things that you can teach your kids. There are good things about people and there are bad things about people. And you want to teach your kids the good things about people. But no drinking and driving. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, Brian, when he was talking about the ECW, could you imagine someone who actually had never seen pro wrestling? I mean, because I've watched pro wrestling my whole life, and the first time I went to ECW, it was like kind of... I didn't know it. <laughs> it's kind of different. <laughs> it was a different I mean, kind of wrestling. It was an all-star cast that night. I, I was uh, impressed to, because I never watched it before. But you know, years later, I'm like, wait a minute, I saw him at ECW. Oh my God, I saw him. I mean, it was Mankind, Perry Saturn. There was uh, the Sandman, Raven, um, um, uh, Steve Williams. Uh, I could name a Williams. bunch of people. The Blue Meanie, uh, uh, Stevie, uh, Stevie Steve Richards. Richards. Uh, I can't, I can't, I can go down a list of 20 that you would see and, and, uh, exposed every week after week. I mean, it was an amazing, uh, roster. That was yeah. actually, oh. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I said that was actually a really great show, because they had, like, the Eliminators against, you know, Williams and Terry Gordy and stuff like that. Like, sure. it was, like, you know, really all-star kind of matches. But the thing that, you know, no one ever, no one ever saw most of them, because they did that crucifixion angle, and then they were, kind of the Christian, you know, you know, uh, Censors, they wouldn't let them, you know, put it on tape and sell it. They they wouldn't put it on tape to sell it. Nope. And Raven, had to go. he came out and apologized for the whole thing. You know what? They, I I didn't think Raven should have done that. I I don't really think that he had anything to apologize for. I mean, he was basically expressing himself and doing what he felt would entertain people. Um, Nobody expected Raven to apologize, and that's the one thing a lot of people say. You know, Kurt, I can't believe you made Raven go out there and apologize. I didn't make him go out. I didn't even want him to. Uh, yes, Paul, think, that was Paul's doing. Okay, that was Paul's doing. I but, think Paul, um, the whole I think, point was, you I know, think Paul's, Raven just did something that no one else has ever done. He went a little bit over edge, but um, that's what this is all about. Sports entertainment, we do a lot of things that are over the edge. So I don't think Raven felt it was offensive by any means, but Raven is Raven. You know, Kurt Angle's Kurt Angle. I would never do a, a crucifixion thing, or I would never think of it. But, you know, everyone's different. I, I think Paul's feeling was that, that as, as a Jewish owner of a company with a Jewish performer in, in, in Raven, that he didn't want it to, you know, he, he was afraid it would come Kinda out back. Kind of making fun just, of a... Uh, yeah, like, made, like he's making fun of another religion, so he sure. just figured that, that, he, that he felt that it would be better, and he just told him to go out there and apologize. And I think Raven was, it was a kind of half ass apology anyway. Yeah, he, oh, yeah, he, 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 he didn't want to be there. There's no he didn't want to do that. it. Yeah, he didn't want to do it, so... Yeah, you know, he was almost better off not going out there, because he yeah. just showed everybody he, he didn't really give a heck. He was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, I apologize, see you later. And... Uh, <laughs> You know that that's cool and everything. I mean, he just didn't feel like he needed to. But um, uh, you know, you're right though. I think that if Polly, uh, that was definitely a, a good thing because if Polly, I didn't even know he was Jewish. But you're right yeah. that that would definitely come off to some people that you know here are these Jewish people are making fun of Christians. You know, and uh, and that that wouldn't <laughs> that would be pretty bad on his part. So I think he was just trying to protect himself too. Okay, let's go. Let's go to Dave in Pennsylvania. Dave, you're next up. Hello. Um, I just like to say I'm a big fan of Kurt. Um, he went to Clary and I went to Mansfield University. Did, did you know where that is, Kurt? Oh, yeah, Mansfield. That's on the other side of the state. But uh, I see those guys at the PSCACs every year. Mm -hmm. I think uh, in the PSAC, yeah. Um, my friend was telling me once about how you pinned him, just obliterated him. And it was a funny story. Um, and uh, now I see you're doing so well. And I'm just a huge fan of your work. And I just, I just mark out, you know, every time. Because you get the great promo, then you get the excellent wrestling match, too. And um, you're like the real total package in, in my mind. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop sounding like a mark here. And I just wanted to talk about how I really like the WWF, how it has so many great wrestlers and so much storyline potential. And just sitting here, I was going to ask you about the ECW thing, and that's already been asked. And another question kind of came to mind. 
and that's it. I see, like, when Steve Austin comes back, and if he's able to get in shape, and I think he will because he, he has that work ethic and love for the business. Definitely. I think Steve Austin is going to make it back, and I think he's going to do great. And I think of all these feuds for Steve Austin. There's a, I think you could bring back Benoit. <coughs> or you can bring Austin and have him feud with Benoit. Kind of like a reverse of the Bret Hart feud, where Benoit is playing the Austin role against Bret Hart, who is, and I mean, the Austin would be playing the Bret Hart role. is not say Benoit is the one dogging uh, Steve Austin in his return, like when Steve Austin dogged Bret Hart in his return. And uh, I think that could be a huge feud. I think there's a Triple H feud with Austin, and then and maybe at WrestleMania Listen. you could do an Austin heel turn and the Rock feud with him. That would be huge. But I think what would really set it off, uh, Steve Austin's return, is if you stayed heel and feuded with Steve Austin, because I think your character, I mean, it's just the perfect match. Uh, the promos would just be amazing, and the wrestling would be great. And I think it'd be really good at put, for putting you over. I'd like to know, um, first, just two questions. First, if you've been, if that has been talked about with you, if, when Austin returns, whether you would be his first opponent or be in line to wrestle him. And secondly, if Raven was brought in, I think with your style of promos and your character, I think you could put Raven over huge as a babyface. Um, and I think eventually, just a quick comment, I think... You could be, I could see you wrestling Triple H in the Stephanie feud, second from the top of the card at WrestleMania, if there is an Austin heel turn and there's an Austin Rock match at the next WrestleMania. But I just want to know, have they talked about you? Have they talked with you about wrestling uh, Steve Austin on his return, having a quick feud with him, you know, like a two-month thing or a one-month thing? And um, <clears throat> would you be interested in working with Raven in uh, putting him over or working with him if, if he comes to the WWF in a month or two. Um, and that's about it. And uh, um, thanks for staying with me, Dave. Appreciate it. Okay. You know what? I could I could barely hear him, but he said something about Stone Cold Steve Austin and me doing maybe I'd be able to put him over. Or... He, was, he was asking if you would, if, if, is there anyone's talked to you about uh, maybe wrestling Steve Austin when Steve Austin came? Does that, mean, does that mean that you would have to be the one who ran him over with that car? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe it would be. <laughs> they messed his neck up. Um, you know what? I, I've always dreamed of working uh, with Stone Cold Steve Austin, and I do agree with him. I think that, um, first of all, nobody has to put Stone Cold over. Stone Cold is over himself. Um, I think it would be a very, very exciting feud only because of our personality uh, um, contradictions. Um, you know, he could really make me look like a fool, and 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 entertain the fans, and I could actually make myself look like a fool. I've done that many times, but um, I think that would be a really good mix, and I expect that to happen in the future. I think Stone Cold will be back. Um, he deserves to come back at the very top, and as long as he stays in the business, he'll always be at the very top. But um, it'd be an honor to work with him, and I think that we could definitely complement each other. As far as Raven, I think he said something about me working with Raven. Um, I have nothing against Raven. I, I would love to work with Raven. If he ever came to the WWF, he's a phenomenal worker. Uh, he's great on the stick. Um, I heard he's, a, you know, he's very cooperative working with. Um, it, it would be a, an honor to work with him too. You know, I, I've never had a problem with him, and I think that he is uh, one of the best in the business himself. So, um, as far as putting him over, I don't think. I, I think it would be a good chemistry to work with them. I think that our characters would definitely contradict enough that it would be very interesting. But again, I wouldn't have to put him over. I think he'd be, you know, wherever he, whatever direction they put him or wherever he wanted to go, I think he could do him, do it himself. So, uh, uh, that, if that answers that question, I hope I did. As far as Triple H, I think he said something about Triple H to me at WrestleMania. Yeah, maybe he was thinking maybe like, uh, you know, you and Triple H rock in Austin is like maybe a double. A double main event that's getting way ahead of ourselves, but yeah, it's sure. a possibility too. Sure, um, that is getting way, way, way ahead of ourselves. Um, <laughs> you, you never know. As a matter of fact, uh, you know they have a direction. They could have a direction for the next eight months, but you know as well as I do, it can change tomorrow. So uh, there are no guesses. There are no um, uh, definites. It's just keep doing your work and hopefully uh you know you'll make yourself go in the right direction and they'll help you they'll lead you along the way uh i don't see it being an uh, impossible i think it being it's, it's a possibility that you will see triple h and myself team up um but i think you're going to see triple h and myself go against each other before we team up and i think it has to do with the storyline 
Okay, guys, now it's time for WF Daily Trivia. Here's today's question. What was the main event of the highest-rated WWF television show of the modern era? And from modern era, let's say, 1984 to the present. That's, that's good modern, because I, I don't know about the TV ratings in the 50s, because I know that they were, they were huge. So... <laughs> That's another era. Anyway, we're back here with uh, Kurt Angle, of course, myself and Brian Alvarez, and a full bank of phone calls. Um, before we get to the calls, um, this is a question from Andre R R Rinconio, um, who is asking about the 1976, 1996, God, I don't want to make you wrong, 1996 <laughs> Olympic final uh, against the Iranian. Um, he says, like, the match ended in a 1-1 tie, and uh -huh. then you won the decision. What was, what was behind all that? Well, what happened is... Uh... We uh, tied one to one in regulation. We went into overtime, and we tied in overtime. So it came down to a referee's decision, and they went with who made more aggressive moves throughout the match. And I don't—I'm not sure how they keep track of that. And to be honest with you, uh, I've watched the match a thousand times now, and I still can't pick a winner. But the thing is, I won the world championships the year before, so I was a reigning world champion. And I think what the judges had to do is decide which one. The match was so even, so dead even, that uh, they had to come up with a decision. And I think what they did is they went with the reigning world champion. That was me. So, you know, here we are tied one-to-one. -one. And actually, at the very end of the match, I did take them down. And one ref awarded me a point that the other two did not. And if, if one other ref official would have awarded that point, then they wouldn't have had to decide. It would have been two to one. So a lot of people feel that I did win two to one. And that might have been the, um, uh, that might have been the factor in me winning that and also being the reigning world champion. So, uh, it was a very, very tight match. And, you know, when you have something like that, one guy can only be the winner, but I think both guys, we both put on a great match and we both, uh, both went out there to win, so uh, you know I give him a lot of credit. You're going to see a lot of him in the 2000 games. Did you ever cross paths with Dan Severn, or was he just before your time? Uh, actually, Danny beat me uh, in 1988. Uh, I was a freshman in college. I was 18 years old, and I think Danny at the, that particular time, well, he's about 10 years older than me. So he's uh, 12 years older than you. He's 12 years older than you. Oh wow. So, yeah. you know, Danny Danny had a lot more experience on me. He beat me one nothing. And I think at that point he was actually the reason that I thought that uh I could be successful in international wrestling because this guy was considered one of the top ten wrestlers. I'd say about he was ranked about tenth in the world at the particular time. And here I went one nothing with him, so I realized that I did have the talent to go on to the next level because I was so young, and uh, it was that was about the only time I wrestled him. Though, so um, losing one nothing to Danny Severn at that particular time was really good, and Danny ended up retiring after that. Let's go to Chad in North Carolina. Chad, you're up with Kurt Angle. Hey guys, how's it going? Real good. Uh, hey Kurt, I was I was going to ask you about the Taz thing, but I guess somebody else took that. Um, me and my brother met you in an autograph session. He wanted me to tell you um, to thank you for signing our stuff. Um, you know what? Could you repeat what he said? I'm having trouble. I mean, he, 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 okay, he just said that uh, that, he, that him and his brother met you or uh, at an autograph session. He just wanted to thank you for uh, signing everything. Oh, sure, I appreciate that. Thank you for coming. That's mm -hmm. great. And um, who did you? Who do you think are the most underrated people in the WWF? Can you, can you hear that? Who, who do I think are the most underrated people in the WWF? Yeah, underrated wrestlers in the WWF. Uh, you know what? I, the thing is, I'd have to say there are a lot of them, you know? Uh, you know, you look at guys like Chris Benoit. Chris is phenomenal. Um, he is, he's got a phenomenal uh, presence about him. He's a, even a better worker than he is, you know, than his presence. Uh you know, he is the Intercontinental Champion. There's not much higher he can go, but even Chris is underrated. So, I mean, where do we mark the rated and underrated? You know, which guys are underrated? Chris Benoit, I think, is one of the best in the business, and uh, he deserves the WWF Championship. So, you know, there are many guys. Uh, you know, I look at guys like Val Venus uh, that, you know, might have had that one character that kind of... It might have might have pushed him at the beginning, but it might have held him back just a little bit, you know, as he took the next step. So, I'd say a guy like Val Venus is is a guy that's a little bit underrated as well. Uh, D'Lo Brown, you talk about a phenomenal athlete. There's a there's an incredible athlete right there that uh, he weighs 285 pounds and he can do uh, spring moonsaults and and just incredible things. So, 
Um, there are a lot of guys out there, but I'd have to say that um, a lot of guys can be underrated. It's just a matter of uh, their time will come in the future. And, you know, I can't complain because I've been getting, I, I don't like to call it a, a push, but, you know, I've been getting, I've been taking the, the, the necessary steps to going to the WWF championship, you know, to winning the belt. So I can't say I'm underrated. I think I've been blessed with, a, you know, a lot of people helping me out. So, um, uh, but I can't answer that question because, you know, who can you say is underrated? I think Chris Benoit could be the WWF champion right now, so I'd say he's underrated. Mm. And there are guys that are, you know, the beginning undercards that, that deserve to go the next step. It's just going to take a little bit more time. And a question for you, Dave. Um, which sure. was, which, in your opinion, was more brutal, um, the Terry Funk versus Sabu, born to be wired, Matt, or the Foley Undertaker, um, Hell in the Cell? They're totally different. Uh, you know, I never saw I never saw except clips of the Terry Funk Sabu uh, barbed wire match. I mean, I seen the, the the clips of it, and it looked. I mean, I, I I didn't really. You know, you know, I could say that like what I saw in the clips of it, I didn't like. And Undertaker, uh, Mick Foley, the Hell in the Cell. I mean, it was was probably the um, the one match that's universally regarded as like a fantastic match. That that I mean, I, you know, I respect it uh, of what he was trying to do, but but I didn't like it because it scared me for what the business might turn into. Mm-hmm. I just thought that the, it was it was too dangerous. I mean, I, I you know, if if you do something where there's a risk of injury, or you're you're, you're doing high risk moves, it's one thing. But to me, to do moves where there's a certainty of injury. I think crosses the line, and I mean, one of the bumps was didn't go exactly as planned. But you know, he he could have been hurt so bad, and he was hurt real bad anyway. So it was like, to me, it's like, I think the art is making it look like you know you're you're hurt when you're not injuring yourself, rather than um, you know doing something. And, and look what it spawned on like that uh, the WCW pay per view, you know, trying to top it. You know, it's like to me. I don't know. I don't find that wrestling where a guy, you know, sets himself on fire and jumps off a forty-foot thing into an air mattress. <laughs> it's, it's a movie stunt, you know. Right, right. And you're right. It, it's a matter of making that illusion that that the guy is more hurt than he really is, you know. And and you putting yourself in situations like that. Sometimes I think guys get a little bit over the edge, and they 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 become they put them in a dangerous situation where they can't turn back, and they got to continue to try to outdo what they did before. Uh, I don't think that's a very uh, very good approach to have a long career in such a great, you know, way of entertainment. So you definitely have to protect yourself, and you never want to stick your neck out too far because then you find yourself never coming back. And I think that's that's uh, what some people have done in the past. And and you know, you, you got to remember these people not only want to see how impressive your your wrestling moves or stunts that you do, but they want to continue to get to know your character. They want to continue to see what direction you're heading. And if you're not there for the next five or ten years, you know, these people will never see who you are because you, you went and tried to do all these crazy things and you end up messing yourself up. So I think you can go to a certain degree, but you don't want to go too far. Mm. And, um, Anything else, Kurt, 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 can I get one thing just for my brother? Hello. You better ask what it is, because I, I okay. no, 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 no open-ended questions. <laughs> okay, um, my brother wants you to say it's true. It's true. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I knew that was it. I knew that's yeah. what it was. You knew that. Mm-hmm. You want me to say it? You, you don't have to. <laughs> no, I, what the heck? Uh-oh. You know, I'm, I'm I'm Kurt Angle, your Olympic hero, the, a man of intensity, integrity, and intelligence. It's right. true. It's true. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you. All right. Actually, you were talking one time ha- about um, WWF guys that you thought might have been really good amateurs but never really did it. You know, I just t- I, that's funny you say that because we just got done talking about that. Um, Chris Benoit would have been phenomenal. Uh, yeah. Bob Hawley, another one that would have been an incredible wrestler. Uh, another one that's a real big surprise, but I've seen him move in the ring, is Bubba Ray Dudley. Very aggressive, very quick, good hips, and it's just a matter of hip power and explosion. And these guys, uh, and work ethic. You know, Chris Benoit and Bob Hawley might be the two hardest trainers. When you see him in those two in the gym, you'd be amazed at what they do. And uh, it definitely keeps them young, but uh, it amazes me because I don't do that stuff anymore. I mean, I used to train like a madman eight hours a day. Now... I do more, you know, training for appearance than I do for power and explosion and stuff like that. And uh, I'd have to say those three guys would be really, really good amateur wrestlers. 
I got a question about two guys as far as perhaps amateur wrestlers, and one's Ken Shamrock and the other's uh, The Big Show. Uh-huh. Just because of the just because of the massive size. Oh, I, I think he, the Big Show. Big Show would have been a phenomenal wrestler too, but he he chose basketball. I heard he was pretty decent too. Uh, on the Kenny high school level, used to wrestle. Did you know Kenny was an amateur? Oh yeah, you know he was a really good he was a really really good high school wrestler out yeah. here. But then he never he never wrestled college. No, he he actually tried out in the '88 Olympics, which you never see anyone do is basically wrestle in high school, skip whatever it was. I think it was about six years, come back and train for the Olympics. But uh, Kenny tried out, and uh, he just wanted to do it once. Uh, he didn't have a lot of success, but you know th- that's what I'm talking about. Kenny is the kind of guy that. Um, He's a jack of all trades. He knows every discipline, and that's what makes him so dangerous in the uh, in the Ultimate Fighting. Is he knows how to wrestle. He knows how to how to defend wrestlers. He knows jujitsu. He knows kickboxing. He knows boxing. He knows karate. This guy knows everything, and that's what makes him so effective in Ultimate Fighting. Have, have you ever thought about like uh, ways you might have to tweak your character a little bit, or if you think you would have to to, to be at the you know if you were at that the top top level? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, the one thing we've done with my character, and we might have pushed it a little bit too far, is we we made it into more of a comedy character. Um, so that's like what I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, and we did that on purpose. Just to, you know, I know that Vince McMahon wanted me to portray more as a heel, and lately I've been getting a lot of babyface pops. But I think what he wanted to try to do before he really, I think he's going to send me in the in the really really dark heel in uh, direction uh he wanted people to to appreciate what i do and like me before he sent me in that direction so i think what we did is we came up with a little more comedy so people were entertained and then eventually i'll probably do the triple h thing and go a little more serious but uh he never wants to get rid of kurt angle the character that you know where people can laugh a little bit i think it's a little bit like the rock you know rock's pretty serious but he says a couple of things that just you just have to laugh and uh I think that's what they want to do with me. So, uh, you know, I can't complain. I know that uh, whatever direction they take me, it's better in the long run. And uh, I- I've been patient up until now, and I'll continue to be patient. Did you ever, um, um, ap- after the Olympics or, or, or when the time came when you decided you wanted to go pro, or even now that you are a pro wrestler, ever think about or discuss wrestling Japanese style? Oh, yeah. uh, I don't know if uh, anyone has told you this, but before I started on TV, the WWF was going to send me over there. For for, for one of the Pride shows or something, or or a a Sayana show or something? Well, they weren't sure if they were going to send me over for a few weeks or a few months. And you you never know in in this kind of entertainment, uh, a few weeks could end up being six, eight months. (laughs) So (laughs) I was heading over there. I think it was FMW. Oh really? Yeah, which wow. was, uh, from what I heard, was surprising to a lot of people because uh, people surprising. would have thought more all or New Japan uh, would be more, you know, a direction that they'd want to send me. But uh, for some reason, they were thinking FMW, and uh, I was going to head over there. And I would love to work that. You know, guys like Chris Benoit and Eddie, Eddie Guerrero talk about it all the time. They loved it. Chris Jericho, and you know, they said Kurt, you'd have been great at that. And I would have loved to go over there and experience that, but. Uh, they wanted me to start right away, so here I am. Uh, we've got two contest winners, Adrian Pickworth of Australia and Chris McMurdy of Ontario. The question of what was the highest rated, what was the main event of the highest rated television show, WF television show or any wrestling television show in the United States of the modern era? And the answer is uh, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant from February of 1988 on NBC's live main event. It did a 15.2 rating, which is wow, impressive. Yeah. Yeah. 15.2. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, nothing's come close to that. I don't think anything's going to come close to that for, I don't want to say forever, but... Uh, it cause... could possibly be that, but it could possibly <laughs> be that. But I think, I think wrestling's still going to go up a little bit, I think. Um, it's... For, it's in, in some, I don't think it's... for everybody. Yeah, not for everybody. Yeah, that's... that's what my... <laughs> You're right about that. Yeah. Uh, let's go to John in Tampa, Florida. John, you're next up. Hey, buddy. John. Hello? Hey. Hey, what's up, Kurt? How you doing? Fine, how are you? Well, I just wanted to say that I don't really think that you're being used as good as you could be in the WWF. I think that you should be in events and stuff. Hello? Uh, 
I, uh, he, uh, he was just saying that he thinks that you could even be used. Uh, he could be used higher in the card. The time will come. I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about it. It's, Kurt is very high considering how much time he's actually spent in wrestling. It's, it's, it's been it's, about seven it's, months. So um, it's actually I amazing. That, um, I think where I am right now is is good. Uh, I don't think going up too fast is is a smart thing. I think uh, building a character and, and working your way up is a lot better. So. You know, I, I know a, a lot of people would would expect, uh, and not that I deserve to be up there. I I, I don't think I do yet, but uh, you know, a lot of people would expect to see like an Olympic champion go straight up and 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 uh, compete for the the belt right away. But uh, that's why Vince is so effective. I think that he he makes sure these people appreciate and like the characters before they they actually see them evolve into uh, main event status. And uh, I think. Uh, Vince had plans of me, you know, taking my time and and you know after King of the Ring, I see a lot of things happening. So um, I'm real excited about this month. It's going to be a big month for me, and then I just have to take it step by step from there. But uh, I mean, I don't know if you guys agree with me, but I can't complain with the with direction they've taken me so far. I think one thing you know that that uh, I that this makes me kind of remember when I first started watching you wrestle in Memphis uh -huh. it reminded me a lot of Jack Briscoe who was a NCAA champion in 65 66 who then went to pro wrestling and was was one of in the, in the early 70s was probably just about the biggest name in the business sure. uh, as NWA champion and uh, Jack Briscoe it took him um, basically three to he was pretty much on the road to the top in three years and by the fourth year he was, uh, you know, right up there as the, you know, Dory Funk Jr.'s big challenger when when they were the top two NWA stars. Right. So I mean, when we're talking about like a guy who's been in wrestling for under two years, uh, you know, remember even even Briscoe, who was who was considered like a phenomenon coming out of amateur wrestling, it took him pretty much three four years. So it's not like he's moving slow. I mean, he's going really fast. Oh yeah, I think so too. And a lot of people think I'm moving a lot slower than I am, but you're right. It takes time to get there. And there's so many guys that deserve to be up there, and I think you have to earn your keep. And, it, and like you said, it just takes a little more time. Down in Memphis, I enjoyed working down there for the sole fact that I was able to uh, wrestle at least three or four matches per week. As far as character development, they hardly ever let me talk. And obviously I was a straight-laced baby face, uh, like a 1970 baby face, so there wasn't a real lot they could do with me down there. And... uh I really didn't, I wasn't able to show them much of my talent, at least not on, on the microphone and stuff like that. So I wanted to get out of there right away. I actually wanted to develop more uh, where they could um, teach me more on the road, where I would be traveling a lot more and uh, maybe give me opportunities to do uh, promo, uh, promos at house shows and stuff. But uh, they wanted me to stick down there for a while and, and I think get my work working ability you know my wrestling ability down before i before i came up but my 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 character is i'm comfortable with the character and i think that's why i've improved quite a bit because i like it in my character the the current angle in the wwf cracks me up and he excites me because every time i go out there I, i'm laughing before the fans are because i can't believe that i'd actually say some of the things that i do so when you enjoy doing that you know and, and you get excited about it Obviously, you're going to perform pretty well, and, that, and that's what I have to, give, have to give a lot of credit to the creative guys because they're sending me in a direction that I completely enjoy. You did some work as a sportscaster, right? Yeah, I worked for about eight months as a sportscaster, and the job was pure hell because uh, they never taught me how to do it. They just threw me under, you know, right in the fire. Uh, the first night on the air, I was a sports anchor, and I never had any kind of development they didn't even i had no rehearsal it was just go in there and listen to the anchor and she'll tell you what to do and it was like oh my gosh it was, i was like a deer in headlights and it took me a couple months to adapt but by the time i got the hang of it i'd say about three or four months i actually became quite decent but uh i think the progress was so slow that um uh people didn't accept me as a good sportscaster and, and i didn't think i was but then again you know i wasn't prepared the right way and i never did anything like that in college uh, i basically got the job because i was an olympic champion and and a hometown hero in pittsburgh and uh that's not the right way to get a job but the money was good and i didn't want to pass it up and uh there i was being a sportscaster in pittsburgh but i'll never throw 
I'll never trade in for the world because I learned a lot. And so it was uh, like a local sports show. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually a Fox station in Pittsburgh. So it was Fox 53. You know the the Fox affiliate here in Pittsburgh. Do you think that eight months there has helped you as far as on camera for wrestling? Uh, definitely helped me. But like I said before, when I was up at the WWF, I was more of a I sound more like a sportscaster than I did a, a character, and uh, that's because um, that's what I was taught first thing out of the Olympics. Uh, what's um, Al, Al? What's the the next caller's name? Is it, is it Tony? I'm sorry. Tim. Okay, I'm sorry. It's Tim. Okay, I was just uh, uh, okay. Tim. It's uh, Tim in Chicago. You're next up. Hey guys, how's it going? Pretty good. Doing real good. Uh, I, don't know, I just want to talk about. I was just me and my friend actually did that at work over at Daniel Foro. We were talking about. How like far you've come along and stuff, and uh, it was pretty cool. We also talking about somebody earlier called in with one of your quotes that they liked, and my personal favorite I read over at WrestleWire.com where you were like you had a match with Kane and you uh, you said something like I'm fighting the big red retard tonight. Not that I have anything against retarded people because I don't. As a matter of fact, I have a lot of retarded fans out there <laughs> that was pretty that, funny. that love that was and appreciate their Olympic one. hero. Oh, God. I remember that. Uh, and then, oh, I do that have to admit, uh, Vince McMahon was not real happy with that one. Oh, really? No, Just... no, he wasn't happy. That was something that uh, my creative guy came up with, and uh, he brought it to Vince right before Vince was going out. Vince was actually preparing for something, and Vince wasn't quite, uh, his mind wasn't quite into it, so when Brian brought it to his attention, Vince said, sure, sure, go ahead. And uh, when I went out and he, and he was watching on TV, he was like, oh, my God. <laughs> So when I got backstage, you said, hey, uh, let's stay away from that stuff, all right? And I said, okay. I, I you didn't know, what, know. You know what's funny is, is when, when, you, when you said that, I, was, I had like a split like feeling on that because the first one was like, oh, I, I mean, I see where Vincent Mann's coming, and the other one was, well, it's right out of something about Mary, which was, you know, a hit not all that much earlier than that, and it's like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know yeah. what you're saying. And uh, I didn't feel real comfortable doing it. But, you know, it, when he said Vince said okay, uh, I thought, all right, go out there and do it. Because I trust Vince completely. And if he has me say something, okay. I know there's a reason for it. And, you know, Vince is a very organized guy that, that he knows what direction he wants to take you. And he his impulse is so fast, he knows what's right and wrong before it happens. I mean, he, he could tell you... Um, like, let's say I'm doing a, a, a commentary uh, with uh, Jim Ross and, and, and uh, Jerry the King, and I'm sitting down, i got the earphones on. He, he is actually, half the time, he's telling you what to say. And he is so good at it, like, he, he's actually on the microphone. He, he's the one in your ear that you're listening to. It's Vince. It's not anybody else. And Vince will tell you what to say and, and, and when to say it at the right time, and it, it just brings your character out. You don't even know what you're saying half the time. And then when you watch it on TV, you're like, oh, geez, no wonder I said that because Vince was right. I should have been saying that. So Vince is so quick and he's so good at the business that uh, he could play any character he wants. He could play Kurt Angle, Stone Cold himself. He is just a he's a brilliant man that uh, has shown a you know he, he there's no doubt about it. You know he's made a lot of mistakes in his life and he he's admit that he's admitted that. But um, he's learned from those mistakes and and it's made him stronger. It's made this company stronger. And now here he is. Uh, as strong as can be, and he's and he's having a lot of success. I can, you can't disagree with that. No. <laughs> <laughs> there was a line there about trusting Vince completely. All of a sudden, anyway, no one to bring that up. <laughs> Dave, I have one other question. Well, with my character, I got to say that he's done nothing but good. Uh, yeah, he has. He has. Anyway, go, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. I was just wondering. I was listening to that. I don't know if you ever listened to it. That garbage WCW live show. But I never listened to it, but I do hear about it every every so often. <laughs> yeah, it was like, I was like listening to it last night, and uh, after Thunder, like the, one of the worst Thunders ever, probably. And uh, I don't know. Whenever they call in that moron, fat ass Bob Ryder, he'll just be like, he'll if you no no seriously, 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 you can d disagree with Bob Ryder, but don't no no fat jokes or bald jokes or anything like that. Right, I mean, so, I, and I, I don't mean to say that. I just you know let's keep it keep it civil. Oh, right, but you can well, say okay, whatever you want about him. I don't care. All right, but if anybody calls as long as you don't say anything bad about him, per, his personal life, right, nothing, that, nothing in that direction either. Okay, right. go ahead. So, I don't know. If somebody calls in and they complain about something that happens or anything, that he's just like, okay, and then they'll click the guy off. There's nothing there. I don't know. I just hate that show. They're not. They're not open like about things like you guys are and stuff. Well, know. you know, they're they're in a bad they're in a, they're in a bad position right now. I mean, it, it, it's you know the product's not doing very well, and they have to defend it and. 
you know, they it, it, it's it's tough. I'm I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm not in their shoes. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Not that I condone anything they do. Who are you talking about? <laughs> uh, the WCW Live uh, crew. Oh. Yeah. So I just don't want to get to their I don't want to get to their level where it becomes you know us baiting them or anything like that. Sure. But, but, sure. You know. So anyway. All right. Thanks for the time. Okay. Let's All go right. to Jamie. Jamie, you're next. Hi, Kurt. How you doing? How you doing? Pretty good. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one: What would be a typical day? Um, like how many hours do you work out, and how many meals do you usually eat a day? Did you hear that? Yeah, I think he said something about how many hours I work out a day. How how many hours you work out, and how many meals you eat a day? Okay, I, I eat about ten meals a day. Seriously? And, yeah, and I work out between an hour and a half and two hours a day, which is way down from my Olympic training, which was eight hours a day. Um, yeah, I, I eat from the time I get up, which is about 8 a.m. until midnight, uh, every two hours. So 8, 10, 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. A lot of boxers? Nine hunters? or ten times. Do you do like like like, uh, like bars or something, or do you pre-prepare pre- pre- food when you're going on the road? A little bit of both. When I'm on the road, um, that's where, you know, you have to suck it up. And you, I bring a lot of whey protein. I don't like eating a lot of bars because, let's face it, most of the protein bars out there, they're basically proteined up candy bars. And uh, so you have to watch what you're eating on the road, and it's really hard to do. But I try to eat three or four times a day on the road at restaurants, uh, at particular restaurants. I try to find good ones, and, and they're hard to find. But uh, most of the time, I'm, I'm taking my whey protein with me. And I, and I usually have probably six or seven shakes a day. Are you pretty like uh, disciplined as far as on the road, as far as junk food, alcohol, things like that? Or... I don't drink at all. Uh, uh, I when I'm on the road, I eat as strictly as I can. When I come home, I relax a little bit more. And, and the reason why is because. I'm not home all that much, so when I come home, I try to enjoy my time with my wife, and and we we let loose a little bit, you know, eat eat some sweets and that stuff like that. That's about as crazy as we get here in Pittsburgh. But um, uh, yeah, I stay away from the booze, and I, I pretty much I try to get as much sleep as I can on the road because it's grueling. When you're on the road five days, six days a week, uh, especially the way it is right now, uh, you know, you you, you got to you have to get your right amount of rest, or you're going to be screwed. Okay, let's go to uh, let's go to Masad. You, you'll be our last caller today. Hi guys, uh, I've got a question for uh, for Kurt. Uh, you remember your uh, your entrance at the Survivor Series, and uh, everyone was booing you. And you went on you went on the microphone. And you said you do not boo an, an American gold medalist. Uh-huh. Were you going in there expecting boos and uh, that in your mind, or was that just spontaneous? Okay, this is where we straight shoot. Um, well, at uh, Survivor Series, uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I was scared to death. I mean, that was my first match on TV. And I went out there. I was in Detroit at the Joe Louis Arena. And I went out there, and the fans booed me. So I was like, oh, heck, which which direction is Vince going? Because Vince wasn't clear on uh, which direction I was going. He didn't tell me that uh, I was going to be a baby face or a heel. He just basically said, go out there and have a good match. So I went out, had a good match, and here uh, Stacey Ice getting the better of me, puts me in a rest hold where he's kind of choking me out, and the referee comes up to me and said, Vince said, go over to the microphone, and you tell these people do not boo an Olympic champion. You do not boo an Olympic champion. I looked up at the ref, and I said, you're serious, right? He said, I'm as serious as I can get. Go over. He said, take over right now. Go over. Grab that microphone, and you go off on those people. So I did it. And what happened? The fans really got into me. I mean, they were like, you suck, Angle. And all of a sudden, they were booing me as much as they could. And Vince Vince picked it. You know, he he uh, did it at the right time. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is Vince is real good at timing. And... uh he, his impulses are so fast, and he just knows when the right thing, what the right thing to do. I don't know if anyone knows this, but Vince is up in the in the stage in the gorilla we call it, where 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 you you have conversation with the with the commentators and the officials. And Vince pretty much is up there running most of the show. Uh, the guy works hard, and and he makes a lot of good decisions. And uh, he definitely made the right one with me my first night. And from then on, I just listened to whatever he had to say, and he told me what what to say when I went out there, and it worked. Quick Anything question. else, Masad? Yeah, quick question for Dave. Uh, um, what's the chance of getting Hogan on? All of us want to want to give him a piece of our mind. Hogan? Hogan? Yeah. Hogan? I I don't I don't think very good. <laughs> Do you want? I mean, to? what? Do you want to get him on? 
Hulk Hogan, I mean, pretty much anyone at that we caliber. Would need a longer if they show. Yeah, we would. But if, if anyone at that caliber, if they if they if they want to do the show, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say no, you know, or anything like that. Just to you know, but I I don't expect that he would do the show. That's, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I wouldn't expect it. I mean, it's per- certainly not right now. It's it's going to be hard enough for anyone from WCW, but but um, who knows? I mean, I would never say never. Though I, if this show's on long enough, probably like in ten years, Hogan probably would do it. <laughs> He'd do it well. <laughs> it would be quite. That would be quite the show. And then we'll need a four-hour show. At least ten more years to talk about. What? Oh, talking more, about the whole... years on top to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know he's going to be around because him and Nicholas have to be a tag team. That's right. They already established that. So that's uh, how old's Nicholas now? His son. I have no idea. Well, it's, it's probably ten, ten-ish. So, so we got at least ten more years of him on top. <laughs> oh God, Kurt! I want to thank you very much for uh, for doing the show. We're hey, much... thank you. At a time, and I want to wish you the best of luck, and I hope that uh, at the Survivor Series everything goes a- a- exactly as uh, you're looking for, because it sounds like you're pretty excited about that show. I mean, not Survivor Series, King, King of the Ring. King of the Ring, there, there you go. Yeah, Survivor yeah, Series. Yeah, I'm real excited, and I hope, I hope everything goes the way it's planned, and uh, hopefully uh, things will work out the, the way I explain them. <laughs> but um, yeah. I, I thank you guys for having me on. Anytime you want me on, let me know. Okay, great. We would love to have you on again. And I want to tell everyone, don't forget, uh, we're going to have Frank Shamrock on Friday and Jim Cornette on Monday, and we'll see you tomorrow at 6.